Le Mans, it's commitment, a year's work for one race. Always knowing the failure of a single part or a single moment of inattention will spell defeat. It's exhaustion and the heavy hand of luck. As the long day wanes, the once bright cars are pale and battered, streaked with oil. The great crowd will flood the track. The winners will soar on its rising tide. Who will they be? The answer lies ahead. The 79th running of the 24 hours of Le Mans is next. Drivers from all around the world come to Circuit de la Saffre, Le Mans, France, each and every year to try and conquer this legendary endurance sports car event. Some people have tried for two or more decades and not succeeded at this classic. It is gruelling, it is hard, it is heartbreaking, it is car breaking as we have seen here today already. And look at that, there's light on the horizon as we welcome you back to the network. We welcome you back to speed and we're not gonna leave you. We're all the way here to the very end and beyond. No more speed.com. We're here on the network right the way through. Lee Diffie along with Calvin Fish, Dorsey Schrader, Greg Creamer, Justin Bell. And it has been a thoroughly enjoyable day thus far. We do need to say as we welcome you back, you did see a yellow flag there. We're under safety car conditions again. Isn't that a beautiful shot? We understand the number 13 Rebellion Toyota Lola of Jean-Christophe Bouillon. Oh, there we go. That tells the story. We heard it just stopped. I think it's more than just stopped. Yeah, it came to an abrupt stop. And this car only two or three laps ago had just left pit lane. It had just come in for a service and a routine stop. Could have been a cold tire issue. Porsche curves. Yeah. Remember, it's only, it's less than 40 degrees temperature out there. Right That's now. where the drivers really need to be on their toes until they get that correct tire pressure and temperature up. But we talk about tire warmers. Tire warmers are theoretically banned, but they have these big ovens at the back of the garages. So there's some delay in terms of getting them out there, out to pit lane and on the race car. So they're not super hot, but certainly do have a little bit of temperature in them by the time the driver leaves pit lane. They're the woes for the Rebellion Toyota team. Let's highlight the woes for the Audi Sport organization. And it all started with Romain Dumas on Wednesday evening. Look at this. He hits Roll Goth in the Aston Martin, the AMR Middle East car. And then Tom Christensen, Mr. Le Mans, puts a couple of wheels off at Tet Rouge. A couple of minutes to go in the final qualifying session. He said he was going for it. Just got a little too wide there on entry. Heavy damage to the left side of the Audi number three. It's the story of Audi this week. Crashes, crashes, crashes. This was Alan McNish. This took our breath away at the end of the opening hour. And we thought that was as bad as we were going to see. But we, it wasn't, unfortunately. Mike Rockenfeller tops this. This is the great news, though. Alan gets out, walks away. A little bit of an assist. He is OK. And then. Mike Rockefeller, the number one Audi, the defending race winner, goes on the inside of the AF Corsa Ferrari. Look at that. At in excess of 180 miles per hour. And the R8 just explodes. The carbon fiber explosion. And his teammate and good friend, Romain Dumas, cannot believe it. It was disbelief right throughout the Audi squad. However, reports came in not long after that Mike Rockenfeller was able to get himself out of the car, climb over the, uh, the barrier, and put himself in a safe zone. So Audi might only have one car left, one R18 left, but it is very much in the fight. You see it in third there at the moment. It will cycle up to that top position on pit stop rotation. Uh, I just want to say one thing that we hadn't mentioned in the earlier shots where you see that McNish crash and you see the right rear tire. It disappears out of shot to the top and comes crashing down beside a photographer. That's Annie Prophet, who we've known for a long, long time. She's been around motorsport for many, many years. She did not even know that that wheel was coming down beside her. You know it was her lucky day. You know, and it wasn't just the wheel. It was the whole suspension. It was the wheel, the tire, and the suspension complete. And she was a very lucky lady. 
rolling through the top five in P1, in P2. This is as it stands at the moment while we are under caution. And you can see in third place there, the American level five team of Christoph Bouchou, Scott Tucker and Joao Barbosa. Yeah, there's been a bit of that going on. <laughs> Calvin Fish was just doing that as he came into the booth. Did you get some sleep, mate? I did. I get a little nap and feel refreshed. The shower did me the world of good and ready to go. That's the way. And the story just gets better and better and better. Thumbs up from 1998 winner Stefan Ortelli. And Corvette is on pit road. Greg, take it away. It's here. Uh, Westbrook has just climbed out now. They kind of caught with this yellow. They caught Ollie a little bit by surprise, but Ollie responding very fast, has thrown the helmet on and is already getting ready to climb on board. Normally, he'd already be in the car. As I said, they decided to stop here uh, a little bit early because of the caution, and uh, he really had to hustle to get his kit on. He's in the car now. Fuel is done. Car is up, and uh, they have started that sequence on the tires at this point. Now, they are working on that right front front corner and I wonder if they're starting to do a brake change here it looks like that is exactly what's happening again under caution uh, this is the time to do it when you're going to add that extra time they said that in the absolutely prime condition they ought to be able to do this in 40 seconds but the th uh, the uh, scenario is if you recall with the 73 car they had a problem getting the rotors off and they figured it cost them an extra 45 seconds and that's one of the things that plummeted them down the order so far this right front looks like that one is going fairly decently at this point and they are snugging things up so we'll see what happens here on the left front corner and moving over here having a look that looks to be going okay as well at this point uh oh now they got a little bit of a problem here they are uh, yeah now they've okay now they've got it uh, pucked into place reaching in now doing the quick connects on the lines Boy, he still seems to be struggling just a little bit. Okay, left front is done. Tire is going on. Come back around on the right front. And that one, this one seems to be taking a little bit more time. Again, they're looking down. Now, they, whoop, not quite. And we also lost one of the uh, wheel nuts from that left rear. Of course, they have a spare one immediately. And now the right front tire goes on. So it wasn't exactly as smooth as they would have liked on the brake change, but nowhere near as bad as it was for the 73 at this point. Doing the final prep of the stop cars down off the jacks. And he is away. Boy, I'll tell you. The uh, air gun that lifts that car up in the air almost got caught underneath, but the crew really happy in the end, even though they had a little bit of a stick on uh, the, that right front corner, it worked well, and they've got that done. So uh, they are out, and I think I might be able, uh, right now, Richard uh, Westbrook, uh, having a chat with the gang here from Radio Lamar. As soon as they finish with him, I'll try and grab him and get a word with him. Good to see the boys so pumped. Nothing like performing, but when you perform well under pressure, that's another thing to all together. Ooh, there you can see the damage there to the uh, Rebellion. That's pretty major. Yes, it is. No doubt about it. For that Corvette crew, the key is you've got the three pace cars which are spread around the racetrack. We've talked about it before. Imagine it at the circus o'clock. You have one pace car release at 12 o'clock, one at 4, one at 8. So essentially what it does under course, it creates about two-minute segments. So for the guys in pit lane, they're doing some servicing. It's about 37-second delta, the difference between staying on the racetrack and running at speed. Then you've got about 30 seconds getting the fuel in. So it really gives them about a minute to get that brake change without going two segments down in terms of the pace car sequence. And you saw that they didn't just change the brake pads. They actually had the whole unit as one. Quick disconnect on the brake line, and they replaced the caliper with the brake pads in it already. That is faster. They did have a bit of a problem with that one on the, the right front. The reason why we're under this full course caution is due to the crash by Jean-Christophe Bouillon and the Rebellion Toyota. Justin has more. So, you know, 
by the time they get them from here, plus the pit lane, and then go out, it really plummets a bit. So maybe it was a simple mistake. We'll find out when he gets back. Uh, all I can tell you right now is that it's obviously not going anywhere. Greg? Thanks very much, Justin. Richard, uh, just getting out of that uh, 74 vet. We just checked in a little while ago, about, and they said, oh, about five laps are going to be coming in. Caution came out, obviously came in early, and you had uh, the other decision to do the brakes. Problems there, or just getting it done? I think, you know, we had to choose our moment carefully when to do it. And to be honest, I think we've, we've chosen a good time. Um, you can do it. At, uh, this safety car is very, very strange. It's almost quite new to everyone because you don't actually gain time by pitting under the safety car because you, you can get held by the red light. But I think they chose it right. They had to do a very quick brake change to get back behind the next safety car, which they did. So a great job by the crew, as always. Cars, tricky, but it's um, I think that's track-related. It's tricky for everyone one and uh, we seem to be coping pretty well right now. Is it stuff on the track or is it track temp just being so cold? Track temp, yeah. I mean, it's unusually cold for this time of the year, but we just want to keep going. <laughs> of course, you've uh, you know really made your name driving Porsches uh, with all your success there. Now you're driving big V8 Thunder Iron. How are you enjoying this? Yeah, I love it. <laughs> I, I want to keep this one, thanks. I don't want to go back to anything else. <laughs> I think that smile and that comment says it all. He's loving a little bit of Thunder. Congratulations, Richard. Good luck for the rest of the race. Wow, that was that told the story. I want to keep this one. Pretty hard to believe that someone like Richard Westbrook, who's a Porsche Carrera Cup champion, a Super Cup champion, has only done one Le Mans before this. He's learning his way. He's coming off a nightmare run at Silverstone in the GT1 championship where he and Stefan Mucha had a boxing match with cars and he was still steaming when he turned up at scrutineering earlier this week this will help calm him down a little bit they're leading the way and leading very well speed's coverage of the 24 hours of le mans is brought to you by chevrolet and america's premier sports car corvette We really appreciate Corvette partnering us on this broadcast, that's for sure. And as we take you to the GTE Pro standings at the moment, it could be a banner, tie, a banner day for the Bowtie boys, that's for sure. We'll see. Still a long way to go, nine and three-quarter hours. But that's how it stands in GTO Pro, uh, which has been fascinating. GTE Am it could be another American team with Flying Lizard up there at the moment. They're having a great day. Spencer Pompelli on debut alongside Darren Law. He's been here two times before. This is his third visit. And, of course, team principal Seth Nyman doing a great job. Of course, we have seen some very ugly images of prototypes today that are just contorted, busted, and broken. Yeah, this has been the highest attrition for crash damage that we've seen in years. And these are massive of crashes you saw the whole under tray whole flat bottom of that car ripped off it's now the 13th car of the 56 that started this race over and out and you know these racks in perfect weather you know we've had no rain we've had you know just absolutely perfect conditions and we've had over three and a half hours under safety car conditions that's quite remarkable we talked about the different stress that that then puts on the machinery, Dorsey, because these cars are designed to be running operating temperature with the airflow through the car, through the rads, through the cooling systems, and uh, suddenly they run around under caution. It puts a different load on everything. Plus, it's very cold. You know, it's, it's as, as Justin was saying before, barely 40 degrees mm. there, and these tires don't like that cold temperature. And I think that's what we're seeing with these crashes as they come out of pit lane. Those tire warmers are good behind, but by the time they get the things onto the onto the car itself and the car up onto the racetrack, they, they probably drop down. We're going to see the no. drivers really working those tires hard. There you see one of the uh, tire technicians just getting the track temperature from pit lane there. Really gives them a read in terms of if it drops below a certain level, they, maybe they can go one compound softer. But the team's giving them the grip. They'll have an operating range, which they'll have from experience during the course of this week and previous visits to the racetrack as to. And there's good news. Olivier Beretta back in pit lane. We talked about him getting carbon monoxide poisoning. Good to see him. 
think he's uh, doing a uh, rear end check here. I don't know what that's about. Taking a body temp. Corvette really analyze everything and. Uh, you know how hot your skin gets in those things? That's honest got true. 106 degrees is what we saw in, with the Corvette, with the Chevrolets. Your skin temperature, I'm talking about 106 degrees. That's why you don't feel that good when you get out of the car right away. <laughs> Listen to that noise. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I said. If that was a if that was a gasoline engine, things would be not good. You'd be dipping the clutch and pulling her off. Yeah, <laughs> finding a place to park for the evening. One prototype that this caution has helped is the 33 Level 5 Lola HPD. Joao Barbosa is currently driving. And that will help bridge the gap to Tom Kimber Smith and David Halliday, the two cars ahead. So Scott Tucker's car, the group led by David Stone, is in the top three in the P2 class. On debut here in P2, we should add. We should say that, that is a harmonics that you're hearing. That's not exactly what the Peugeot sounds like. In fact, they're very, very quiet. If you're out there, you wouldn't hear any of that. But the way that camera is, where we're picking up that, there's some sort of a harmonic, and we're hearing that real nasty sound that is not what these diesels sound like at all Sebastian Bordai getting ready yeah, this is going to be a fascinating battle we talked about the two massive crashes with the number one number three Audi they've got one bullet left in their gun three very healthy Peugeots sandwich the Audi right now just snuck over the 200 lap mark last year we saw a distance record created with 397 laps completed we're going to get nowhere near that this year not going to see that that was what we've gone through with these cautions isn't that a beautiful sight yeah, look at the big screen down there hi mom do you know every year we return to circuit de la Sarp. The ACO have done something extra to improve this facility. It's amazing. It's something here. It's something there. There's just continual improvement. We keep making it bigger, and that's hard to believe because it's so massive to begin with at eight and a half miles around. Well, it's just a delight to return to the town each year, and there's little things that you forget, Cal, in, in the space of a year. We're so busy running around here and there, covering various races, and just to go back into the centre of town, wander down to in front of the cathedral at Place de Jacobin, where they host uh, scrutineering. Just little simple things, like when you see the manhole covers, and it has Ville du Mont on there, and this whole town uh, just looks forward to this event on an annual basis. It's what's put it on the worldwide map. What's pretty cool is when you walk through the town, there are various uh, discs uh, with the imprinted hands of the winning drivers, and we uh, were at scrutineering the other night, and following that, uh, the winning team from last year, including Mike Rockenfeller, who was involved in that awful crash here earlier tonight, along with Ruman Duma and uh, Timo Bernard. They were up there having that done, and that will be there forever, and certainly a really fun event. Big crowd there to watch that happen, and uh, some legends in our game as you walk around town and see the various years and the various victors. I don't think there's a shop, whether it be a clothes store, a book store, uh, the various pubs around town, they all have model cars, die cast cars, posters up, flags up, and we're just being notified we're going to see the green fly this time by. Back to racing at Circuit de la Sarre. Third full course caution over. Let's go back racing. Car spun there, I believe, coming out of the Ford Chicane. Yes. You see him getting turned around on coal tires. Maybe that'll be an issue for other cars here on this opening lap after that caution period. Very chilly temperatures. Cars have not been up to speed. They've not on tires that have been in those uh, tire ovens. Got to be really careful here on this opening lap. See the cars there also bottoming out. When the tire pressures are lower, the cars are running lower to the ground. That creates a factor there too. Got to be so careful with the torque of these diesels, Dorsey, as you put the power down. You can see them really skating around. There's no stability in the car yet. And like you said, Calvin, those are sparks. Because the tires are not up to pressure, too low of road height, right height. Let's have a look 
when we were coming to green at that car that spun. This is on board the oh. 73 Corvette. Hey, it was one of the Ferraris. That had no grip. <laughs> he went around real fast. Back on board the two. Marcel Fessler following the 12 of Neil Yarny. Former open wheel driver aboard that Rebellion Toyota. Sits in the sixth place overall. Oh, oh massive lock oh. up there and a spin. That's one of the, was that one of the Peugeots? I believe it was, mate. One yeah. of the Peugeots is gone. Which well, one? No contact with anything, but. I think again. it was Ant Davidson. I think that's Anthony Davidson. Yeah, that could be the leader of the race who's gone around. Fessler was doing a great job there, just dealing with the traffic, being patient. We talk about the fact that this diesel technology, has he beached it? He might have beached it. It sounded like he had wheel spin there. To wait and see if it is Davidson or not. We can't see with these cameras here trying to identify that car that is beached. The nine cars in, Pagano behind the wheel, tires only and fuel. We know that was Pagano coming in with the nine, handing over to Simone Pagano. I don't think it was one of the Pujos. You know, we're hearing right now that it might have been level five, the 33 oh, that could car. Be, yeah, that's got the dorsal fin on there too. Let's have a look at the replay. There's car seven behind. There is Ant Davidson behind. Oh, yes, yeah, 33. It's it is the 33. Yep. Cold tire spin again, like we were talking about. Dark colored prototype there. We all got a bit excited. Yeah, and with the fin, you know, like you said, there's not many of those out there. Yeah, is he stuck in the gravel? Probably is. Looks like he's dug in pretty good there. Very unusual to see that man make a mistake, but as we've seen today, even the best and making these tiny little errors. It's all about the demands of the Le Mans 24 hour race. Got to be on your toes every second. And this temperature is extraordinarily cold for this time of year. And I think that's catching a lot of people out of, after these cautions. Remember a few years ago as Andre Lotterer looks on when Joao Barbosa drove for Martin Short's Roll Center racing in that Judd powered Pescarolo where he really put himself on the map, fighting some of the big name drivers and big name teams, just missed out on standing on the podium overall. Tom Kimbersmith has done another good job in the Oak Racing 49, the traditional pink of Oak Racing. And this car continuing to surge on, trying to get a podium in P2. I wonder what the update is on the 33 car for level five. Uh, it's still there. Yeah, I thought it would. It really dug in. And this is in a dangerous spot here. <laughs> it is very dangerous. You know, cars flashing through there. I'm not sure if they're under a local yellow at that point, but uh, going through the Dunlop curves there, it's a hairy spot to be stuck on the side of the road if the cars are at speed. Justin? Simon, you just got out. It's pretty cold, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Put the jacket on. Yeah, it's pretty cold. Uh, the tires, I mean, I was born on the on the safety car laps. I've never experienced anything like this before. It's uh, it's tough out there, so we decided to pit. I didn't want to restart on those tires. I think it was the safest way and maybe the fastest, so we'll see how it ends up. But uh, the car is, uh, is nice. It's uh, behaving well. I'm very happy overall. It was nice to lead uh, Le Mans for the first time, and uh, it's still a nine hour and a half to go, so we'll see. But inside the car, all the systems are working. I mean, the traffic, has it got into a better rhythm now? Yeah, I mean, the traffic is getting better, so maybe, I don't know, maybe the drivers I was with was, were more experienced. You never know. Sometimes you get the traffic in the right place, sometimes not. So it was a good stint, good uh, quadruple stint. Um, I enjoyed the car. The car feels the same as it did at the beginning. A uh, little bit better handling, which uh, which is uh, very nice for the... It is a very nice thing for the end of the race. Perfect. Now go and have a quadruple sleep. Yes. <laughs> okay. Now that was interesting, guys. I was thinking about that when they came in. I was, I was like, well, maybe they've done it because it's quicker for them to get back up to speed on tires that have been in the ovens than it is to fuss around and maybe risk the car going off. Anyway, my little thought was correct. Let's. Uh, what do you think, Dawson? 
Well, that temperature, and you heard him talking about it, he said behind the pace car, it was undrivable. I mean, and that shows when we see Joao Barbosa, who doesn't make very many mistakes, have a spin like that. Yeah. It shows you how tough it is as here the car goes. Back underway. Finally, Barbosa gets back out onto the racing surface, and you saw car seven, the Peugeot there, the one that Anthony Davidson has been storming around this eight and a half mile track with, come in for another regulation service. Routine stop for the seven, and it's still Marcel Fassler at the top of the order, fighting these surging Peugeots. We need to take a quick break, see you in a moment. This July, baseball's biggest stars will gather together in the Arizona desert for one spectacular night in the summer's biggest event as Fox brings you every thrilling moment of the 2011 MLB All-Star Game. Coverage begins Tuesday, July 12th, live from Phoenix at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, only on Fox. On board with the Corvette number 73. Back up to speed here, Antonio Garcia behind the wheel. Sunlight starting to peek through, Dorsey. This yeah. is a great moment for the drivers. It is. This is magic right now. This time of day, it's awesome. All the guys getting out of their tents now, seeing what daylight looks like. Big hangover headache, you know. Then you realize there's nine and a half hours to yeah. go. <laughs> and you're not, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, that's the truth, too. Spectacular shots here. Garcia, what a job he has done fitting into this Corvette squad very, very nicely indeed. He was on quite a tier a couple of years ago, winning all of the big Enduros. You know, for the people who have never been to Le Mans before, unlike the, the races we have in the United States, Le Mans still has those little mushroom tents, thousands of them all over the place. People camping out everywhere. It's, it's the way it started, you know, it's the way old school. Neat racetrack. You have to come here. See our PA Lee Diffie is back with some coffee. Yeah, doors. Danny Binks there. <laughs> Do you know what's really good about this year is in the Le Mans, the official Le Mans program. Yeah, it's about say. a three-page article on Danny Binks. It's fantastic. <laughs> I, I was going to say, same he looks like a movie star, doesn't he? It's a really, yeah. really good, uh, really good article about Danny. Well, he could be a bank robber or something. <laughs> what What is difficult to articulate and to really do justice to is the love of the Corvette race car the French fans have mm. at Le Mans. When this car rolls out, these two cars roll out at scrutineering, it's unbelievable. They are like rock stars. The 10 is back in. Olivier Panis behind the wheel. Again, you see the servicing there can be done, the windshield's being cleaned, the data card is being replaced in the left side door there, refueling is going on, brake and tire technicians are allowed to inspect the car but not conduct any work until the refueling is complete. Just waiting on fuel. Now this is taking a long time, they've got a bigger fuel flow or a faster fuel flow with these cars since the last round at Spa, that fuel should be going in a little bit quicker. Almost looks like the front air jack hasn't got enough lift for them to get the tire off. Had a lot of struggle there getting that tire removed. One thing that the Persia with this 908, they changed after the first couple of years. They were really struggling to get that wheel inside the wheel lines. Yeah. There really wasn't like enough droop to really get it on there. They were wasting a lot of valuable time. Kind of looked like what had happened right there. There just wasn't enough droop in there. It hung up. So many little things on these pit stops that just have to go right. Hasn't been the smoothest to run for these guys. We expect them to be sort of like just sneaking around the back with the factory diesels, but there's a couple of petrol cars in front of them. But a long way to go, as we said, just mm. shy of nine and a half hours. They knew that they didn't have the pace on track to go with the uh, with the six factory cars, the three Audis, the three Peugeots, but they thought they may have been a little bit closer. That front end damage certainly did not help a little earlier on. Well, Pan is very frustrated when he got out of the car after a stint in the middle of the night, so he knew all was not well there, but they'll continue to battle. Let's climb aboard with Antonio Garcia.
Second chicane on the Mulsanne. The familiar helmet of Olivier Beretta. And that's good news for his teammates because they were thinking they may have to go the rest of the way without the help of Beretta. So he's been off to the medical unit and uh, Corvette have their own doctor there as well. And he has obviously been given the all clear. He didn't feel well with that lengthy caution period. He was sitting right behind the pace car. They believed he was sucking in the fumes at low speed. The car's era works differently then. Sure, they put him on oxygen the whole time he's been resting up there. Get him back to normal. I've had that same problem. That's just miserable to get that. Joao still behind the wheel there, Dorsey. Sorry, and yeah, uh, no quick spin. They'll be checking out the car. No damage. Very impressive run for this car. I mean, the HPD has really been talked about in terms of not having the straightaway speed that was necessary in this class. And uh, there they're just going to clear out all the gravel, make sure nothing's stuck in one of those brake calipers. You know, had not it got stuck in the gravel trap, it would have been no big deal. But that, unfortunately, is what uh, Le Mans is all about. There are all these gravel traps you can get stuck in. And, you know, uh, Ken Swan, the team manager here, who works hand-in-hand -hand with David Stone and uh, Jean Marchioni, uh, said, we know, based on the raw speed of the Nissan power plant, we know we're not going to win this race on out-and-out -out speed. But we've come to Le Mans with a very healthy spares package. If we know we're going to have to race with our elbows out a little bit, get a little bit physical, we might have to tear a little bit of equipment up, but we've got plenty of spares. We're going to be ready. Through the Porsche curves, this is a hairy part of the racetrack in a GTE machine. Don't have the downforce of the prototypes. You really got to feel the car through there, feed the power in. Well, Rebellion Racing has officially retired the 13 after that crash. We kind of knew that when we saw the whole under train and everything torn off of that car when they towed it back. It's not going to be an easy fix. Again, there's a rule that the driver has to stay within 10 meters of the race car as well. I think the driver had abandoned ship there. So Doug Louth there just making sure that Olivier is good to go. Both Corvettes running really, really strong. Obviously, the 74 out front. That brake change, uh, got a couple of the other guys back on the lead lap waiting for things to cycle here. I think things may have shaken out. They may still have a full lap lead over the rest of the GTE Pro field. This is the P2 front, one of the two front running class cars. David Halliday stays behind the wheel of the Team Orica Matt Moot machine. And the disappointment on the P1 side is being lifted and balanced by the strong performance of that 48 car in LMP2. Back in a moment. After almost 15 hours down in this 2011 24 hours of Le Mans, still the top four cars on the lead lap. We knew we were going to be in for a good race after practice and qualifying. It's the same in GT Pro as well. Let's talk about the Corvette cam. Well, the number 73 is in, and if you're a VIP, this is the view you could enjoy from the Corvette suite right above their pit stall. Get uh, a good look here. They are doing the refueling, cleaning that windscreen. Looks like they are going to go after tires. Do they have them ready? Nope. They have elected to go ahead and release the car. Now, once again, this is where the VIPs can hang out. You can have a good look at the TV, maybe grab yourself a bit of a drink at the bar, have yourself a little bit of a snack at the buffet and just kick back and enjoy things. This is where the high rollers come and play here for Corvette here in their 100th anniversary year and their 10th anniversary of their first win and being high rollers in here, every one of them at this point is asking, what the heck is he doing here? Basically, this is getting everything you can out of your TV credential. Nice place. <laughs> Keep milking it, mate. That's the way to do it. You know, there's so many significant uh, points for Corvette racing at Le Mans this year. 2011 also marks Corvette's 55th year in international road racing. There's so many magical milestones for the manufacturer that it would be 100% appropriate for the Corvette C6R to be victorious at Lasarp again this year. They're looking good right now, uh, Ollie Gavin, behind the wheel of the uh, lead Corvette. You saw him get 
Caught a little bit unprepared when they dived in with Richard Westbrook and uh, Ollie had to get in the car without his gloves on, but under yellow, I'm sure he sorted that out before he's back under green flag running. We're on board now with a 73 car, Antonio Garcia after that pit stop. Decides to stay in the car, so no driver change and uh, stayed on the same set of rubber. 71 AF Corsa Ferrari 458. This is the car that's been in the middle <laughs> of everything. Of everything and it's had a spotlight put on it, that's for sure. It's the car that NASCAR star Michael Waltrip is in. It's also the car that was in the middle of the mayhem with Mike Rockefeller when Rob Kaufman was behind the wheel. See the guy to the right there in the blue kind of hoodie there. That's Giuseppe Petrata. I spoke to him the other day. He's the technical director for AF Corsa. And uh, he really felt that this uh, 458, even though it's improved in over 24 hours, he said, we have a lot of speed. We've sorted out some of the gremlins with the alternator and other things that we had earlier in the year that we see Justin having a chat with Michael Waltrip. He's got a big smile on his face. He certainly enjoyed this experience, Dorsey, as we knew he would. I think he's totally awed by the experience. You could tell that last night when he was talking about it, that gives us such a, such a big deal. Justin? Yeah, I'm here, mate. Um, standing here with Rob Kaufman. Rob, I'm just going to pull you to the front of the garage a bit. Your car's in. Uh, clutch issues. Yeah, it seems that the guys are working pretty hard to get it back out there. We'd like to really finish the race, so it's been an interesting evening for us. So uh, we'd really like to get the guys back out there. We'll see how it goes. Interesting is certainly a word to describe it for you. In your words, what did you feel? What did you see? What didn't you see? when the incident happened? Well, we were you know, out there in the dark and uh, those prototypes come up pretty quick and those are very strong headlights in the back of them. And uh, the, rules, the rules here are you know, stick with your racing line and the prototypes will go around you and that's what I did. That happened to be one of the worst parts of the track it could possibly happen at. You know, thank God really uh, Rockefeller's okay and uh, you know, no one was hurt in it. And uh, you know, it's an unfortunate racing incident and we didn't touch, but uh, you know, it's still a bad situation. I see, a, a rumor is that the ACO have asked you to step down for the rest of the race. Is that true or not? Yeah, th th they asked me to, to uh, sit out the rest of the race, but the car could continue, which I think, which it's not a matter of agreeing or disagreeing with their rules and we respect the ACO. It's a tremendous venue here. and. I mean, you have to look at it. You are the equivalent of the U.S. Open here, uh, or whatever massive sporting event you want to compare it to. So you have to respect what the organizers go for in the end, and that's a good way of looking at it. Oh, absolutely. It's a privilege to be here. We hope to come back. I think they, they appreciated that, and, uh, and hopefully will invite us back again in the future. But uh, we're still trying to finish the race today. Uh, Michael's enthusiasm is contagious for the drive out there. You put a lot of effort in, in being here, and uh, certainly would like to come have you come back but one thing's for sure i know you're 100 and well a thousand percent more knowledgeable than you were well 14 hours ago this isn't a track you can practice on you have to come here yeah well done rob thank you very yeah, much. thanks Thank you later. that's pretty cool he kind of took it on the chin there it's been a difficult day for him great to see that he's still smiling and uh, looking forward to see his car see the checkered flag and uh, you know, rookies around this place and the speed of the prototypes, Dorsey, these incidents, we see them happen time and time again, but obviously the consequences today have been a lot more severe than we've seen in the past. And part of that, and we talked about it at the opening of the show, is the change in the rules, the change in the classifications and so forth, that these cars nowadays, you have to take a little bit more risk, but it's not a forgiving circuit, that's for sure. stretch up the front one more time. Fessler has the margin over Davidson, Bourdais and Manassian at the moment. There are our cars on the lead lap and there is Marcel Fessler. So he's done the hard yards through the dark. He's seen the light. There's some uh, good times ahead and it should be Andre Lotterer to step in next for Fessler. This is the battle for the lead. This is how tight it is. Anthony Davison, less than a second behind Fessler now. He's going to start to put the pressure on. We saw him make a move a little bit earlier in the evening where the straightaway speed, uh, we talked about the Peugeot being a little bit more trimmed out aerodynamically. Doesn't have the downforce, but doesn't have the drag down the straightaways, Dorsey. 
and we saw it draft up on the two car a little bit earlier and make the move. Let's see what happens here. That pass was easy. I'm wondering if this one will be such. Marcel saying, oh, not you again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> didn't, many, I, didn't I already do this once? How many times in my stint do we have to go? Do we have to cycle through this? You'd have to think that Anthony Davidson, he was in a position last year where he was in catch-up mode, and I don't think I've ever seen anyone drive here at 110% like Anthony did there for an hour or so. He was literally, I, I explained it the other day, it's like watching someone drive with a stuck throttle door. So yeah, he was just dodging around cars, yeah. was on kill mode and uh, got into Collard through the Porsche curves, one of the Corvettes. Uh, an incident that everyone feels was totally unnecessary. Anthony got out of the car, didn't have nice things to say. Everyone really took umbrage to that. And uh, he did call up, or I believe he sent an email to Doug Feehan apologizing for his comments. But as Doug said last week, I don't think he's apologizing for his actions, just how he related it to the press after the incident. And told me the other day that he has never driven at that extreme for that long in any race in his life. And when he got out of the car, he was still, ah! He was eyes wide open, mouth wide open, adrenaline rushing through his veins. And he said, I opened my mouth and those words came out. I didn't mean to sound that arrogant. I didn't mean to sound that heartless and cold. It was just in the moment. And he's in the moment right now, putting Where a move before. on Fessler for the lead of the race. And the diminutive Brit puts the number seven out in front. As we went to the break, you saw Davidson put the move on Fessler. Peugeot on Audi for the lead of the race. And you ride with Marcel Fessler now. Trying to return the favor, but we know how quick that Peugeot is down the straight. It is. It's really impressive down in this area of the racetrack. Down in the first chicane. Oh, Whoa. Davidson. Little move. He's off. <laughs> no, he got Did he save it? I mean, we don't he see him right now. Fessler is through, but Davison had a big moment there, Dorsey. He turned into that first chicane. Now we're on board with Davison. Yeah. He's okay. He saved it, but that's known the strength of your car. I mean, that, that was perfect. That was as Fessler drove him in there as deep as he could <laughs> and forced the air. Again, this is for the lead of the race. Audi versus Peugeot with just over nine hours remaining. Wow, that was a hairy moment. I tell you what, <laughs> there's not a lot of room in these chicanes to get it wrong and not get into the gravel. So that was a great save by Davison. We didn't really see it after he had that moment. You can see as he turned into the right and then was setting up in transition to the left. He had a little bobble there. He had to correct it. Fessler was through. Well, we're documented by the downforce on the two different cars that the Peugeot is, in fact, faster on top end. But the Audi has a better braking because of the downforce right. and handling package. One prototype we haven't seen a lot of today and we should uh, give a shout out to is the number 22 Kronos Racing Aston Martin. Justin standing by in that team's pit box. Yep, here, right here with Vanina. You just got out of the car. You had the best time of the race, I think, out there as the sunshine comes up, right? supposed to be the best time. I had two special times in the car when the sun was going down and when the sun came up. Unfortunately, my windscreen was so dirty that I could not really enjoy this tint. I, could, I couldn't see anything. And that, is it more when you're looking to the apex of the corner at, at low speed or high speed it's worse? Uh, both. <laughs> it's uh, especially when you come to places, to corners where, where the sun's rising, it's coming straight to your face and, and you can't see through. So it's hard to, to reach the apex. It's incredible, isn't it? The car can be running so well, yet the visibility is without it. We, you cannot push as hard. Exactly, and this, this is very frustrating because it's supposed to be the best time to make good lap times. And you know, when you come out the car, you are uh, into a rhythm and you really enjoy it. So it's a little frustrating, but we are looking to the end of the race and we have to keep it quiet. Your experience, every year you get in a, a, a faster car. You've been here a lot of times now. What do you think you, your lesson each year is, is the biggest? What do you bring as your experience count? I will tell you at the end of the race. Aha. Uh -huh. There you have it. Vanini Ricks, very big shoes. <coughs> Justin's all choked up. Well, <laughs> you see that very often. Those two grew up around the racetracks of Europe. Of course, Justin's dad, 
Derek won this event with the six-time winner Jackie Ix, Vanina's dad. So those two have known each other for a long, long time, and the troubles for the Felbermeyer Proton organization continue. This is the 88 American Bryce Miller is part of this campaign. And uh, this man here behind the wheel, Abdulaziz Al Fasal, is part of the Saudi royal family. This car is well down the order. We know it's been a tough day for the Felbermeyer group. They're working hard at it, that's for sure. Same spot that Joao Barbosa got caught out just as we saw just before the sun came up. Tricky part of the racetrack. Watch. They're on board with Davison again. Shows the, the speed. Porsche curves. This is a fabulous part of the racetrack. Really demanding. Right there is where Davison got into Collard last year, trying to go around the outside. And certainly a spot that Collard wasn't anticipating that. Just a couple of seconds is the advantage that Marcel Fessler has over Anthony Davidson at the moment. What a way to come back, force Davidson into that error. Just that slight hiccup in the first chicane after completing the first portion of the Molson straight. And Fessler is going on about it. He has just set the fastest uh, third sector of the race. Top of the hour, midnight East Coast time. It is 6 a.m. Le Mans local time. And if you're just turning on, welcome. We have really got a race on our hands. We've had a bit of everything today. High speed crashes, really frightening crashes, to be honest. Some great racing uh, right across all four classes, Cal. And right now at the top of the race, just three seconds separating Audi and Peugeot, Fessler and Davidson. My folks, Lee Diffie, Calvin Fish with you, Justin Bell and Greg Creamer on pit road. And we've got eight hours, 59 minutes to run, and we still have four cars on the lead lap overall for honors at Le Mans. Fessler just laid a lap down to 328.0, his fastest lap of the race, only three tenths shy of the fastest lap so far during this event, which was set by the number seven Davison, who trails him right now. So the chips are down, and Fessler is responding big. Now we should see some increased coverage uh, as well because typically at this hour, 6 a.m. local time, uh, the French in charge of the world feed send their camera crew back out to the uh, respective camera stations to increase the coverage. During those hours of darkness throughout the night, usually 11 p.m. local time through 6, they have restricted coverage uh, to give the local camera crew some rest. Hopefully we'll see full course coverage coming up. That's a bit like when we were checking in in Paris to come back, mate. I mean, that's a flexible time. That's whenever they're ready, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Garcia's put in a really solid stint here. He is on the podium, so to speak, at the moment. The uh, sister Corvette, Ollie Gavin, leads the way in GTE Pro. It has been a very, very rock-solid day for Corvette racing. For the program leader, Doug Feehan, this must be very satisfactory, but Doug's been here long enough. He's been around long enough that he won't even start thinking about things yet. He'll say, hey, look at the clock. Look at how much longer we've got to go. Yeah, I mean, uh, last year it was about the 16 hour mark. They had the fastest cars here last year in class and about 16 hours to go. They suddenly had these engine problems. Valve train recession, as Doug called it the other day, essentially means valve train failure. And there's some concerns with the engines at Sebring. They had enormous problems, and it really came down to a number of things, but mainly with the new paddle shift system and the harmonics that that was creating through the drivetrain. Had enormous issues, big concerns going into the 12-hour event, but they straightened things out, And uh, but you never know. A 24-hour event is another thing, and uh, I think they've still got their fingers crossed that they can get through this one. A whole new day. Dawns in Le Mans. And what will the next nine hours provide us? When you think about it, whether it be an American Le Mans Series race, Grand Am race, the regular time is two hours, 45 minutes. And you've got multiple race distances there. We've just come off the Watkins Glen six hour. Add another three hours to that. The story is far from over. And I think the best part about it, when you look at the overall 
You've had the might of Audi, the might of Peugeot come with the best they can bring, not only in terms of drivers, but their technology, their diesel technology, and what they feel will win them this race. New cars with the 908 and the R18, and we've seen that it's a pretty fair match, driver and car. Drama's here for the Labra Porsche. Christophe Bure behind the wheel right now. Looks like he's got wide and just nosed it in there. I would think they'd get traction off the rear tires, be able to pull it out, unless he's got some, some kind of drama. There he is, he's found reverse. This is significant because this car well, was... I think he's wedged up against the tire barrier there, so it's going to be tough him to maneuver out of there, I think, but... He's got to be patient, don't panic, be safe. This is significant because that car's third in GTE AM. So right at the point where the Labra team did not want to see any errors, one has occurred. Speaking of GTE AM, the Flying Lizard group is on top. Darren Law, in his third visit to Le Mans, is doing a stunning job. Justin? Yeah, stunning job indeed. I mean, the lap times are very quick. There are a couple of uh, GTE cars that are going faster than them, but they don't really have to. The car right behind him is running about three seconds slower a lap. Uh, they are going to change tyres. Uh, they're putting in the fuel. They just clean the front windscreen. Darren looks pretty composed. I'm looking in at his eyes. He's just actually slackening off his belt so he can move the seat forward. That's interesting. Um, he's quite a tall lad anyway, but uh, probably wanted to be a bit more up on the wheel. Sometimes you do that when you get a little fatigued. I mean, uh, and they've got sliders in the Porsche. How civilized, so you can move the seat forward. Um, front tires are going on. The car, it looks in remarkably good shape. This beautiful uh, paint job with the flags of all the Porsche winners on it. Uh, as of yet, undamaged. There was a little bit of a, a side bet. My dad thought he might be the one that got damaged on that front left-hand <laughs> side. Um, so he was, along with Yannick Dalmas. What a beautiful car. Off they go. Uh, but I have to say that talking with the other guys, they uh, well, Darren and, and Spencer were telling me that uh, certainly if they damage it, they'll try and damage the side with all telly on. I don't know why that was, but, you know. <laughs> Good fun, Justin. Here we see the one of the Ferraris. This is the uh, luxury racing Ferrari, the French team, the 59, and this car yeah. has been as high as third in class. Yeah, Stefan Ortelli and Jamie Mello. Definitely drop down the order a little bit here. This is the team that is essentially being run by the Risi crew coming over from the States. Two-time winners here. Safety car is out again as one of the BMWs hits pit lane. Had some problems early in the event. A misfire that cost them valuable time in their pit box. Otherwise, I think they'd be fighting for the lead with the Corvettes. But since that time, it's been a good, strong run. Stefan Ortelli is driving that 59 Luxury uh, Racing Ferrari. Greg, do you have an update on that? Well, actually, uh, also, I'm at the uh, BMW. Joey is going to be getting on board this car. And along with that uh, first issue, we're talking about the misfire. And they had that little bit of moment in the gravel during the night. Joey said it was related to a downshift issue. Apparently, there's a hiccup of the downshift. It was just enough. He said, fortunately, it was a quick out from the gravel. And they were able to get going again. They are going along with the driver change. They are doing tires. But so far, it looks routine. On that 59 machine, we've been documenting the problems it's been having. All as a, res uh, a result of the fire bottle going off inside the car earlier in the event and the corrosiveness of that and they said now it's got into the ECU and they actually changed the chip in the last stop that was one of the long delays for that stop and uh, clearly they are really struggling with this I talked with Beaky Sims Dave Sims and he said we just expect it to get worse and worse and worse and by the way right in front of me now the number 74 Corvette is in this one looks like uh, it's just going to be fuel and a windshield clean and then back out so routine here as well Bourdais is in, having another strong run here this year. He so desperately wants to win the race in his hometown here of Le Mans. And he's having a strong run, but he's got other teammates to beat as well as one very fast Audi in front of him. We've not been given uh, notification uh, as to the caution. However, now we do get a message that it is car 58. 58 stopped out on track was the 59 the right. sister luxury car we saw with Stefano Telly driving trying to limp back to pit entry 
However, the uh, ACO official timing saying car 58 stopped out on track. Here we see the safety car procedure. Just to reiterate, there are three safety cars that are deployed during this caution period at different parts around the racetrack. And essentially, once the train has gone by, you're going to get a red light at the end of pit lane. You have to wait for the next one to come through, which is now coming through the Ford Chicanes. And once that train of cars is by, they will then release the cars that are sitting there or go back to red. So anyone who then makes a subsequent pit stop will need to wait for the next segment. If you've never seen one of these top flight LMP, the prototypes, particularly the Audi or Peugeot, the Audi safety car and pace car there, this will give you just a, a realistic understanding of just how low they sit. There's a comparison that Audi have provided with the R18 up against the most recent model of the RA6 road car. The top of the R18 comes to the bottom of the mirrors on the A6. Yeah, it's a pretty wild shot. It really uh, demonstrates just how low they've got these prototypes now and uh, the Audi as well as uh, the Peugeot have really worked hard on the aerodynamic efficiency with the reduced power this year. And uh, it's quite amazing to see how low they sit to the ground. The greenhouse of the prototype is really, really low. And again, we talk about that between the BMW and the Corvette. So they have now been released from pit lane, the 56 car, followed by one of the Corvettes and that number nine of Bourdais. We are under caution. So we'll make the most of it. We'll squeeze away. There is Anthony Davidson. He's done a very good job talking with Olivia Kinnell, the program director at Peugeot Sport. And I'm pretty sure they're feeling very confident. No matter how tired you may have felt during the night, dawn brings a lift, but also historically, a rash of retirements. Are the rejuvenated drivers suddenly harder on their cars? No one knows. In any case, the burst of energy is brief, and now exhaustion sets in for the duration. This is when 24 hours seems impossibly long, the end impossibly far away. About nine o'clock, sponsors and their friends arrive after a night's sleep in a fancy hotel. They shower and they're dressed in fresh clothes. How are we doing, they ask. They'll be lucky to get a civil answer. The night has created a hard-earned bond among those who have seen it through. They are the insiders, aloof to the rest of the world. Beautifully described by Speed Sam Posey, as only Sam does. As the sun is growing taller in the sky above Le Mans, we welcome you back to Circuit de la Sarthe. We uh, had a, a caution not that long ago. The Robertson Ford GT is still circulating, not for the moment, being pushed back into the garage, but for Andrea and David Robinson and for Dave Murray, this, cross your fingers that this is not major. It would be a delight to see them get to the checkered flag. It really would. They are so excited to be here. It's really been a dream of theirs for many years since they got involved in sports car racing at this level and David Murray has been along for the ride and many of the crew I mean Andrea said this week it's not only for us for myself and David but this whole team has worked tirelessly to really get the effort to the level where they felt they were confident of coming to Le Mans and putting on the type of performance that we've seen from them over the last 15 hours or so when you think of that car also you think about Dick Barber I want to give a shout out to Dick and say hey I know that you brought four cars here back in the uh, in the early 70s when I made that comment yesterday about Oak Racing bringing four cars I was talking about in the prototype category and for the first time in a long time so just to give credit where credit's due to Dick Barber and all of the wonderful things that he achieved here at Circuit de la Sarre. Uh, we had a caution a little while ago for Jean-Christophe Bouillon I can update you that in that pretty severe crash JCB is okay. He just bruised his foot. That's quite a uh, quite an escape. And we've got more drama going on here under caution. This is with the Team Orica Matmut car. A little kick of that front wheel is not exactly going to do a whole lot there, Chief. Stuck the boot in. I think that's going to continue to happen until he gets it back to the pit lane, don't you? Yeah, David Halliday trying to limp this car back. This is a real shame for um, Yuk Deshonak's P2 car because for the majority of this race, it has been the lead car. Okay, you're gonna have to walk him all the way back to his pit box, if that be the case. Wow, 
craziness under caution. The caution is for the 59 car. Dr. Wolfgang Ulrich, the eyes looking a little tired, understandably yeah. so, the stress that that man has been under today. And Hugh Deshonak is wondering what is going on with his P2 car. There we go, now Halliday's got some momentum. Henri Pescarolo. His car is placed fifth overall with Collard behind the wheel. So great to see that man back. He belongs here and uh, has such a passion for this race. And uh, great to see that his team has been resurrected this year. He was here last year doing TV work and he said it just didn't, didn't seem right. And uh, he got the Pescarolo chassis back out. Judd five leader and uh, team's done a great job here looking for that first in the petrol class Hugh Deshonak was the man in the middle there with his arms up saying does anyone know what happened to my number 48 we should be still vying for the lead and the win of this class that is not going to be the case Tom Kimber Smith in his Greaves Motorsport Greaves Racing Zytec leads the category now david halliday was second that is not longer no longer the case this car has retired so that makes life easier for the 26 signatech machine with sahaya yari and it also gives scott tucker's team another chance at being on the podium here at le mans after joao barbosa spun about an hour ago yeah, and just running at that low speed. I mean, Hugh Deshonak is a is a fierce team leader. He he leads his troops very well. And one thing he will not tolerate is driver error. We've seen many good results go by the wayside because of some of his drivers making mistakes over the years. And uh, he really drums at home. Justin Bell is uh, driven for Hugh, and he has a directive: don't screw up. We don't know what happened here. We haven't seen a replay, but certainly David Halliday is sticking with the car. He knows the rules. He's on the radio now trying to report to the team what's going on. But once you abandon the car and you move more than 10 meters away, your day is effectively over. And you can understand the disbelief there in the Orica camp. Ten cars had troubles, a little bit off the pace in terms of track position and many laps down on the leaders. In fact, is running behind the lead uh, petrol powered cars. We expected them to be nipping at the heels of the factory diesels and uh, the day just hasn't been a smooth one. We haven't spoken about it in a while, but Pescarolo's best car with Collard behind the wheel has a two lap buffer over the next best petrol powered car of Neil Yarni in the sole remaining Rebellion Toyota. One lap further back is the 10 car, currently in seventh overall. Hey guys. Well, just crawling out of his sleeping bag. Yeah, I wish. As <laughs> Le Mans winner, three time Grand Am champ, Scott Pruitt. Welcome back, mate. And you come back under yet another caution. It seems to be. I hope it's not any of those big messes that we've seen uh, earlier in the race. Uh, it's just getting elongated. I mean, it was fairly straightforward caution. And the safety car was deployed. The safety cars were deployed because of the number 59 luxury racing Ferrari of Stefan Ortelli. And now add to that this David Halliday situation in the Orica prototype. Look at that windshield there. You can see some fluid has got on the front. It just. Uh, takes the airflow up and over you can see that there and um, we talked about there is a, a windshield washer system and they said basically in, employs the same washer fluid that are put into the Audis as original equipment works pretty effectively but I haven't seen any of those drivers utilize it here look at the smoke there from that diesel under caution I think you're just going to see that naturally it's not a concern Dr. Ulrich what a day it's been for him seeing his cars effectively be the fastest cars on the racetrack, taken off at the beginning of this race, two massive crashes. He's lost both cars, but most importantly, both of his drivers, Alan McNishan, Mike Rockenfeller walked away, and it really says a lot about the technology and the safety cell that these drivers are now within in this Audi R18. You hate to hear it, but the reality of it is, is we all learn from accidents. When I had my massive shunt 
and broke a lot of things back in my IndyCar days. That's when your feet were still out in front of the axle. Mm -hmm. And after that, they learned how, well, let's get the feet <laughs> and, and ankles and everything behind the front axle, and let's learn new technologies about making these cars better and tougher and stronger and safer for the drivers. Now go back and a look at all the data from these crash cars, these crash Audis, and the good news that'll come from all of it is the cars will continue to develop and become safer for the drivers. That was the Signatech Nissan that will inherit second place in the LMP2 class, and it looked like uh, Lucas Ordonez climbing aboard after Sahaila Yari jumped out. We'll update you on that when we get back and things cycle through and timing and scoring uh, allow us and afford us that information. I mean, this would just add to the story, boys, if the sole remaining Audi were able to hold off the three Peugeots. Peugeot knew that they had to do something to rectify last year's mistakes with the engine failure, the structural failure, the embarrassment that was not going to happen again, particularly coming off a year when they won. So they did not go back to back. And we will see in eight and a half hours time what a whole year and more's work yields for both Audi and Peugeot. To Greg Creamer. Yeah, I just thought I'd give you a little update on some of the activity. And as I'm doing that, the number 55 BMW comes in for a stop as well. But uh, you're actually going to see a driver change in that car. Looks like they will also do tires. The number 49 Oak uh, machine uh, in the P2 category went into the garage. The reason was there was something wrong. They had a problem in the right rear suspension. They are swapping out the entire right rear corner. Uprights, the entire deal. That's why that went behind the wall. Also, the number 33 the uh, level five machine came in for a quick stop fairly routine they said they were near the window they decided to do it uh, under caution and get that done that car it's an interesting development with that machine because they said when they homologated that car was with the high down for sprint trim and they said the problem that they're really running into for Le Mans it's the problem why they don't have as much speed here as they'd like is because of that homologation you can't make changes so they said if we trim the, uh, the rear wing out to get the speed we can't make changes at the front of the car because of the homologation rules to the bodywork to balance the car out. So we have to run it with more downforce than we would like. And also, guys, you were speculating as to what the issue was with the Robertson 4 GT minor. They took this uh, caution period, put the car in the garage to get all hands on deck, changed brakes on all four corners, and gave that radiator grill screen a huge blowing out to make sure that it was good. Andrea stayed on board, and they are back out as well. And we just got a quick shot there of the Robertson Racing Ford GT back out on track and we would love to see it still on track in eight hours 35 minutes time to see the checkered flag lights are off on the safety car we're ready to go racing again the end of the fourth full course caution somebody just dove for pit lane i think that was the eight car one of the Peugeots has dived in fessler the leader stays on track going to be going back to green flag racing here remember three pace cars will release all of the cars at three different points around the racetrack it was frank montagne he dove for pit lane and you see frank coming to his pit box right now fessler the race leader gets by the chronos aston martin prototype in the background is your bergmeister and the flying lizard porsche in gt pro and the lizards are up to fourth i like that strategy that peugeot's playing they have the opportunity with three different cars uh to, to kind of mix things up a little yeah. bit go after the audi in three different directions yeah confuse them i mean it's really it's one thing when you go one-on-one -on -one with someone but with it, when they're playing three different strategies it's really hard to cover all of your bases with a single bullet you had left in your gun with the number two machine now remember what simon pagino told us a little earlier on behind the safety car with these cool early morning conditions it was almost undrivable gently gently getting back up to speed marcel fessler cannot afford to make an error here nor those chasing him sebastian bordet mark Genet. we can adjust the asr effectively traction control in these conditions just give it a bit more to deal with it until they start to get some bite in those tires 
Again, we talk about that Peugeot making that last stop. Remember, they'll be putting on tires that are quite warm coming out of their control oh, room. Oh, no. We talk about it. These tires aren't up to temperature in these really cool early morning conditions here. It's going to catch drivers out. This is yet more dramas for AF Corsa. Oh. It has been a tough day for this Ferrari team. The 51, the 61, and the 71 have all endured problems. That team's effectively running four cars, three in GTE, and they also kind of have the PCOM car, the P2 entry is under their wing as well. Three Peugeots run down the straightaway effectively together. Bourdais, Genet, Montaigne. And the eight car, the most recent to visit pit lane. We know that, we saw that. They're in a bit of catch up mood with the eight car. They're effectively a lap down. I ain't sure where he is in this cycle here, but he's a lap down to Fessler who leads this race. Something Simon Pagano told me the other day, Scott, was very interesting. We are unified as a team, we run as a team. There's no more okay that kind of open wheel mentality let's prove to each other who can do the fastest lap however they're competitors you want to win this race there's no doubt about that and so at one point in the week this unified front amongst the nine drivers they start to separate and go off into their respective groups of three and then when you get into the race you want to do the best possible job that you can of course and then late in the race at this stage and even later and the closer you get to the end of the race you go even harder you try even harder to put yourself in the highest possible place because the hammer will come down the team orders will be employed and you want to be that lead car of the three you want to be that lead car of the three. However, you also want to be in a position where you're smart enough with one Audi left where you take advantage of your other cars because you have that opportunity to run different strategies. Greg? Yes, we've got the number 33 is now making its stop. They are doing tires. Also, the driver changed. Rob Barbosa out, Christophe Bouchou behind the wheel. Oh, and he stalled it coming out. However, gets it restarted and is back and underway and continuing. Obviously, as this is unfolded in the P2 category, this car is closing in on things just a little bit. I'm going to uh, do a little exploring, see if I can't find Joao and get a word from him, particularly about that quick spin and uh, moment in the gravel he had. If I do, I'll get back to you. Look at Montanese looking really racy. He wants to get back on that lead lap. Looks to the inside, thinks better of it. Way to distinguish the Peugeots is really the color of the side view mirrors. The Peugeot number seven has blue, Peugeot number eight white, and Peugeot number nine red. And currently they run the number nine, number seven, number eight in line astern. Bordet, Genet, Montaigne, Olivier Canel, the boss of Peugeot Sport, looks on and says, okay, my men, don't do anything <laughs> silly here, please. No, let's not have one teammate run into another. Not that that ever happens in racing. <laughs> what Montani wants to do, he wants to get in front of these two Peugeots, and then when Fessler makes his pit stop, then he's then back on that lead lap. We got two super fast Portuguese drivers in this race. Pedro Lamy is one, Joao Barbosa is the other. He's standing by with Greg. Joao, obviously, this race always presents its challenges, and uh, you guys have had a fairly eventful time from the time you got here. Uh, looked like things were going okay in the race. Then you had that off right after the pit stop. Uh, spent a little time in the gravel. First, what happened there? Yeah, I mean, uh, here at Le Mans, the worst part is when you go slow. The tires cool down so much, and uh, I thought I was gonna s going slow enough, but uh, apparently I was still getting a little bit more speed, and the tires were stone cold, and they had no, no grip. So. There's nothing I can do at that point. And, um, but, I mean, level five has, has figured out all the problems. The car is running like clockwork. It's probably not the fastest one out there, but it's really consistent. It's really good. So it's still a long way to go. Was that, I don't recall you doing tires on that stop, changing tires. So was it just the cold temperatures and then sitting in the pits that long? Yeah, it, it's cold temperatures. Uh, I mean, we try to, to hit the tires as much as we can behind the safety car, but it's, uh, it's it's impossible to get them to, to temperature and um, I just got caught uh, uh, was my mistake. 
I was told that the car was homologated in sprint form, and so you can't really trim it out because you can't make changes to the front, so you're running more downforce than you want. So if you're if you're having problems like you're talking about with a high downforce setup, obviously this cold track is really something. I mean, it's really, really slippery. Um, the temperature, and I think also the humidity, it's, it's bringing the track temperature and it's, it's making the tires not work in the first few laps. But um, I mean, it's the same for everybody. And um, I just uh, have to learn to, to do it again. And uh, I was behind safety car quite a long time today, so I hopefully, hopefully that's enough. <laughs> Absolutely. And by the way, Joao brings up a good point. It may be cool here, but that legendary June French humidity is still at play here. You can see it in the lights at night in particular. So, Joao, hope for the best for the rest of the run. Thank you. Thanks, guys. One of the nicest guys you'll meet up and down pit lane and uh, certainly deserving of all of the su success he's had recently, Scott. You've raced against him hard. He got that win against you just a few weeks ago at VIR. Yeah, he's always a great up. Oh, here we got the lead car in, Fossler. Looks like they were setting up for tires and fuel. Be interesting, and driver. Yeah, Andre Lotterer was there, just stretching, warming up, getting himself pumped up, getting him into the mood. What's going on here? A little bit of a late move there. The Pescarolo and the 83 machine as well. So that's the JMB racing Ferrari. All right, Fessler out. Well done, Marcel. Great job. And Andre Lotter are climbing aboard. Greg? Watch the Audi Sport gang go to work. Full service here, four new Michelin tires, full load of fuel, new driver, fresh driver I should say, not new. <laughs> Starting to see uh, <laughs> all that debris and oil and such off the racetrack, lining the side of that. You might, remember, out there. you might remember last year we told you about this torque management system. When they come in, they change wheels, they change uh, all four corners of the car. The guy on the gun, all he needs to do is pull the trigger. He doesn't decide when to stop. It's not his decision. It's not that subjective. That gun will stop when, when it's at, at an adequate torque level. And that was a system that Audi employed after Dindo Capello's crash back in 2007. They first brought it in in 2008. What's going on here at Peugeot? Olivier Canel in quite a heated discussion with one of the Peugeot guys. The 88 Felbermeyer car off again. Big hit, too. This is Look at that tire. The uh, left rear tire looks like uh, it's clear off the rim. This is Al Fasal who's behind the wheel of that 88. I think Canel has got to be concerned about what's going on here. I think they need some team directive here because Montani wants by. He wants to get by these two teammates and that will effectively put him on the lead lap. And this is where you need a strong hand at the top. All of these cars are being led by different engineers and they're all got their own agenda. And I'm sure at this point in time, he's trying to get the team to work as a unit. You really need to be in a position to get the third Peugeot there back on the same lap. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and let him go. Yep. Because he wants to run a faster pace. He wants to be the rapid right now. Exactly. And uh, I mean, uh, Canel doesn't want to have one of those cars a lap down. If he can get all three on that lead lap, then he's got three chances at winning this thing rather than two and maybe a safety net, the third one a lap down. See how strong the team motors are here. He's done a tremendous job though when he came on board. Michelle Barge got fired after the disaster a couple of years ago, and uh, since that time, he's really reorganized things and given great structure to this team. They've really looked at every detail in terms of the pit stops and how effective the team was on race day, and also have come out with a very effective race car as we've seen by its speed over the last few years. And as an example of their physical strength and their unification as a team, and with great leadership, Olivier Canel joined his drivers. They finally got the instruction, let Montaigne by. Yeah, there you go. And we'll wait and see if he goes all the way to get by the nine of Bordet and begin that surge to get his lap back. Yeah, Janae got the word. Janae moved to the side there. Let's Montigny go. And that's smart orders by yeah. Peugeot. 
Get all your... Oh, look at that. Oh. All the way off. He is pushing <laughs> hard. He wants to win this thing big. That was massive. That was so close. Wow. This that is was commitment. so close. This is what it's all about. Putting on the line. Frank Montagny knows that this is a very important stint for him. These next few laps could be critical come the end of this race. This is a view from the seven. Mark Chenet heading up through turn one. You're looking at Montagny Chase Bourdais. There's Lena Gard, the engineer on the two, talking to Marcel Fessler. Look how close this is. Oh. He's going for it, isn't he? Oh. <laughs> that could have been massive. Here is the number two new driver on board, Andre Lotterer. And an update on the standings in GTE Pro. Still the 74 Corvette dominant. Welcome back to the 79th running of the 24 Hours of Le Mans, where we've got a situation where we have the lone warrior against the battalion of Peugeot's and Marcel Fassler just getting out of the number two car after a mega stint. And your battle with Anthony Davidson out there in particular when you force him into an air, just some superb stuff. Yeah, it was actually a, a night a bit difficult for me, but then uh, as soon as the uh, sun rise up, uh, I got a much better rhythm and then, then I was on the same level again. And when I come out of the pit uh, and I knew he was just right behind me, uh, he could overtook me because of a slow car in the after Mulsanne. And then I was saying, okay, now I, I bite and I keep on in and I make pressure on him. And then he did the mistakes and I could go again in front. And, and then it happened this with the safety car and then, the, yeah. It was my state was over. It was a great stint. Uh, the question one has to ask, after, after what's happened with the other two cars, has that created, even in the back of your mind, any undue caution, any worry about overtaking some of these cars, or are you just going full chat? Uh, quite early after the first shunt, uh, I told to my colleague, uh, or we together we agreed that we we push, but we don't take any risk, and I think that's where it's at the moment the key, okay? I think the both situation was a, was not a kind of a pushing or something like that. It was just a misunderstanding from some uh, GT cars, I would say. I don't, I don't know. I didn't see anything so much. But uh, in our head, now it's uh, the target is to win, and uh, we, it's a quite hard and tough battle now. It seems as though the Peugeot might have a little bit of an edge in straight line speed, but uh, when it gets into the twisty stuff, uh, that uh, the Audi really comes alive. Is that how it's playing out? Yeah, this was ac actually where, where the Peugeot could overtook me. It was a bit on the top speed area, so always on the Hinondier or going down to Indianapolis. He was quite faster, but then as soon as we come to the Porsche corner, we have a much more bigger advantage on our car. And all these twisty stuff is, uh, seems to be better for us. So as long as we can keep them behind us until the Porsche con, everything is fine. <laughs> All right, well, obviously a lot of race yet to go, but if you uh, uh, manage to pull this one off, it will be a huge yeah, achievement yeah. in light of what's happened. Congratulations on a great stint. Uh, sorry, I didn't. <laughs> Congratulations. Ah, thanks, stint, thanks, yeah. thanks a lot, thanks a lot. <laughs> See you. The 35-year-old Swiss driver had a terrible record here at Le Mans with four retirements. Didn't see the checkered flag until last year when he stood on the podium in that amazing Audi 1, 2 and 3. And we were talking there and listening about that outright top-end speed of the Peugeot. Well, what about the sole remaining Audi? Andre Lotterer has just set the fastest lap of the race with a 327.7. Yeah, that's amazing stuff. And uh, we see Montagny still pushing hard. Borne certainly didn't get the directive from uh, <laughs> Olivier Canel to slow down and let him back onto that lead lap. So have to wait and see how this plays out. But uh, as Lotterer is now behind the wheel, and Fessler said we have a supreme battle on our hands. The Audi seems up to it, but again, three bullets against one. Will that be a factor by the end of this 24 hours? That's a pretty amazing lap they just posted up there, 327. That's a good, uh, a good solid second, second and a half faster than the Peugeots have gone up to this point. So Seth Nyman getting ready for a stint there. Car leads, the 81 car leads in the GTE M division. Darren Law just did a mega stint there, and uh, now the sun is up. 
Seth's going to get behind the wheel. He's done a really nice, solid job here this year. Really learned from the experience in years past. And looking for that class victory here at Le Mans. The sun is up and the heat is on. Yeah. Sebastian Bourdais, his teammate, wants to get by, wants to get on that lead lap. Montaigne. Which is, which is a smart thing to do. I mean, you're not, you shouldn't be racing your teammate at this point. And sometimes what happens is Montaigne could, might start getting a little anxious and then, you know, want to dive inside his teammate and unfortunately take two cars out at once. So. As we enjoy this prototype battle at the moment, let's check in with one of our GT Pro teams with Greg. Yeah, I'm standing by with Olivier Beretta. Olivier, obviously you had to stop earlier. You, I, I guess, were having some problem with fumes in the car. We heard you would be back, you wouldn't be back. You got the kit on, so it looks pretty good. What's up? Yeah, I'm okay. Uh, it was not uh, just following the Ferrari and a lot of uh, smoke going inside the cockpit, and I think I felt exhaust. And uh, but now I'm I'm ready. The Corvette is running fast. Everyone at the team did a very good job. So it's still very long. It's still six hours and 45 minutes to go. So wait and see. But you're definitely going to be getting in on this next stop. Yes, yes, yes. That's great news indeed, obviously. A five-time winner here. It's awesome. Looking forward to seeing that. And let's get down to Andrew Marriott. Well, thanks very much, Greg. I can't uh, say I had a sleep at all, but uh, it was nice to have a rest. Now, we're hearing from our commentators about all oh, the sun's up and uh, the heat's on. Well, I tell you, it's only 8 degrees centigrade here. It's actually quite chilly. But uh, I look, think that we're going to have a great day here for the rest of the day. I think the temperature is going to come up pretty quickly. But, but right now, you need an overcoat on, really. Montagny still got the hammer down. Bourdais is not making way for him. Bourdais leads this race. Genet is second, Lauder a third after that last round of pit stops. And this car with the white mirrors there, Montagny is desperately wanting back on the lead lap of this race. Here's the Ray Malik P2 car. The HPD machine had turbo issues a little earlier in the race, has not gone exactly to plan. This team knows how to win the P2 category. It's done it a couple of times here at Lasaf. Had a massive crash at Spa when they got hit by Pedro Lamy in one of the Peugeots, destroyed the car. And uh, they had a new tub coming, but it was somewhat delayed. So in fact, they bought or have on loan a monocoque from AGI, Andretti Green Racing, from their LMP2 days that they had in their shops so have shifted over. They are running it here. They may run a Imola at the next race before they switch to the new tub, which is now available. You didn't hear me earlier on. I gave a shout out to your old home track, Snedden. Did you? That's where, that's where they shook the car down when they took delivery on it. I think they only got it uh, last month, like it, towards the end of May. So it was a very, very tight turnaround for them. Yeah, it was just last week. I uh, spoke to Mike Newton here this week in Le Mans, and he said, yeah, we did a quick shakedown with it. Everyone was really impressed with uh, the car that was delivered by AGR and uh, they're very appreciative of that effort and uh, the car felt good and uh, this is a team that has really done great things in this class over the years they switched to the Acura chassis last year and this year of course they're running the new power plant when we saw that uh, RML prototype come in I should have uh, given a shout there to say they're currently running sixth in class so they are desperately trying to come back they're hanging in there they know how much time's left and unfortunately Olivier Beretta thinks there's less time than what there actually is he said six hours 45 yeah. minutes <laughs> it's eight hours seven minutes to go sorry about that Olivier they want to check he's still not dizzy <laughs> <laughs> maybe that those fumes have gotten a little deeper than he thought I really enjoy these high shots. It just shows you the character of this 8.4 mile circuit. The battle is still on up front. Three Peugeots versus one Sol Audi. Team Felbermeyer Proton driver Abdulaziz Al Fasal. Unfortunately, his Le Mans is over. I guess he's calling someone to let him know that. From one prince to another, 
Here's our Calvin Fish. <laughs> On June 24th, Orange County, California becomes the home to the greatest collector car event in the world. Of course, it's Barrett Jackson, and you can see it only on speed. The finest, rarest, and most desirable cars on the planet that are all in one place and all up for grabs. Watch the auction live on speed beginning June 24th. A lot of those highly desirable cars are right here right now and the good ones are still going like the Flying Lizard Porsche. Right, Greg Kramer? It is indeed, and as a matter of fact, uh, it is slowly working its way back up the order. Jörg Borgmeister just got out of the car, and uh, Jörg, first of all, when you got out of the car, you went right to the tires that they took off and gave him a good look. What's up there? Um, nothing really special. Um, just after the, the safety car, it took a long, long time to bring temperatures back in them. Uh, we're running mediums. It was the second stint on them. Uh, Wear-wise, they look great. It was just a little cold for them right now. You guys, once again, have had a very eventful Le Mans at this point. Uh, just, you know, how is the car now? Obviously, you had some issues early that put you back a ways. Uh, we made some changes um, during my very first stint, uh, and since then, the car's pretty good. Um, fairly happy with it, um, considering how limited time we had. Um, it's pretty good. So just a matter now for the last nine hours or of just keeping the head down and just pushing? Yeah, definitely. That's what we've been doing all night, and uh, we keep doing it. And that's what this team does awfully well, York. Uh, good luck, and I uh, hope you continue to move toward the front. And at this point, speaking of moving, how about let's moving down to Andrew Marriott. Yeah, I've got the boss of Peugeot Sport here. You're trying to get all three cars onto the same lap. Yeah, we have the three cars on the same lap. and Audi too, but uh, we are really close and um, it's a really good fight. Everybody, everybody is pushing really hard, but uh, I don't know how it will finish. Now, you must be very pleased though with the performance of the cars and the difference you've made since the problems you had last year. Yeah, of course, but uh, it's still uh, eight hours to go. And you're looking remarkably fresh. Yeah, but it's so interesting that I'm very pleased to, be, to, to see what happened. See what happens. Thank you very much. On Tuesday, Olivier Canel and his driving team cycled 125 kilometers from just south of Paris here to Le Mans. And he was leading by example, saying, I want to do what my drivers can do. If they're going to go through a little bit of pain, a little bit of physical exertion, just to show, I'm going to be a part of it as well. It was a good team bonding exercise. They worked very hard on that throughout uh, the lead up to this race. They do, they do a team building uh, week in Chamonix where they do a lot of physical activity, mountain biking and hiking, and uh, but just getting the whole group together, trying to get them as a cohesive unit coming into this big event. Not only your three teammates in each individual car, but Scott, throughout the course of the week, you need to work as a team. Ultimately, you get in the race, everyone's kind of on their own agenda wanting to win, but you need to work together throughout the course of the week to make the best progress. Yeah, everybody's somewhat on their own agenda, but you're also part of a team, a bigger piece of a team, not only the three drivers, but also the, the three team cars. And we're talking about these temperatures. It's kind of reminiscent of Daytona a couple years ago where we had those freezing cold temperatures. You had to be also careful all the time. When you went out of the pits on cold tires, on the, you know, in the Grand Am Series, we do not have controlled room areas for temperatures. Uh, so the, t the, the tires put on are, are stone cold. And then when you're running around, you know, let's say hot tires and, and run around for, let's say, 15, 20 minutes behind a, a safety car, the temperatures come right back down in the tires, and you got to be also careful getting going. And we saw a number of very talented drivers getting a, a quick spin and cars getting away from them. I'll tell you what is impressive. Andre Lauder had just laid down a lap, a 326.2. That is stunning. And how does Pujol respond? Bordet just did one himself. <laughs> Three so he just found a second. The wick has been turned up. A hundredth faster. So with just under eight hours to run to the checkered flag, it's Peugeot, Peugeot, Audi, Peugeot. Bordet, Genet, Lotterer, Montagny. 
so much to play out. You just heard from Peugeot Sport Boss with Andrew Marriott, Olivier Canel. This is too exciting, it's too intriguing. It has got my 100% attention. And why wouldn't it? We know some of you on the West Coast might just be turning on, wondering what's been the story of the day. Let's tell you the story of the day thus far. It looked good early on for Audi, with Benoit Trellier starting the number two car, and that is the car that is still very much in the mix. It was a day to forget for Aston Martin. Darren Turner had a quick spin at the first chicane. Ultimately, the car was retired. Then we saw a spate of tyre problems, Scott. A lot of gravel out on the racetrack, and the gravel here is very sharp. Then the big one. Alan McNish colliding with a GT Ferrari, and really nasty scenes here. Oof. That was a horrific crash. Our cameraman scattering right there. Watch the wheel about to come down right there. That's a complete corner. Brake caliber, rotor, upright. That is a heavy, heavy piece, and Alan walked away amazingly from this mega crash. He had a massive one in his Formula One career at Suzuka, and that is certainly the biggest one in his sports car career. Nick Johnson with a big slide. He did well to keep it going. Unfortunately, this Crone Racing Ferrari is no longer in the 24 hours of Le Mans. Boy, it's been a tough day for these guys. Yeah, last year's chairman in the GT class, uh, the Felbermeyer Porsche. Numerous problems. Here we see another puncher, left rear down, and then the Quiffle. P1 machine, the 20 car, goes out with an engine drama. Tire dramas for the BMW squad. This was the 55. A lot of tire issues. Those rocks come up onto the track. They're sharp. We've seen a lot of tire issues the whole race long. On board with the number one Audi and Romain Ooh. Dumas getting by some traffic and spinning at Tete Rouge. He was spitting afterwards. He is very unhappy with some of the driving standards here this weekend. This is the 62 machine, the CRS Racing Ferrari, and shortly thereafter, that car retired. There was a misfire with the 56 BMW. This is the car that American Joey Hand is competing in. Going for the triple crown, that cost him a couple of laps, and they were men there. Then Mike Rockenfeller gets it wrong on the entry to pit lane. No harm, no foul, brings it in nicely, but then, just a few moments later, this is another amazing crash, Scott. Yeah, you take a look at that up the inside. Doesn't actually clip that Ferrari, but gets in the dirt, car gets away from him, and massive shunt. You see all those pieces and parts. Again, the only fortunate thing came away from there is he's able to uh, get away from that horrible accident unhurt. No major injuries anyway. That was the 39 LMP2 prototype there, the Pecom racing machine, the BMW Judd powered entry and drama for the front end of the Orica 908. And this really put paid to their chances of running in the top five. We scoot forward to the 15th hour and drama's here for Jean-Christophe Bouillon in the 13 machine. And we mentioned earlier in the broadcast, he was able to escape with just a bruised foot. Going back from a caution, tire temperatures are low. We saw numerous spins throughout the course of this event. And then Joao Barbosa gets it wrong down in the middle lot curves. He just said I had no tire temperature. I thought it slowed down enough. Obviously not the case. David Halliday retires. Drama for the 908 for Team Orica. Matt Muth, this is their LMP2 car with their Nissan-powered machine over and out. As simple as that. We bring you up to just a few moments ago, two of the three Peugeots pitting at the same time. And Montagny, oh, here comes Make the third three. one. He's <laughs> going to be sandwiched, even if the crew does their work a little bit quicker. I don't think he's going to get his way out of there, so you'd have to assume that the nine car will lead these guys out of pit lane. Andre Lotterer cycles to the top of the order. Comes and Fessler, he's going to put a lap on these guys, I think. He's going to go back to the lead. Back to the lead. They sit on pit lane, so no, he now assumes the lead of this race. These guys were leading, and as we suspect, no change there in the order. They return to the racetrack in the order they hit pit lane. Which was Bordet, Montagne, Genet. Looks like Genet may have had just a little issue. Oh, oh no! Breda on 
returning to the race car. I believe this is Arnaj. Yeah. Very slippery corner. Olivier had not long been in the car, taking over from Antonio Garcia. Didn't look like he nosed it in there bad. It's a very slow corner, Scott, so sometimes you can get away with that. So Pagano have a moment last night and decided to take the escape route, which is obviously the best plan. Keep in mind, this is the third place car in GT Pro. You can see the tire marks all the way straight across. It looks like he's having a hard yeah. time getting it out of reverse. Out of reverse. Found reverse, which is normally the hard part. Let's take a look on board with him out of Indianapolis. Oh, yeah, he's carrying yeah. way too much speed there. I'm not sure if he, maybe there's a gearbox issue. Maybe he couldn't get it downshifted. Maybe. It looks like he's fighting something getting going there. Gary Pratt, the man behind Pratt and Miller, and the Corvette Racing Squad look on with some frustration. Remember, these guys are running the paddle shifter. Sometimes you'll call for that gear. I know the BMWs had some problems at the test. We understand Joey Ann had a problem with it last night as well in terms of calling for a, a gear, and it doesn't bring it down. So as you're going into the corner, you're relying a little bit on that retardation from the engine braking at the same time as using the brakes. There's so much electronics going on in these cars, paddle shifts, just, just the electronics themselves and the way they control the engine, the traction control and so on. You just got to get it right, and sometimes you just have little mishaps. Andre Lodera relishing the opportunity to run at the front and run hard in his R18. Let's check in with Andrew for an update. Yes, sir. Just talk about those Peugeot pit stop. We had, I've never seen this before. All three of the Peugeots came in together. It was for fuel in all three of them. They bent out virtually as a, a fleet. Now I've got Michael Waltrip for me. Mike, it doesn't look very good. It looks as if you're gonna retire. What's the problem, transmission? Yeah, something broke in the back. They just, I just noticed there's a death certificate for our poor little Ferrari and uh, it's over for us for this uh, Le Mans, but what a great experience. Um, I got in the car after Rui and I made a half a lap and it broke. So uh, he said that the clutch needed bleeding and something was going on there. And then um, I, I don't know what I did, but uh, this this uh, this is all new to me, but had some pretty good lap times and was really uh, comfortable in the car. Just uh, hate we didn't stick around for the finish. You gonna come back? <laughs> I hope so. We did spa last fall and got a P3 podium finish and we thought this stuff's fun. But then you come to Le Mans and have everything in the world go wrong. Uh, it's not so fun, but there's my partner, uh, Rob has a saying. He says, if, um, if it was easy, they would call it the um, easy ship and not the championship. Uh, <laughs> we understand the difficulties of racing and we're just happy to be here and be a part of it. Michael, we've really enjoyed our time with you. Thanks for giving us so much of uh, your personality and everything. Um, you must come back. I'm just blessed. I'm so thankful to be here and it's good to meet you and good to see all the guys on Speed. Speed is my favorite channel, has been forever, and I, I really appreciate your commitment to it. Do you reckon they'll use that as a promo? I don't know. That's a good idea. Yeah, Let's run that up the pole. You should send him an invoice. <laughs> 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 yeah, Michael has really enjoyed his time. It's been a tricky day for the number 71 AF Corsa car. Not so tricky up front, though, for Andre Lotterer. He has just broken the fastest lap of the race yet again. He and Bourdais were going blow for blow. The young German grabs it back.
thing you can't hear at home, folks, there is our producers are talking to us in our headsets saying your mics are open, you can speak if you would like to. And I don't think there's any words that can do those pictures justice. Those it's just great good. listening to the music wow. and watching. And those pictures and those drivers and that history and that pageantry of all those cars. It's just the drivers, the cars, everything. It just gives you goosebumps. Ah, Who's I like that, that car? Who's, Who's that, that guy in that back fender there? <laughs> ah, I like us. Bring that sucker to victory lane. First Nothing like getting to victory lane at uh, Le Mans. First win for Corvette. First win for Corvette. I'm one for one there, so that's always a good record to have. Do you know one of the faces we saw in that montage of shots there was Steve McQueen. It's the 40th anniversary of the movie Le Mans this year. So many things that we are celebrating here at this year's 24 Hours of Le Mans. I've been doing some work for uh, for a few manufacturers, and you run an open face helmet instead of closed, so it had the McQueen number on it, number 20, the blue and the orange. And it must be quite a few years ago because a lot of the guys are thinking I'm Lightning McQueen <laughs> instead of Steve McQueen. <laughs> and wow, that's quite a change from those days. A 72 Pinto, that's right, with the blow-up model. That was my first car. Before I could drive it, I had to do a valve job on it. Bought it for 500 bucks. Cool stuff. Tell you what, this is a fascinating battle here. We're looking at Marc Genet, who's currently running second. Uh, Peugeot's now run one, two. Lotter made a pit stop. He laid down a lap there, guys, at 25-2. That's half a second faster than the qualifying pole here this year. So that is really getting the job done. But I tell you what, how much difference does traffic make now with the new regulations? His next lap was a 337. So a traffic lap compared to a clear lap, 12 seconds. And this is what we're talking about in the risks that these guys may need to start taking as the pressure starts to pile on here in the final hours of this race. You can't afford to lose that amount of time due to traffic. You're going to have to be creative. Those chances will be taken again. Calvin just gave you the top three in overall and in prototype one. In P2, it is still that Greaves Motorsport. Oh, drama's here for the 81 Seth. Flying Lizard car. Seth Nyman at Molson Corner. This is the class leading car. Just locked it up there, didn't release the brakes, needed to get off that brake pedal, Scott, and just try and get the car around the corner. You can see the smoke continues. Spencer Pompelli looks on with the rest of the crew. He's escaped the gravel trap, so it looks like he may have dodged he, a bullet there. He kept it going. It's hard to say if he potentially has a tire going down on that yep. right corner, because that has been such a drama. And look at all the rock and garbage falling yeah. out from underneath that car. A lot of suspension movement there, but the one thing is you come into Mulsanne, it really lows the left side of the car. The right side is like so easy to lock up one of those tires. You see that little kink? That's exactly where Rockenfeller went off. That shows you the speed they're doing and the severity of that incident. Let's see what happened here to the 81 machine of Seth Nyman. Down into Molson corner. Oh, he locked up yeah. the front. Yeah, he's locked up the front tire there. You can't quite see that, but just going in there, you can just see the smoke coming off. Okay, and as you, you said, you can see there's just a little bit of crown to the road there. The inside gets light. He locked it up. It should have just come off the brake a little bit. Unfortunately, just kept it on down and locked her all the way up until it got off into the gravel. Drama in GTE M. However, let's turn our attention to GTE Pro. It has been a real pro day for the number 74 Corvette Racing C6R. Let's go there now with Greg. Isn't it? A phenomenal day so far. Ollie Gavin just getting out of the car. Another pit stop. Magnuson uh, behind the wheel. Uh, things seem to be going pretty well. Yeah, so far, so good. You know, fingers crossed. Uh, you know, it's through the night. It was a lot of lot of safety car. I seem to have just this endless amount of time in the car when the safety car was out, while they're fixing barriers and other stuff. And even when there was another safety car, when Richard was in the car, he immediately brought the car into the pits and said, put Gavin in. So, you know, it seems like every time the safety car out, it's, I'm in. But, um, no, it's going, it's going pretty well. I think that, you know, the Ferrari is still very, very fast. We're battling hard with that. So... 
let's just see how the next few hours play out. But, uh, you know, again, great. It's, uh, we're leading the race with Chevrolet's 100th year anniversary. So, you know, it's, it's all fitting in nicely. Just uh, still a long way to go. Also 10th anniversary of that first win here for GT1 as well. So nice stuff. I hope the fact that they keep putting you in during the safety car is an indication that they think that's where you're at your best in terms of driving. I'm sure it's not. Do you have any, uh, any word on the other car? We've heard reports that maybe there's a, a transmission issue. Have you heard anything on that? No, I haven't heard anything on that. But uh, I know that the car was running pretty well when it was behind me. Um, and I just, I, I'm not really too sure. I've literally just got out of the car, so I have to ask the guys. Car's handling well. Are you happy with it right now? Yeah, it's not handling badly. I mean, the rear is a little bit nervous, but um, you can live with it, make it work. And uh, Michelin tires are working wonderfully as always. Of course, a pretty chilly track, so that can't be helping out. Thanks so much, Ali. Appreciate it. Continue a great run. And by the way, update on the 73 with Olivier Beretta. Uh, reports were just had a moment in Arnage. Got in a little bit too hot, ran it wide, was able to continue it. They had a nose ready to go just in case there was some damage. Olivier completed the lap, said it feels good. They said run another lap. He went around again. I went in and talked to, uh, to Danny Binks, and Danny said, no, Olivier said the car feels good, no overheating, no issues like that, so everything's fine. With that, let's get down to Andrew Marriott. In of, uh, this Le Mans, and the car is just sitting, I'm just trying to look around and see if there is any damage. No, the car is down off the jacks, it's going to go out, so the 81 car, just a bit minor drama there with that... Uh, straight on but uh, the car is back on the racetrack nice fancy footwork by andrew there we could see on screen <laughs> <laughs> feather feet feather feet we call him this is uh, nice to see the pescarola there's the man behind the name Henri. his driver christophe tanso is behind the wheel and maintains its position with a couple of lap advantage over neil yanni the next best petrol powered car and uh, Christoph is still sitting in a very strong top five position. Just getting back to a point that we did not make about Olivier Beretta's mistake. What it did is it's been very costly time-wise and it's given the GT Pro flying lizard car of Patrick Long, Jorg Bergmeister and Lucas Lua another little boost and another little skip in their step because they are even closer now to that car of Olivier Beretta. This is a replay of the 81 car. This is not the car that I was just talking about. Seth Nyman climbs, climbs from that machine, and it looks like Spencer Pumpelli was getting ready to dive in. See the Tuck. gravel there caught up inside the wheel, and uh, that'll be up there uh, around the brake caliper and stuff, so they'll clean that out. And uh, Spencer Pumpelli now behind the wheel, so good recovery job there by Seth. I'm sure the team's heart skipped a beat there watching that on the monitor see the bmw's in haven't had the smoothest run not big big problems cost them a couple of laps but it's so competitive now in this class it's really hard to claw your way back it, it is trying to get that lap back it's very difficult with the exchange of, uh, of of cars and when the yellows come out you're just kind of stuck where you're at you can't get passed around yeah the safety car a difficult thing to get back procedure here really eliminates any hope of getting that lap back because there are three of them so you can't get away by or anything like that so uh tough to make up ground here at le mans the 81 flying lizard machine did lose the lead of the class the 50 labra competition corvette is leading gte am we'll update you on some other positions when we come back but this race for the lead is thrilling In 2000, Chevrolet launched a massive assault on Le Mans, based around their potent Corvette C5. The team rapidly became known for their professionalism, their attention to even the smallest details, and the blazing speed of their yellow cars. They had what it took to win at Le Mans. High top speed, rock-solid reliability that was the envy of their opponents, and some of the best drivers in the world. The result? Six wins. Can they add a seventh? See how Corvette brings the track to the street at youtube.com slash Chevrolet. Corvette to the street, Corvette to the racetrack right here at Circuit de la Sarthe. 
because it's been a domineering performance, not necessarily from this car, the 73, but the sister 74. We just heard from Ollie Gavin, his good mate, Jan Magnussen, who has won here at Le Mans every single time he's driven with Oliver Gavin. We'll see if that trend continues. Let's talk about another GT car. Let's get it to Andrew Marriott. Yeah, well, you saw me interviewing Michael Waltrip. He's about a foot taller than me. I like interviewing Seth Demon because we're the same size. <laughs> Seth, good run there, but you went off into the gravel. Yeah, I uh, got to the Mulsan, and for some reason, the right front just locked up badly, couldn't get it turned. Flat spotted the tire so bad we had to make a change. Now, you're having a terrific battle here with the Corvette for the AM category. Yeah, this is a lot of fun. You know, we have a lot, a mixture of very talented amateurs and pros, and it, uh, you know, it makes for a very interesting kind of racing that we don't usually get to do here at Le Mans. Now, some of the AM drivers have been criticized heavily here, particularly the incident with Rocky, but you're very experienced. You might be an AM driver, but you've got a lot of experience. And what do you carry with you when you see these faster cars? Well, you know, one of the things you learn after a long time with four-class racing is that, first of all, you learn who the prototype drivers are, and you learn where they like to go, and you begin to show them what you're going to do. And uh, you never take a chance. It's a 24-hour race and uh, bad things can happen unfortunately as we've seen a couple times today. Seth thanks very much and let's throw it to Greg Creamer. Well, thanks very much, Andrew. One of their competitors also having a very good run. I think currently sixth in the AM category, just getting out after uh, one of her mega stints here. They, boy, they've been putting you to work as Andrea Robertson. And Andrea, first of all, how's things going? You did uh, a brake change, all four brakes, cleaned up the grill, uh, but otherwise it looks like the car's just clocking. The car's doing good. Uh, we had a little issue, I think, in my second stint. Our paddle shift went. We couldn't get, we can get the ups, but we couldn't get the downs. And I couldn't get it no lower than fifth gear and I radioed in it uh, no good because you know the chicanes or where we need to be down first or second gear it's absolutely not good and especially with the speed we need to carry so because we've got the best team in the world our boys they always kept our um, stick shift or um, our sequential shift and all they did was unpop it. They, I came in, put me in the garage, we unpopped it, and we went back out. No drama. So we'll take care of the paddle shift later. So we continued. It didn't stop us. We lost maybe three or four laps, perhaps. Not a big drama, considering if we did, if the boys weren't smart to keep that in, we would have been out for a long, long mechanical delay. So. They put you to work. You did a triple stint earlier at night. You've just done a double. Obviously, we've heard lots of reports about how cold the track is and, and how that's affecting grip. What were you feeling in the Ford GT? Oh, yeah, I was feeling it. I had a lot better yesterday and even the earlier stints overnight. This right now was very tricky driving. Spots where I was able to get on the gas and smooth myself out. I, uh, the rear end was kicking out in me every time and even coming through the Porsche curves where I could normally carry a little bit more speed I had to really be tender because uh, again a little bit too much a couple mile per hour too fast and the rear end wanted to kick out so I thought I seen a lot of cars off in the grass kitty litter in the wall I didn't want to be that way so I thought I'll take it a little conservatively get on it when I can but be a little bit more cautious to just feel the, feel the car around now, in the last stop and driver change with you and Dave, I understand uh, he gave you a flower. Uh, what's the story behind that? Uh, it's our anniversary today. <laughs> so, yeah, we're celebrating here, and then at home I'll make him a nice dinner. I got a present for him at home. So that was what that was about. Well, I'm going to tell you, he knows how to give an anniversary present, huh, the 24 Hours of Le Mans? I'll take a flower anytime. yeah. What's the present you got for him? Oh, I got him one of those big man chairs, uh, those king size. I saw it in one of the catalogs. I thought, it's perfect for him. He doesn't fit in anything else. So I got that, and I'll, I'll just do a special dinner and ice cream. It's good to be king, yeah. Absolutely. He thinks he is, but I'm actually the, I'm the one that wears the pants in the family. <laughs> and by the way, we also want to, uh, on, on behalf of us, say a big thanks, because after the problems for the Ferrari, you guys are, uh, are giving us a place to base and have our batteries and our packs and everything. So we thank you very much for that. And happy anniversary. I, I hope it just gets better as the ne next eight hours unfold. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll get some rest. It's something being here at Le Mans that's been many years in the making for the Robertson family and 
Andrea herself, self-admitted tomboy. She got into drag racing at about the age of 16. She said, you ask me to do anything mechanical, I can do it. I can tear an engine down, put it back together. I just have the love. Here's another female in motorsport, Lena Gard, the engineer for this car here, the number two Audi, the sole remaining R18 for Andre Lotterer, Marcel Fassler and Benoit Trellier. Will Audi go to the top of the podium? They've got three Peugeots to beat and seven hours 25 to run. To put into perspective, how fast was Lotterer's fastest lap this race at a 325.2? A half a second faster than the pole here, so he is really a man on a charge right now. There you see the crews resting Peugeot. They know they've got a lot of work to do to get to the end of this one. Unscathed, they've got to push hard, Scott. It's going to be a pressure-packed final seven and a half hours it's, here. It's been interesting to watch because over about the last 10 laps, the gap is kind of hanging about about 27, 28 seconds. Sometimes it goes down, sometimes it goes back up, but just kind of on average with traffic and everything, it's kind of hanging. So you have Bourdais uh, in a number nine Peugeot, Genet in a number seven Peugeot, and then Lauderer running back there in third with the with the Audi. And it's kind of just developing in, as we talked at early in the show, strategy and how that's going to play out. Oh, look no, at this. Not again, another Felbermeyer Proton car. I have had some drama here today. Several off, several incidents with the wall and other cars. And, uh, this, oh, look at this. It's the leader. It is the lead car, the 74 car of Jan Magnussen. That's big. He looks at yeah, look at that. The, the rear the is the completely car. torn off. Gary Pratt there, we're looking at in the middle of the screen, is watching these pitches. To pit in. You'd, you'd have to say that maybe these two cars were involved. Yes, in absolutely. See the damage over to the left there. by the yellow flag there on the left. There's a piece of bodywork there. And like Ollie Gavin said, there's still a long way to go. It's at the 16-hour mark last year that both cars dropped out with engine drama. Right now, it's an incident on the racetrack. I don't think that is Alpha Sal. I think that is the 77 of all yeah, Pensler because Alpha that thing Sal was, was down the a long time ago. That yeah. was destroyed. So, look at those fumes coming out the back of that car. And the only good news is it's right at pit in, so they'd be able to. Once they get that Corvette going, it's not too far before they could get to. It looks like it just might have got it fired up. I don't think he's going anywhere until he gets dragged out Look of there. Look at these marshals on the racing track, oh, on the race track, stuff. just as cars are coming flying through. And all the debris. Yeah. And for the second year in a row, when one of the Corvettes was looking good for victory, a collision has taken them out of the running. I, you know, I, I just don't understand. There's that much debris out there, Scott. I mean, you've got to get the safety cars out there and get this thing in order. They need to. I mean, there's so much debris on the track. You're not going to clean that up thoroughly without having no a safety way. car out there. I thought they might have got that Corvette fired again. The lights come back up. The only way he might be able to get back out looks like potentially he could back up. Safety car is being like deployed. Gear. Yeah, he's trying to move it, it looks like. I'm not sure if those rear wheels, it, yeah, gravel gets deeper as you get yeah. in there, and I'm yeah. not sure if he's close enough to the shallow part of the gravel trap. He might be able to get some traction in reverse. I don't think he's going forward. That is major damage to that Porsche. Look at that. That thing is absolutely destroyed. I wonder if one was coming for the pit lane, possibly. There's some miscommunication. We'll conjecture at this point until we see some pictures. I'm going to take a gamble here, and <laughs> we've only got one of the Felbermeyer cars left, the Proton cars, and it could be the one with Horst Jr. and Sr. and Christian Reed. It could very well be the 63 Porsche. We know that Alpha Sal is out, and I think I saw the 77 go through uh, the, uh, the Hensler Mark Lieb car, so we will see. Magnussen in the gravel trap. Tony Wielander now assumes the lead in class in the 51 AF course of Ferrari, the 458. So they're having a strong day. Gavin was concerned about them, but I didn't think he was ever believing there'd be in this sort of incident to give up the lead. This will tell us Here we more. go. Whoa. Oh. Oh. Yeah, and just lost it on the inside. Yeah, I think he came up on him so fast. He took evasive action, Scott, looked to the inside, and then just couldn't hold the line there. 
just came really up on that Porsche really, really quick. I have to wonder if the Porsche is maybe slowing a little bit for pit lane, possibly. Well, yeah, when it, it just came so up far on him. back. It's, it's hard to say, but it looks like he tried to get up the inside. The rear got away from him, and he just couldn't keep control of the Corvette. Plays reacting really quickly, though, like he had a run of steam on him that he wasn't expecting to suddenly have to take evasive action. See if we can get another look at that. Some drivers will hustle the car all the way to the pin, pit entry. Some guys will start to roll out of it a little bit before they get there. There it is again. Look to the top of your screen. Looks like they're Look both. He dropped a wheel on the inside there. You see some dust kicked up there. I don't think the Porsche was heading to pit lane. I just think that the Corvette may have got too far off the inside. You see it took a big jump, and oh, then he tried to capture it, and then the front hooked right into the Porsche. Did about two or three wa swaps on the rear, and unfortunately taking two cars. I think that day could be over for that Corvette. That is a massive hit. Under our fifth full course caution. And the shockwave still running through Corvette racing. More on the other side of this, and Brian Till will be with us. Welcome back to Le Mans, and here is why we're under caution. Up at the top of the screen, you see Ann Magnuson in the leading GTE Pro Corvette. Problems there with one of the Felbermeyer Porsche and big hits for both of those cars, guys. Yeah, they both look like they're coming through this last little bit of the curve there, and the Corvette looks like it just dropped off the inside, and he had to correct, Magnuson had to correct for it, and unfortunately, the Porsche was there, collected it. Porsche hit the inside wall, or the outside wall coming coming off through there, shot right back into the Corvette. And that was the 63 Porsche with Christian Reed in at the Proton competition car shared with Horst Feldmeier Sr. and Horst Feldmeier Jr. The yeah, closing rate was not that great. Side. You can just see where all the dirt came up, caught him. Oof. And it, we're, we're seven, 17 hours into this thing, and obviously Ann had been in the car for a while, but we, we talked about being patient, playing well together. It was the last portion of the Porsche curves, a short straight after that. I guess it's easy to sit here in this chair and say, what was the rush? But uh, let's head down to Jamie and the Corvette camp. Gary Pratt, obviously not the images you want to be seeing on the television screen at this stage of the race. What can you tell us about what happened? No, we had a pretty trouble-free race going. And uh, I don't know, Yan's going by, I think it was, uh, I don't know, the blue Porsche. And he... Uh, was going underneath him and he kept pushing him up onto the curb. And when he got up on the curb, it kind of set him wide and got into the Porsche and then they both hit the wall. Have you talked to Jan on the radio? Is he okay? Yeah, Jan's fine. They just towed him behind the wall and uh, he, he's fine. But the car is just tore up. It's not going to be able to continue. Completely unfortunate end of the day for Corvette Racing, guys. Now for Proton competition as well because that car, that Porsche is destroyed and what a great run they had going. It's so unfortunate to see. You heard Gary say that Yen was pushed up on the curb. We can't see that. Obviously, it's around that corner. But once again, you know, we talk about the risk and the reward. And obviously, at that point in time, it didn't pay off. When you're a leader like that, you just need to be you need to be patient. And I'm not trying to throw down on, on Yen because you don't know exactly what took place. But there's so much of this that could, could have been missed with just, yeah. Just a, just a breath. And again, you know, the, the, the problem with this type of racing is there are driver changes that are happening all of the time, and, and the rhythm of the race changes every lap, and the habits of a particular car change when a different driver gets in. And maybe Jan had been around that car, who knows, just a couple of laps ago, and the driver was doing something different. It is one of the uh, GTE M cars, and uh, we don't want to throw down on him, put any blame at his door with uh, Christian Reed, but. You know, Jan did have a pretty big run on him there, and maybe you just caught unawares at the closing speed, took a base of action, and just got on that inside curb there and uh, flicked it around. But that was a heavy, heavy impact for both cars. Remember, Magnussen had a huge crash at Laguna Seca and uh, broke his tailbone when he and Bergmeister got yep. into it. And they've actually done a lot of modifications to that Corvette seat because of that. And he went into there pretty hard backwards. So uh, that was a big crash. Good to hear that Gary Pratt says he is okay. 
We saw Sebastian Bourdais, who has climbed out of the number nine. Peugeot Simon Pagano has taken the place there as the field behind the safety cars once again. And it's hard for me to remember a time where I've seen this many safety cars. I haven't remembered this race with this many safety cars, especially under green conditions. I mean, sometimes when it goes, goes wet and it's pretty horrible conditions that way, but I mean, this has been pretty nice, well, incredibly nice weather overall to see this many incidents. Now, stepping back for just a second, I'm, I'm kind of interested why the nine car decided to pit so early on that, on well, that set of yellows. I think there might have been an issue going on because they did the service and then we saw pictures just as we went to Jamie with them working on something in the left side of the cockpit area, but we saw Bordet go out to the pit wall, had a smile on his face, so I'm assuming whatever they were working on was rectified, but as Gary Pratt said, this lead Corvette is pretty torn up and now it's going to be down to the 73 car that currently runs in second at the hands of Olivier Beretta right now to try and chase down that lead Ferrari. Well, Pagano has taken over the nine car, as we said, but uh, I understand that perhaps some problems with that pit stop, Andrew. Well, that's absolutely right. But I, I think uh, it's in the electrical department. I think they used the time because they were under the safety car just to make some adjustments. So the car was actually on the pit lane about 40, 50 seconds longer than you'd expect. And uh, a guy was diving into the cockpit and uh, making some small adjustments uh, electrically. I couldn't see exactly what he was doing. But uh, I don't think all is completely well with this number nine car, to be honest. Yeah, Bordet had a smile on his face as we watch another replay of the incident with Magnussen and uh, Christian Reed. I wonder if they're going in the ECU and trying to uh, get a bit more power out of it. <laughs> you never know what they could be doing. Well, that's for sure. But it, but it was interesting. It, it certainly wasn't just for regular service. They're coming in looking at addressing something with that with that Peugeot. I remember earlier, it was Mark Genet in the seven car that came in and said, we had some electrical issues, or we had some issues that must be addressed, or we might not make the rest of the event. So now something electrical, it seems, with the nine as well. That's a new ECU, it'll give them another few horsepower. They're looking at that lap time that Lauder laid down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's turn up the wick. Yes, we need more. <laughs> back underway but uh, interesting both the seven and the nine as I said remember Janae had talked to Andrew earlier and said we had to make some adjustments otherwise we might not be able to continue so um, interesting to see what those might be and if they are related or the same uh, to the nine car Andrew do you have uh, Sebastian <laughs> down here with Sebastian after you got out of the car. Somebody dived into the cockpit and we think they're giving you a bit more power. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. We just changed the radio. The radio was out. So, uh, struggle for the last two stints to communicate with the team and uh, when you have safety car periods like this and, uh, you know, just to know exactly what target on fuel you are and things like that, it just becomes really complicated. So, we have, uh, we have rescue plans with the board, but uh, it's never as quite easy as it looks. What a race! Yeah, it's uh, it's quite unbelievable, isn't it? I mean, it's uh, it's just been running flat out since the midnight. The car's really good, but the Audi is really fast as well, so we can uh, never kind of get rid of it. And uh, it's uh, one time they get ahead, one time we get ahead, but uh, nobody can uh, go away with it. So. I'm afraid it's going to be like this until somebody's got a problem. And you're flat out. <laughs> yeah, I think it should. <laughs> <laughs> I think it does. Thank you very much. And so that was a radio problem. Actually, that's consistent with what I actually saw them doing. So I think that's, uh, he, he wasn't going so line. I think that's what the problem was. So we have the Andrew Marriott lie detector <laughs> going on down there. And uh, it, it's not that uh, we wouldn't have been told stories to before, that's for sure. The 56 of Joey Han on pit road as well. They're in catch up mode. They're currently six in class and uh, they will leapfrog around Yang Magnuson on this next lap as he will not see any further action with the 74 Corvette, which will put the 56 machine up in the top five, not where they expected to be. They had a really fast race car and that misfire on the trip to garage early in the going has cost them dearly, but still a lot of time left on the clock. They'll keep digging deep. Well, the good news for Corvette is that Tony V. Lander, 213 laps in the book, and Moretta is on the same lap. So 
it's not like they're several laps behind, but obviously you don't want to see your lead car go out at all, especially with an impact such as we saw Jan have. But Ford Corvette, 73 car, still running. It has not had the pace of the 74 throughout the event, but they still have a good shot at it. Tony Vlander, remember, we thought we might have some type of problem with the transmission there. We'll find out many stories yet to be told with just over seven hours to run in the 79th running of the 24 hours of Le Mans. We'll be back. We'll take you all the way to the checkered flag right here on Speed. Speed's coverage of the 24 Hours of Le Mans is brought to you by Just For Men Hair Color. Live forward. Field under the safety car for the fifth time, and there's what remains of the 63. Porsche that Christian Reed was uh, piloting when he came together with Yann Magnussen. A huge hit for both cars, and Christian Reed especially uh, the end of, of the concrete wall there on driver's right has kind of a little jog in it and it makes somewhat of a sharp angle and that's the impact point that Christian Reed had and he also had the Corvette along the left side of him uh, that just kind of helped push Porsche watch this right down here at the end of the wall and they get together the impact is significant bam it was a big hit and uh, during the break, we did see Christian Reed on the stretch of being uh, transported to the ambulance. So our thoughts are with him and his team. It's just too many times we've seen uh, the ambulance today. I, I say I've not seen this many safety cars. Five is not uh, an unusual number. You see the crew. What a concern there. Yeah. This five is not an unusual number. It's the way we've had the five, the length of them, Rockies safety car was two hours and 28 minutes so the uh, repairs that needed to be done to the racetrack there and you see a limp there on I think the tire change guys so we the crew beginning to show the signs of battle as well as Andre Lauder brings the number two Audi R18 to pit road Jamie Howe will be down at Audi Trulier getting ready, ready, Lotterer to jump out. Jamie's on the spot. Yes, Lotterer has climbed out of the car. They're going to do a driver change. Trulier is getting behind the wheel. You see the crew hard at work here, making sure they get the windshields cleaned off. Fuel's still going in. It does look like they're going to take a set of tires, but you would expect when they do a driver change, you want to put each driver out on a new set of tires. The car is up on the jacks now. There's a lot of pressure riding on this team right now. We heard Dr. Ulrich say it earlier. The motivation is easy considering what happens to the other two Audi R18. Pit stop going flawlessly so far, perfectly orchestrated. Driver belts are done, just in time for the fourth Michelin tire to go on. You see Brad Kettler crawling underneath the car, thumbs up, everything looks good, down on the jack, and Trulier is in for his stint. There again, he stopped at the end of pit lane. He's got to wait for that next safety car along the train of vehicles before he can move. And uh, Brad Kettler, who was uh, really the leading the charge here he's such a great guy an american who's worked so many years for the champion racing team with so much success they won here overall for dave mirage's team and uh, he's now firmly ensconced in the audi camp and does a tremendous job a great resource for us too in terms of telling us what's going on and giving us the good stories we see obviously on board the Peugeot right now this is going into the first chicane there on the Molson Audi still sitting at pit out and one of the things that we talked about was overheating issues on the R18 it can sit for a short period of time it must have airflow in order to keep the engine cooling now the good thing is the ambient air temperature is very cool sat for quite a while and now Trillier out on the racetrack but for much longer even in the cool ambient temperatures there is a lot of heat in that v6 3.7 liter v6 diesel in the back especially with the turbo sitting right there at the top of the motor let's head back to audi and jamie 
We can see right now Lena Gate, the engineer on the number two car, sitting on the pit stand, a lot of pressure riding on her shoulders. She does have the best in the business training her, though. Brad Kettler has been with Audi Sport for a number of years, and he's really taking Lena under her under his wing to teach her everything that he knows about how to properly engineer for Audi Sport. Lena has been was part of the Audi family. She worked in their production car lineup, but being a member of the motorsports program was really her dream, and today her dream is becoming a reality as she's engineering the only Audi R18 left on the track. So as you can imagine, she's feeling the pressure today. Well, you've hoped the dream remains a dream and not a nightmare. We've seen nightmares for the other two Audis that are entered. There's the 22, the Aston Martin powered Lola. It's probably going to be one or two tough calls that she has to make before the end of this one because how they sequence, I mean, you've got to back time this race. is way too early in the going to think about that right now, but when you get down to the last two, three hours, Scott, the sequencing of those pit stops, when you take those and back time in the race, you don't need a splash. And uh, we've seen the Audi and the Peugeot pretty much been off sequence throughout the course of this event. And uh, which way is it going to land? Well, that's the piece we talked about earlier on in the show is, you know, piece of this race can easily be won by strategy. It looks like the Peugeots can go at least one lap longer than the Audi, and that is going to play itself pretty big as we get down to the closing stages of the race. Now, with that being said, we're seeing all these yellows, and that changes that flow as well. That kind of puts, kind of resets things within some, uh, within some reason, and then you have to kind of think again from the back of the race, from the checkered flag back to where you are, and always have a game plan in your back pocket. Well, the same holds true for any of the other classes out there. GTE Pro as well. And as I look at timing and scoring, Tony Vlander in the 51 Ferrari being now shown a lap ahead of Oliver Beretta in the remaining Corvette. And you wonder if the safety car and the way the safety cars have come out have split them a little bit. But uh, Beretta is going to have his work cut out for him, as is the team of the 51. Those strategic calls remain to be made. Jimmy Bruni sharing that car with Tony V. Lander and Giancarlo Fisichella. He's down in the pits with Andrew Marriott. Yes, he is, and Jimmy's not nicely relaxed here in the chair. This is a hell of a battle in your class. We've got four different manufacturers in the top four places. Yeah, it's great. I mean, uh, this year and the last year also has been a very good battle with uh, G in the GT class. Uh, especially this year, we came here with a new car, and it looks okay at the moment. We have seven hours to go. It's a long race. Yeah, there'll be a battle to the line with the Corvette, I should think. Yeah. I think so. Yeah, will be will be tough. We 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 pushed so hard uh, this last night and uh, to catch back the the time we lost with uh, with the gravel of my teammate and uh, and uh, and the safety car in the beginner. We get back a lap and we were one and a half minutes behind. And now this safety car, uh, you know, we'll see six hour and 55 minutes, and I will tell you where we are. Jimmy, a few years ago, you looked as if you were heading for Formula One and you've uh, gone into sports car racing. Now you're driving with a Formula One legend in Fizzy. Uh, how's that? Ah, it's good. That's good. Uh, it's, we go well, very well. It's a very nice guy, and uh, we've been uh, uh, been together since uh, Sebring this year. Uh, we, we enjoy timing over there in America, racing there, and, and after we did a couple of races in Europe of Le Mans Series, it's great. Uh, I think it's... it's uh, Getting there, it's getting there. He's learning very fast, and uh, just can be a bonus for me because he might will be my teammate for all season. Thank you very much, Jimmy. Thank you. Well, Bruni and Fisichella leading in the LMS GTE Pro Drivers Championship points in the LMS series. So he and uh, Giancarlo certainly getting along well and making that Ferrari 458 go. That is for certain. You see the Peugeot in the number eight. Be a driver change. The seven in as well. Nine was in just a little while ago, so I would not expect to see him. And it would be a problem if they decided to bring him because he would be at the front of that order. Yeah, I think this is Sarazan jumping in, replacing Montani there. And uh, we understand Andrew's now on the spot. Andrew. Uh, yes, I am. I've just come out of uh, the garage where we interviewed Jimmy Bruni. And uh, this is a uh, longer service here with the uh, tires going on. And uh, in a moment, I'll get the uh, drivers as they've come out of the car. But but uh, let's throw it down at Jamie for now. 
Number 73 Corvette has come to a stop. They are doing a driver change. Tommy Milner already in the car, getting belted up. Ooh, a little bit of a stumble here for Corvette Racing. We do not see this often. A little bit of a delay in getting that rear tire on. Moving to the front and to the back on the left-hand side of the car. All of the eggs in one basket now for Corvette Racing. It's pretty ominous down here with the number 74 garage shut. But Tommy Milner has a refire. They're just going to clean up the front end of the car, make sure that none of that debris gets, gets clogged up in the radiator screen. And Tommy is out. Look, you actually how they grab a hold of yeah. that hood like that. I want to make sure it was on and they're ready to go do battle. <laughs> Yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, remember Olivier did have the off in Arnage and nose to end this. Maybe they're seeing the bodywork starting to separate a little bit. Well, Beretta now being shown on the lead lap. It's just the way they cycle through, Calvin, as you talk about the three safety cars, thinking about them on a clock at 12, 4, and 8. So as things cycle through, it uh, basically what it amounts to is the Beretta is about two-thirds of a lap behind right now. Tony Vlander and his Ferrari. So they've got their work cut out for them. But as you heard Jimmy Bruni say, Six hours and 55 minutes now, 6.52 on the clock. A long way to go and a lot of parts yet to be played. But when do you start looking and back timing, like you like to say from the end? When is it time to start doing that, and moving your, your pawns into the right positions? They'll be thinking about it right now. I mean, the engineers will have all of those calculations there. But with the safety car periods, everything gets reset, as Scott said. But certainly those last three or four hours, that's when you really have to play the right cards. You've got to make the right choices. And the safety car is in. We'll be back to racing here at the Circuit de la Sarthe, the 79th running of the 24 hours of Le Mans. And that's the 51 right there of Tony Vlander that flashes by, I believe. And here come your leaders overall. And look at this. Look at that. Taking a look. True, yeah, looking to the inside as the other cars are now released from pit lane. So they had to wait, not just for the safety car, but then the cars that are behind that safety car to pass them before they are released. That cost those Peugeots daily. And it is on right now. You see the number two there. Benoit Trillier, he has been absolutely magic. Lauder, well, oh, oh that's how that. close it was to another problem for an Audi with a Ferrari. It could happen wow. just that quickly. Trillier trying to hang on to the back of the Peugeot in front. Simon Pagano behind the wheel of the nine, and it could end so quickly, just as you said, in the blink of an eye. All these cars, you gotta remember, it's very cold right now. Everybody's trying to get their tires up to temp. You gotta be extraordinarily careful take, trying to do that outside move when it's as cold as it is, because the guy on the inside of you could easily lose it and take you right out. Exactly, that was really a close call there. Here we watch them. Trillier is sitting there saying, okay, I will follow Simon through. I'll follow him through, but don't forget. I mean, you go back to... Vlander the, there, uses all the road there, wow. nearly squeezes him onto the grass. He's holding it to the inside as much as he can, but Scott, as you pointed out, cold tires and such, and you're once again, you're holding on to that GT car as much as you can. You don't have the downforce, cold and tires, now a problem for the 35. Coming out of Indianapolis, Indiana. I think. Yep. We talk about this, and it, it takes a couple place. laps for these tires to really get up to temp, and we have the confidence in them. You run these cars with the least amount of downforce you can anyway. And right in the target zone coming out of Indianapolis, it just, yeah, just got it on the gas. The yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Oh, he hit it pretty Reasonable hard. Reasonable contact, yeah. That wasn't a lazy spin. That was contact with the outside barrier. I think he then drove it across the road and then got stuck. This is out of Molson Corner. You ride on board with... Benoit Trillier and the 35, some pretty significant damage, and it is right in the target zone at the exit of Indianapolis. And those corner workers, the marshals out on the track, I tell you, that is not a safe place to be. No thanks, not for me. I wouldn't be out there. No, not well, at not all. that way. In a race car, yes, but like, like those corner workers, they're brave. Right now, Alexander Verbs in the number seven, running third on the racetrack. Andrews with his teammate, Mark Genet. Oh. That was a this. tough stint, I think. Ah. Uh, yes, uh, it was tough. It's been a, a very hectic race, you know. We are pushing all the way. The safety cars make life difficult. Sometimes they are positive for you, sometimes they go against you. Uh, at least with the problems we had during the night, we fixed them. And it's a lot easier now to drive. We just concentrate on driving. Well, you know what it's like to win this race. I know, but I don't know if we're going to win it, you know. Uh, 
it's, it's an incredible battle. I, I don't remember. I've been here five years, and I never remember such a tight battle between between two Peugeots and an Audi. And and I have no clue how that's going to finish. Thanks very much. I don't think any of us have. Mark Janet won it in 2009 with David Brabham and Alex Verts. So look at this. We were talking about the marshals out on the racetrack. They get the 35 back underway, but he just doesn't look upstream and oh. it's just insane as uh, Sarah's I believe comes through there in the Peugeot followed by another one. Just crazy, crazy stuff. You see the marshals narrowly escaping there. The car's coming through the corner. Then 35 car gets underway. This is this is wild stuff. This yeah. is really, really crazy stuff. And it's like we've said, the drivers just said it. There is still a long way to uh -oh. go. A near miss there. Plenty of stories yet to be told. And the opportunities for failure, they are everywhere around this racetrack. We'll be back to more Le Mans coverage when we come back right after this. Battle up front at Circuit de la Sarthe right now is between Simon Pagano and Benoit Trillier. Peugeot versus Audi, and this is it. Down the Molson towards the first chicane. It's Pagano to the left. Trillier in the Audi to the right. Traffic is going to play into this. It really is there. Look at Simon. He's on the flashes there. Oh, really tight there. Pagano gets the door shut. One of the GT cars in front. It's the Lotus. Can Trillier get the run out? And right behind him, yet another of the Peugeots. Sarazan, who is one lap down and is going to be really anxious. He can taste it. He can feel it, Scott. He knows any chance of victory. He has to be on the lead lap of this race, obviously. He's got to be on the lead lap, and he's going to take those chances with that Audi in front of him because he has nothing to lose. That's right. I'm sure the directive from Olivier Canel will not be get back on that lead lap, get past that Audi, take some chances. They trace some paint, so be it. That's the last Audi left in this event. That's exactly right, and there are two other Peugeots. You don't want to sacrifice yourself, but at the same point in time, as you said, if something were to happen, that would be the third Audi gone. Tough position for Trillier. He's really got to deal with this. Effectively, he's got to be careful. Can't afford to throw away this and body work. We can see there just uh, coming apart there down the Malsan. I think it'll be a big issue. I'm sure they'll try and affect the a repair for Canada, costing them time on the next pit stop. Can tell if it's a larger section of the nose or just a smaller section through the two kinks on the way down to the right hander that leads to Indianapolis, the second of the kinks. Now this I, would be the perfect time for Sarzan if you're going to make look a move on the Audi. Sarzan looks to the inside. And I'll tell you what I did see when we were in break. I saw Trillier get a little bit wide coming off an Arnage. And I wonder if he has dislodged that nose a little bit because of that ride. He got really wide coming through this corner on the last lap. I think he ate a little bit more of the curve on the exit right there than he normally would. There you see him in the dust once again. And uh, we know Timo Bernard did a similar thing early in this event. And they had to change the nose on the Audi. And they can't afford to lose precious seconds in pit lane right now. You're right on board right now. That's Simon Pagano in front in the lead Peugeot and then right behind Chillier and then Sarazan. As you said, Sarazan wants his lap back. Stone faces down at Peugeot watching. Oh, look, look at this. this. Simon's just trying to stack them up, trying to read the traffic. Trillier goes to the inside. This is potential ugliness right there. Oh my goodness, this is crazy stuff. Who has the better balance? There he goes, he looks up the run. inside. Who's got the run down the Ford Chicane? Pagano defends. Trillia to the outside. Sarah's in there as well. And now the first of the chicanes that will lead you back to the pit straight. Trillier cannot get the job done. Sarazan lurking in the background. More GT traffic as they head down the front straightaway. And they'll get to that Porsche just about the time they get to the Dunlop curves. A lot of traffic here, really changing things up, making a tight battle between the Peugeots and the Audi. We knew it was going to be a classic based on the times they've been setting all week long. Who would believe 17 hours plus into this race, they'd be separated by mere inches at times during the course of this stage of the race. This is fascinating stuff. Can Trillier deal with this pressure in front and behind? Now he is literally the meat in the sandwich. The other Peugeot joins them. Alexander Gertz behind the wheel of the seven, the third of the Peugeots there in line, but he is third on the racetrack in the running order. Still a lot of GT traffic coming Absolutely. up. Absolutely. These guys still have their hands full. 
a lot I, of action. And I'm wondering, as you said, Calvin, if Trillier doesn't have his hands full of that R18, the aerodynamic balance off perhaps a little bit. You see that yeah. lifting of that body panel as he heads down the Mulsanne. While it may not be as aero sensitive as the R15 or R15 Plus was, every aerodynamic device is on this car for a reason. And as you said earlier, Timo Bernard had had a problem, needed to come in and replace that nose. And right now, uh, the bodywork not fitting precisely as it should. Peugeot should seem to have a little bit of legs and in Mulsanne. You know, qualifying, it was about eight kilometers an hour, about five miles per hour down these straightaways. I want to tell everyone at home that Dorsey Shreddy just came in the booth with fresh lattes made from his motorhome outside. Nice one, Dorse. As we're watching the pressure build at the front of this race. Things have settled down just a bit. Sarazen has dropped back off the back of the rear wing of Benoit Chelier, and you wonder if uh, that ebb and flow of traffic didn't have something to do with that. As they get a little bit more open racetrack, we will see. We talked about the wings on the Peugeot, the rear wing, a little bit earlier. Figured out a way to get less drag out of that rear wing, and that will accomplish two things. Higher straight line speeds and perhaps better fuel efficiency. We've seen both out of all three of the Peugeots today. Yeah, you have to run a mandatory rear gurney, or wicker bill as some people call it, of 20 millimeters just under an inch and uh, it has to be at 90 degrees to the rear main plane of the wing what they've done they've changed the profile of the flap on the Peugeot they really copied what Oak Racing showed up here at the Le Mans test with and what it allows them to effectively do is to lay that gurney a little bit further back which means there's a little bit less drag and it seems like they picked up some speed since the test maybe that's the reason there's the 81 that's your leader and gte am spencer pompelli behind the wheel there and i'm not sure where that flying lizard porsche was parked actually he's not the leader anymore the 50 gabriel gardell look at this oh wow traffic again playing into it and they are back nose to tail that's the 33 the level 5 motorsports lmp2 entry Trillier there again to pounce. Can he get the job done? Look at Here Sarazan. Comes Sarazan. <laughs> Trillier blocks him. He sees he's coming. He's done an awesome job. Trillier is really doing a stunning job here, Scott. He's feeling the pressure, but he's placing the car where it needs to be. He recognizes he has an advantage through the twisty bits. He's trying to take advantage in traffic. He's trying to take advantage, but at the same time, there's one Audi left. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got to try and make those moves, but at the same time, we're talking six, just under six and a half hours. You, you can't, you lose everything by tearing something up. Risk reward. Risk reward. Right now, he's made all the right choices. Can he handle this pressure? And it is traffic that brings these cars back together and separates them from time to time. The accordion effect, Alexander Burtz, the last of the prototypes there in the order. Talked about that earlier, running third in the order, fourth in line right now. Perhaps Burtz is just hanging back a little bit going, man, it's intense right up there. I could win this thing if all three of these guys get into each other. The Audi certainly seems like they have a bit of pace on the Peugeot. Chouillet's doing a great job. And a problem, a definite oh. problem now for Spencer Pompelli, who has stepped out of the Flying Lizard Porsche. Once again, if he steps 10 meters from that car, it is day over. It could be already since he has climbed out, but we'll see if we can get word from that team. Running second in class. They had the lead for so long. So Seth had the slide off down at Mulsanne Corner, trip through the gravel. They got Spencer in the car. And we're now hearing some kind of engine drama. So that'll be a major disappointment for that team, the three American drivers. Spencer Pompelli on debut, attempting to do something that not many people have done. You did it, Scotty. <laughs> Winning on debut, but uh, it's a tough road. It is a tough road. We got real fortunate coming back with Corvette to win. Right now they're down to this. Sarah's out on the back of Trillier. Oh, they the have the speed right there, yeah. picks up the draft and makes it stick into Mulsan. Got now, the run. You got to believe that JMW Ferrari really held him up out of that second chicane and it allowed Sarazan to have the run. What does this man do now? Does he allow Sarazan to try and get back on the lead lap or does he let him create the buffer and protect the leader of this race, Simon Pagino, with the red mirrored 
number nine. Well, we know that uh, the nine car had radio problems earlier. They may have radio problems now. <laughs> what? What'd you uh, say? I did, uh, what? I'm sorry, I cannot hear you. And it is very much team as far as Olivia Cannell is concerned. He doesn't care which of the Lions ends up on top at the end. He wants to put his team in the in best position. But I can tell you there are nine different Peugeot drivers and uh, divide them into groups of three. And each one of those groups will have their own opinion on who should be first at the end of this 24 hours. It has been intense as the leaders have worked through traffic. Take a look at this. This is when Sarazan gets past Trillier. So run down to Mulsanne corner. Gets to the outside. Then there's a little right-hand sweeper coming up. Cuts across there. Nicely down in time for the break zone. You can see we've been talking about this. The Peugeot's just seem to have a little more legs down the straightaway. We're able to get, make that move. And up to the tight stuff, the Audi certainly looks quicker. Yeah, and I think on lap time, the Audi is a bit quicker. I'm liking something they see. Got Maybe ball. this oh, is oh, it. Oh, Look oh, at oh, this. Oh, That's oh, what oh, they're oh, seeing. We're seeing a replay of it. That is wild. Wow. Truly here around the outside there. Finishing off the Porsche curves and gets back by Sarazan. A wry smile from and Dr. Ulrich. <laughs> there was no doubt. There was total commitment. It was that was going to work or it wasn't. Oh. And I'm beginning to look at the front of the number two car. And to me, the front splitter does not look secure. Yeah. He's taking a trip over a curb somewhere, and uh, but not exactly well when, but Arnaj certainly took a run out there about five minutes ago. Now take a Watch look. This. this is on board. He sees it happening. Here I go. <laughs> I hope it works. <laughs> is he committed or what? <laughs> Dr. Ulrich has had few things to smile at today, and that was one of them. You think it's all laid back in endurance racing? Take a look at that, and there's plenty more action to come. And the battle is just as intense as it was when we left. You see the number two, Benoit Trillier, under intense, intense attack there. The red mirrors on the number nine, Peugeot. That is Simon Pagano, and that is for the lead. Trillier gets around Pagano. Wow, he's a little on a march to the front. He is. I mean, and, and we're talking about the Peugeot seem to have a little bit more speed on the straight, but without a doubt, the Audi is just powered by. The Sarazan that Trillier was battling with as we went to break, Ooh. but he took the fight, and uh, I wonder if he did it in traffic yet again. The Audi really seems to have the responsiveness in traffic. Did, did he use traffic to catch up and then get by Simon Pagano? And we also have been wondering for the entire race, have they been holding anything back? I think, you know, they're at a flat-out pace right now. That's all they got. <laughs> I don't, if, if he has any more, I'm afraid to watch it after what I saw in the Porsche curves just moments ago. Look at this. Pagina wants it back. This is a dangerous a green game. show going yeah. on right now. Guys. Oh, a little wide of the apex there through Indianapolis. Now they'll run down to Arnage. And you ask yourself, can they do this for the rest of the race? Well, yeah, I think they can. Uh, Scott, it's like you have said multiple times. It's like dodging a bullet and... Uh, as, as impressive as Trillier's move was at the exit of the Porsche curves, it was a risk. It was either going to be a hero or a zero. But, uh, yeah, how many times can you dodge yeah. that bullet? Let's take a look at this again. A little bit of traffic. Ah. That's just enough for the... How do you get a run? Pagano gets balked just a little bit. Uses the 4 GT as a pick. That's good. Heads up, looking far up the road. And you can see the acceleration rate is almost identical once the Peugeot was slowed down a bit, kind of side by side. It's hard to see any speed differential at all. And now, down at the end of the straightaway, it's just who this can break wild, later, yeah. who's willing to risk more. Right now, it's Benoit Trillier who's willing to make that risk. For Peugeot, I know that they've got three other opportunities, or three opportunities, I should say, in total out there right now. You still see that bodywork on the left front of the two car. And to me, that nose section does not look tight. 
doesn't look good. Look, open up an air gap, and that's going to slow up the straightaway even more, which is where they're weak. It's so hard to understand, but the aerodynamic principles of these cars are so sophisticated. Just being off by a few thousands of an inch from the ideal location can it change pretty intensely the balance of the car. So we don't know what Benoit Trillier has to deal with right now if, if the handling of that number two R18 is ideal or not. Well, it looks like they're running awful fast pace up front with the Audi. They were able to stretch out about uh, about about six, eight lengths on the Peugeot. While this, battle, know? while this battle continues, you see the 73 Corvette, the only Corvette left running after Yen Magnussen had his contact with the 63, the po Proton Competition Porsche. It's Christian Reed in the car. Andrew, do you have an update on Christian? Well, I do. I just spoke to him, and he wasn't in the car. It wasn't him. It was Horst uh, Felbermeyer Sr. He is still in the uh, medical center here. Christian doesn't know what his condition is quite. It's, it's not a huge concern, but he obviously was knocked about quite a bit. But it wasn't Christian Reed. It was Horst Felbermeyer Sr. Thank you for that, Andrew. Timing and scoring still showing Christian Reed's <laughs> name beside the number 63. So good to know that he is okay, and our thoughts are certainly with Horst Feldermeyer Sr. As you go back to the battle up front, and uh, you know, we've talked all day long about the drivers of the number two car and uh, how they were kind of third in line in the pecking order, but they have not put a wheel wrong all day long. And it's not that they haven't taken chances, that's for sure. No, they are but, now. Uh, very, very impressive. Andre Lauderer was, Marcel Fassler. He's just put his head down and done his job. And now Benoit Trillier, absolutely stunning. But might I say, you don't get a ride in one of these cars without being worthy. Regardless if it's considered a third car or not. Well, we were just trying to check an update on Christian Reed, and we find out that he was not in the car. We do know it was Jan Magnuson in the Corvette. And Jamie, what do you know? Well, I did speak with Jan Magnuson after he made it back out of the car. He said that he was going to go and get some rest. I asked him if he had heard from his wife, Christine, yet about the arrival of their their baby girl, and he said, nope, no news yet. This is why I'm going to go get some rest, because he knows it's going to be a busy week, regardless of what happens at the track today, obviously not the end that they were looking for. But let's go back to the number two car that you guys were just talking about. Speaking with Brad Kettler, he said the best way to train drivers, to train our crew, to train our engineers is to actually do it in race conditions, and that's what they're doing with the number two car. Brad Kettler and all the gang at Audi Sport paying extra attention to the two car now because of the only one left, but they've been paying extra attention to them all year long because this is their development program. This is their next generation of Audi Sport drivers, and they're doing everything that they can to give them all the experience needed, and right now it's being put to the true test. Well, Jamie, we've seen the bodywork on the front of the two car a bit loose, at least from the driver's perspective. I'd like to know if you've had any conversation with Brad Kettler as to whether or not they plan to change that nose when they come in to make their next stop. Traffic playing a huge piece in, in the race. You can just see, you try and work that traffic to your advantage. Sometimes it plays out, sometimes it doesn't. But Audi is stretching out a bit more of a lead at the moment. Seven car, the Peugeot, also has some aero problems in that one of the winglets on the nose has come loose on the right side. So that looks like it could tear off and lose a little bit of frontal downforce. Perhaps Alexander Hertz not having the car underneath him that he wants right now. I mean, with six hours and 20 minutes left to go, these cars have been punished for quite a while. So it'll be interesting to see not only who has the power to make it to the end, but who has the balance to make it to the end. Jamie? Well, you asked about the nose on the number two car. It would be very unlike Audi to need to make an adjustment, change the nose, and not have it out and ready. When Ralph Yutner, the technical director for Audi Sport, walked us through their garage area this week, they have stacks of them sitting back there ready to go, but they do not have any out here in pit lane ready to go when the crew's ready for a pit stop, but it doesn't look like they're going to be making any adjustments. I'll let you know if they pull one out, but right now it looks like it might be a stop, just status quo. Well, thanks, Jamie. I appreciate that. And the thing that's
what's interesting is they have the same feed that we have. They see the onboard shot, so they know that that panel is loose. And for, seems like for Ralph Yutner and Brad Kettler, the rest of Yost Racing, that uh, they're thinking, well, we're going to let it go for right now. We're going to let, let it, it ride. go for right now. There's, it's obviously, they know a lot more, they're a lot more intimate with the car than we are, and they know what they need to change and what they don't. Well, and they've spoken, I'm sure, on the radio with Tillier, and he's either told them, yes, the balance is fading, or no, the balance is good, and if the balance is good, there's no reason to take the time through the right-hander into Indianapolis. A spectacular piece of racetrack. Then the short run to Arnage, the very tight right-hand corner. See them beginning to catch traffic. I think that huh. might be the 51 leader yeah. in the GTE Pro category, Tony Belander. Obviously, our, our audio is our on. audio is certainly not or he just on our nice video. Yeah. <laughs> he just did our nice flat, which is frightening. Actually, that wasn't the 51. It's, uh, it was one of the GTE AM cars. Here come the Pujos. Oh. 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 And this is the issue. We talked about it earlier. You get in there with drivers who are not familiar with the racetrack and perhaps just right at the top of their ability level, and they've got to focus on driving the car. Not a lot left over to focus on paying attention to traffic. And Sarzan wants to get back up front. He wants to get his lap back. So he's got a little different motivation than the rest of the Peugeot group. Interesting to see to that, lap back. that Pagano has dropped back a little bit from Chelier, and you look at the lap times, and Chelier faster by almost two seconds, 1.7 seconds the last time around. So, uh, I mean, that Audi really digging deep and laying down some lap times right now. And obviously traffic ebbs and flows and has something to do with that, but... Uh, hey, you know, they could have just gone back to their game plan. You know, you mount those attacks for a while, and, and if you can make good of it, good. If you can't make good of it, you fall back in, and, you know, there's a long way to go still. No need to uh, abuse the equipment. It's about six and a half hours almost. Right now, the crew, the engineers looking on from the Peugeot camp, making their notes, making their game plan, as you say, Dorsey, trying to figure out how to get to the end of this event and take the checkered flag. For Peugeot, they've got three opportunities to do it. Audi down to one. Audi setting up for a pit stop. We'll see if it's this lap or not. Benoit Trillier built that lead to just about four and a half seconds indeed to pit road right now. And uh, with a four and a half second lead from just two laps ago, literally nose to tail with Pagano and then taking that lead. So that number two Audi, very, very quick indeed. Comes to the pits, the nine of Pagano comes to pit road as well. So they are on the same pit sequence and it is a long, down pit road at 60 kilometers per hour right now. It's got to feel like an eternity for Tellier, who has been spectacular on the racetrack. Let's see what all they do. Obviously, it's routine, but... Well, they changed tires and driver last time in, so they'll probably just do water bottle, fuel, and be off. They'll probably triple stint the tires. Yeah, there's the drink bottle. You see the nine, Pagano in as well. Expect the same pit treatment down there as well. The Michelins will stay on. 65 liters of diesel will go in. So the Pagano should be back underway. Now he got to his pit box first because it's at the beginning of pit road. The Audi is at the far end, so while it looks like the nine is away a little bit sooner, they'll come out in the order in which they entered the pits. Two car in front of the nine. Now on board the 73, Tommy Milner behind the wheel. Tony Vlander leading in GTE Pro and Milner running second. And about two thirds of a lap behind still. Right now he's showing a lap behind, but that'll cycle through. And uh, if it works out the way it has recently, Milner should be shown on the same lap. They're gonna need some help to close that distance a little bit. A yellow that's not of their own doing. But we've had, yeah, they've had plenty yeah, of those yet exactly. today. Trillier yeah. back on track, those Michelin tires. Nice thing about that is as cool as it is, you come in, you get your fuel, you're right back on track and the Michelins are still very, very warm. There's Pagano back behind him, coming out of Molson Corner and the run up, to, up towards Indianapolis, the two right-hand kinks. One of those where Mike Rockefeller had his problem. I have to say, the, the tire stints right are outstanding. Unbelievable that these missions can go four stints. Interesting on that pit stop. You know, we kept wondering about the 
body work on the two car. Yeah, they didn't even touch it. Uh, they never even later. touched it. Yeah, they didn't even, they had no concern at all. This, there it is. There's the offending member that we're talking about. And the faster he goes, the more it lifts up. You can begin to see a little yeah. daylight through it. But yeah. right now, the engineer's not seeing anything that they don't like. And more importantly, Benoit Trillier not commenting on a handling problem with the car. Andrew? Yeah, down here, the uh, eight car, the one that's playing the catch-up is in. This is just for fuel and cleaning the uh, windscreen, cleaning the lights. The fuel goes in. Uh, you talked about the litres, just to say it's about 17 US gallons that they put in. And uh, the car now accelerates away. And we are expecting the uh, seven car in the next uh, 30 seconds or so. So the uh, three Peugeots will all come in within the space of... Well, two laps, really. Getting the cycle yeah, it's through. interesting to see because one of the Peugeots came out on the same cycle as the Audi, one a lap later, and then one, the leader, the seven car, is coming in two, two laps, laps later. later. Yeah, the seven car has been off on its sequence for quite a long time. I had my notes here before, and they, they split that one out early for whatever reason. Well, yeah, well, so it was interesting because they all came in in the same lap during that yellow. So they've split their strategy already. We talked about how far away from the end of the race do you begin to back time well Pujo out all obviously already has looked at that and said let's begin to change our strategies to make sure that we have three good opportunities to get this done Alexander Vertz leading now in the number seven Pujo then Benoit Chulier has gotten back up to second then Pagano in third Stefan Sarazan desperately wants to get back on the lead lap. He runs in fourth right now. And we'd expect the seven Peugeot to be pitting this lap. Best of the petrol powered cars, the number 16, the Pescarolo entry. Christoph Tinsu behind the wheel right now, running in fifth. Even after the problems that the number 10, Deshonax team Orica Matmut has had, they are sixth in the running order. And that's a good comeback after the significant damage we saw to the 10 car in the night. Like I said, they just did a good job to get that nose repaired. It took a very heavy blow right smack in the center of it. That dissipates a yeah. lot of energy. It doesn't dissipate it. It spreads it out. <laughs> and then guys went to work, changed that right front suspension, whole new upright suspension, all the pieces. Fantastic job. That's what these guys practice for. You don't want it to happen, but if it does, they're certainly ready to go to work. I had a good audio of the uh, diesel and how it doesn't make any noise except the wind, and that's what you were hearing it. <laughs> as it went by through in, the air. In the LMP2 category, it's Olivier Lombard in the 41, the Greaves Racing Zytec mm -hmm. Nissan that uh, leads right now, and he's got a comfortable lead, about three laps, it appears, right now over the 26th, the Signatec Nissan, who was our pole sitter in that class. Said so we expect a seven car to pit this lap. Yep. And there he is, the blue mirrors on the seven. That's how you can tell which car is which. The seven has the blue mirrors, yeah. and indeed, dives to pit road. Stays on the same strategy. And that is a very tight pit entrance. The chicane there, and you get a little short shoot, then another little left-right jog onto pit road itself. And you can certainly make a mistake there, as we saw Anthony Davidson do last year. Andrew Marriott. Yeah, and the uh, seven car, Alexandra Burtz, looking for his third victory here. Stops right on his mark. And uh, this will just be a splash of fuel. The door is already shut. They've just opened the door briefly for the water bottle. That was all done and dusted. And talking about dusting, that's more or less what they're doing on the windscreen. The fuel's still going in, and this car is about to uh, wash its way out because that's literally what they do. Fuel's still going in. It seems to be so slow with this uh, new regulation. And he stalls it, but he fires it up again. And uh, it's stalled again. Is there a problem? No, he's uh, fired it up. And now it's, uh, now it's up to the pit speed limit and it's heading to pit out. So uh, a little bit of minor drama there with the car stalling twice as it went out. 
Stewart's on his way, and we'll go back to the rules. You cannot spin the rear tires when you leave your pit box. Once again, the Michelin tire is very warm, so a lot of grip on the way out. So Verge just trying to get the seven back on track. Man, look at that, Michelle. There's another bullet dodge. That is at the exit of the Porsche curves around an LMP2 car. You can do that once, you can do it twice. Can he do it a third time and get away with it? Well, we saw two Audis that didn't get a chance to get away with it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It only takes just a barely a touch. And you're set flying. So Trillier, the bit in his teeth, out in front right now. He's trying to build as much as he can the lead over Pagano. It is at nine seconds right now, only two laps out of the pits. Trillier's flying a 328 to a 330 for Pagano. Well, you know, six hours to go. It's, you know, running qualifying numbers or running as hard as they are, it's going to take its toll. And He's certainly taking the risk. We see that almost every lap in traffic, and at some point in time, you got to believe you're going to be bit. But right now, Trillier, absolutely spectacular to watch. A lot less traffic now than there was yesterday. A lot less traffic now, unfortunately. <laughs> But that does happen during a 24-hour race. And the other thing is, remember, Audi is looking at the back of the race forward as well. So in the X set of circumstances, what we're going to see is uh, it's thinking about, you know, they can go one or two extra laps. And looking at timing and scoring, the official timing and scoring, and the message on the bottom of the screen, stop and go penalty for team number eight. That is Stefan Sarazan, who's working to get his lap back trying as hard as he possibly can so it seems like some type of a pit infraction perhaps either that or pass or the eight we haven't seen any yellows out there so it can't be passing i don't know what's yellow. uh be interesting to find out what the penalty is for well it also says one mn at the yeah. side of it is that one minute it, did he run over pit equipment or such one minute ferrari on pit road it looks like that is the 51. And if that's the case, that would be your leader in GTE Pro. Tony Belander showed behind the wheel, but I'm seeing tires being changed, so I've got to believe there's also been a driver change in the 51. It's off the jacks, refired, and back underway. Trillier continuing to lead, and 7.8 seconds roughly in hand, the last time by at the line. Andrew, what's going on down at Peugeot? Just uh, tell you that uh, in a moment. I'm the one can't go out, and uh, Bruni got into the car. Tony Villanda, the flying fin. Yeah, sorry, the 51. And uh, Tony Villanda, the flying fin, just got out of the car. Jimmy Bruni went in. It was a nice, clean stop. So that car is still racing hard. Now I'm going to trot my way down to Peugeot, try and find out what this uh, penalty is all about. Thank you, Andrew. And for Stefan Sarazan, that is not good news. That uh, depends on where they are on the lap as to whether they'll lose another lap by coming in and doing that penalty. It is a three and a half minute lap around here at Le Mans. And if he's held for a minute and has a 30 second or so run down pit lane, perhaps he won't lose you. Olivier Canel there being uh, informed by the crew perhaps what is the problem or what was the problem on that pit stop that caused the issue. There is the eight, Sarazan on track, the white mirrors on the eight car, red mirrors on the nine, the blue mirrors on the seven that Alexander Vert's pilots right now. Benoit Trillier out in front now 10.3 seconds. So he is continuing to lap consistently quicker than Simon Pagano right now and beginning to build even more of a lead. That is the 16. The Pescarolo entry is running in fifth. Christoph Tinsu was behind the wheel and they were having a great run leading the petrol class, but now in the garage. Going to work, trying to see, uh, diagnose what's going on with that car right now. Sarah Zan there. Obviously the eight not coming to pitch yet, so I'm assuming they're having a conversation with the officials to try to get that erased. That seldom seems to work though, Andrew. They're not having too long. <laughs> No, that won't work. I think they've accepted. I just spoke with Bruno Famine. Uh, one mechanic did not have his visor down. We've seen this a lot in the American Le Mans series. So even a well-drilled organization like Peugeot could make the little mistake. And that's the sort of mistake in a race as close as this that couldn't make all the difference between a victory and finishing third. One stumble and it could take you out of the hunt for Stefan Sarazan. He still has six hours to make up 
yeah, for the air that he had and his crew had on pit road. Plenty of excitement yet to come. I know he's taking a short nap, but for Benoit Trillier, it's been very exciting indeed. Stick around. Speed's coverage of the 24 Hours of Le Mans is brought to you by Chevrolet and America's premier sports car, Corvette. So we've just crossed the six hour mark. So go. right now, 5.59 and change left. 9 a.m. in Le Mans. And uh, the race is over, you can tell. There are no cars on the race. Oh, there they are, yeah. that's right. They were they're, hiding somewhere they're, eight miles they're, away. <laughs> 30 cars left running, and it is the magnetic principle of race cars. They all found themselves in one area of the track. It was amazing. We looked at the front straightaway for probably 30 seconds, and nary a car came by. We talk about that, and I thought it was absolutely crazy before going there my first time, but I did one or two stints where I saw headlights but never actually saw another car. It's, it's crazy. 8.4 miles roughly of racetrack out there, and there's plenty of room for the 30 cars that remain running here in the 79th running of the Le Mans 24 hour. The Pescarolo entry still in the garage area. We saw the engine cover come off. Christoph Tensu behind the wheel. They are still shown in fifth, but that will eventually begin and to drop And don't forget, by. while we were away, Sarazan came in and did a stop and go plus one minute. It seemed like forever. From P1 to P2, it is the Zytec of Olivier Lombard, who leads right now the Greaves racing entry. Jamie, what do you have on the 41? Well, I just checked in with the team, and Kareem Oje is going to get back in the car just shortly. He said it's going to be about 20 minutes. He's going to get in, do a couple of cents, and they're going to get Tom Kemmer Smith behind the wheel. He's going to do a triple. Right now, the team says everything's going flawlessly. They're just going to keep taking through their paces, running through their laps. There's no need to push anything right now. They're just waiting to make it to the end. Well, Kareem Oje and Tom Kimber Smith currently third in the LMS LMP2 uh, Drivers' Championship, so they're doing a good job. And Oje had a blowout at the Le Mans Test Day on the way to Indianapolis Corner, and that is certainly an exciting place. We saw the unfortunate incident for Mike Rockefeller on that same run down towards Indianapolis. I cannot imagine having a problem there. Nigel Mansell, interestingly enough, had a crash in the same location, same basic location last year with a huge impact. So it is an area that you certainly want to avoid any type of a problem. Good to see Tinsu out of the garage area, the 16 back down on, uh, well, not yet. Still must have a dolly underneath him. There he goes. I, know, the the I think the jack was all the, was an all the way up. Yep. Spun the tires a little bit, but now Tinsu back underway long time on pit road there and there's the 10 due to Shonax Peugeot the 908 HDI and you got to wonder you know what if they'll oh. be thinking about that for a long time yeah. how many races have you run where you wonder what if yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you wonder if yourself into the ground man yeah looking back for our leaders 13 and a half seconds in hand right now Benoit Trillier has over Simon Pagano and uh, he's just been absolutely magic consistently in both cars, obviously in traffic, consistently pulling away at a few tenths per lap and sometimes even more than that. It's starting to add up. We saw five seconds, eight seconds, 10 seconds, now up to 13 seconds, a lead that the uh, number two Audi has over the number nine Peugeot of Pagano. It was a Lurch, and then Sarazan. That lap down and maybe even two laps down after yeah. that long, lengthy penalty stop. We'll have to see how that cycles out. It was not only a stop and go, it was a stop and hold for one minute. We timed it here. Uh, they did indeed hold him for a minute. <laughs> there, so you can't, no speculation there. But even for us sitting here watching it, it painful. seemed like an eternity. Absolutely painful. And think about the driver in there, and he's been working really hard to get in a tenth, you know, a couple tenths here and there. And, and it wasn't his mistake. And it wasn't his mistake, is right. Yeah. But you know when what? When a team lose? Yeah, no, that's exactly what I was going to say, Scott. It takes a team to get the job done, and everyone has to accept that mistakes will be made. You try to limit those, but you can't get down on anybody. You get back out, and you do your job just like the crew does if you have an off on the racetrack and damage the car. Back down the straightaway. The P2 car is coming through. 
A lot of P2 Peugeot. car traffic. That is Stefan Serra's and I believe white mirrors on that Peugeot that's coming towards us right now. Looks like the 16 of Christoph Tinsen. We were just talking about him right behind him. Not a huge speed difference between those two. I think so much of the diesel power comes in, in areas that you don't see. A little bit more acceleration, a little bit more top speed, a little bit more efficiency. When you've wondered about the problems for the 16, Andrew, you have more? Yeah, well, firstly, it's Julian Juice who's at the wheel, not Christoph uh, Tinsu. Uh, I've just been ceremoniously bundled out of the garage by Madame Pescarolo. who's only a little woman, she, she's pretty fiery. And, uh, say what the problem actually is but I think it's somewhere in the engine management system but together with that they've also got a problem with their fueling rig and we might just be showing you uh, that they've just had to change a hose so uh, there's quite a lot of issues here at the moment for the Pescarolo. Thank you for pointing out the error of my ways. Timing and scoring has now cycled through, and indeed you are correct, Andrew, as you normally are. It is Julian Juice being shown on timing and scoring in the 16. So a driver changed while the car was in the garage. And once again, there's a look at the 10. I thought you were psychic. I am psycho from time to time. <laughs> Just ask my children, look, Duvall behind the wheel of the 10. Hugh Deshonak has uh, put together a great group of drivers. Olivier Penis, one of those who helps not only uh -oh, with driving, uh -oh. but some of the management as well. And look at this. Trillier just, I don't want to say forcing his way through. He's not literally moving cars, but he certainly does not hesitate to work his way through. Certainly not losing any time to it either. No, you're taking a look at the different class leaders. That's the 50, the leader in the GTE AM. You saw the 41, the leader, the Zytec, with Olivier Lombard on board. The 41 Zytec leading in the LMP2 category. Benoit Trillier, the leader overall in the P1 category. And you saw the 51 with Jimmy Bruni behind the wheel, the Ferrari entry, that beautiful 458, the 51 as well. And those are the leaders in the four categories. The Ferrari, of course, by AF Corsa. And Bruni sharing that car with Giancarlo Fisichella, Tony V. Lander. There is one of the BMWs, the 55. Augusta Farfus. Oh. They worked that BMW back up to third after the problems that they've had, but still several laps down to the leader. But it is the age old tried and true in these long distance races. It is not over until it's over. They take another shot on board. A little traffic here. Yeah. Oh, back <laughs> to the right. Way. I'll go that way. Thank you very much. They're going to wear out the little. Uh, Headlight button. Yeah, the flasher. Yeah, the flasher's <laughs> getting more activity than anything on it. As you watch Chilier flash through, just on deceleration sometime, you see a little puff of smoke. It's right there, I saw it, yeah. It is uh, a single exhaust system, a single turbo on the 3.7 liter V6 diesel, and so that exhaust system is right in the center and comes out right at the base of the wing, and you're getting to see that smoke, that little puff of smoke on diesel, and I don't know that... Uh, anything to worry about but Shoot. certainly something that we haven't seen at least in the opening stages yeah, i think they've he's just giving it a good thrashing right now no doubt about that well there is absolutely no doubt about that there it is again yeah, let's hop this curb let's hop over this curb nice. let's uh Let's do some durability testing here. Well, he's tossing it around for Yes, good. he is. And it's interesting. You talk about the curbs, and Alexander Wurtz had said, you know, he and David Brabham and Mark Genet won by never touching a curb. He said, our teammates did, and we knew that they were going to have to replace noses. And we said, we can save time in the pits. It takes about a minute to a minute and a half to change one of those noses. He said, we can gain three minutes by not doing that. They never touched a curb all day, and they won. So the question is, how much can you punish the car we've already seen a little bit of loose body work on the two and over the next five hours and 50 minutes it'll be interesting to see if there might have to be some changes made to that number two car as you look at one of the lotus evoras out on track things settling down a little bit right now and a problem for that same very lotus is <laughs> he gets turned around and back underway benoit trillier continues the lead and it's at 15 and a half seconds right now over Simon Pagano, the crew's at work, really is beginning to look at the end of the race and back time. What strategy do we need? Strategy down there, have another croissant. We'll be back. 
Riding on board the Corvette with Tommy Milner. Hey, and you too can get your hands on a very special Corvette Grand Sport. Top it off with a trip to next year's 24 Hours of Le Mans. So go to race to win Corvette.com for more details on this once in a lifetime experience. Hey, maybe we'll see you over there next year. And it is How definitely cool would that be oh. to win that, man? Oh. That would be just awesome. You can't do it, though. You're, uh, you're, well, you're excluded. From well, I went there with Corvette. Well, yeah, you, you've been, Corvette. yeah, that's right. You've been there in a Corvette, so, <laughs> so you're definitely I'd like to go there to drive. Excluded. Yeah. That's the I only thing I'd like to I know you keep whining about that. It's only 23 hours of wetness that year. I'm sure it was very shot, soggy. Man. You know, the trophy was still shiny, wasn't it? The trophy is still shiny. Yeah. I yeah. polished it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Stop complaining. One for one. All right. There goes the 73 Corvette with Tommy Muller behind the wheel. He flashes through, looking back down the order. Ah, and a little conversation. The Signatech Nissan guys. Conversation about the power plants. That is the HPD power plant. Joao Barbosa behind the wheel of the number 33 level five. Lola Coupe. You see the what some people refer to as the BHF on the back of that Lola Coupe. That is the big honking fin that is regulated by the 2011 the dorsal, rules. Dorsal yep. fin. The BHF, the big honking fin, and uh, you also see that on the Peugeots and the Audis. Many of these cars grandfathered in. So right now, 2011, somewhat of a transition year in the rules package. So. Different cars, different rules packages. Some of them are grandfathered ca cars. Some of them meet the 2011 regulations and are cost cap cars. Some of them are not cost cap, but meet the 2011 regulations. The LMP2 category is really a conglom conglomeration of bits and pieces of cars right now, but we've seen a pretty good uh, pretty good run at it, the Senator, guys here today. what about hybrids now? You know, you got the hybrid technology out there. You, they're trying to push that forward as well. And how does that fit into the whole scheme of uh, and it's going to be interesting because in the GT category, at least, the 911 hybrid is spectacular. It's coming. Oh, I mean, it is wicked fast. It, you just have to get used to something sitting beside you and spinning mm, at, what no. is it, 40,000 RPM? Yeah, made out of carbon. Storing carbon. energy, a disc that's sitting over there. And the guys that drive it say that uh, the hybrid system actually makes more noise than the petrol-powered engine in the back of the car. And it's, uh, but it is an engineering marvel to say the least. There is the 51. Jimmy Bruni looks just like Scott Pruitt. Look at what? that. What? Just I like him up front, I baby. Believe, I believe that Running was actually your picture there with Jimmy Bruni's name beside it. It's Bruni that leads <laughs> right now in the GTE AM class. So uh, once again, a little glory for you there, Scott. This time you're in a Ferrari, it looks yeah, like. Yeah, what do you think? Does that look like me? That's the best way to do Just keep moving around where they don't know where you're at. That's right. <laughs> have to Especially a, for the build collectors. Yeah, we have, we have <laughs> to put a foul ahead. at the end of your name, though, if you're going to be driving keep, for AF Force no, no and Ferrari here. factory driver. Look at that. Bruni going to get a little bit of a tow off of an LMP2 car. Maybe I can save a little fuel. I'll just drop back in behind him. And well, he actually, the LMP2 car made a mistake and hindered his forward momentum, if you want to call it that. Okay. Well, earlier we thought that Christian Reed was behind the wheel of the 63 that had the impact with the Porsche that had the impact with Yen Magnuson in the Corvette. That was not the case. It was Horst Felbermeyer Sr. and Andrew Marriott. Do you have an update on Mr. Felbermeyer? Yes, I do. And I've just been talking to Wolf Hensler, of course, who's in the sister car. He tells me that Horst has been taken to the hospital in Le Mans just for uh, checkups, uh, rather the situation, of course, with the element is similar thing, but he uh, understands that Horst uh, will be absolutely fine. But uh, obviously it was a pretty big accident. But Horst is uh, one of the older guys in the race, and I think uh, he possibly is the oldest guy in the race. And I have to tell you, for the first time in my life, coming here for 40 years, I'm older than every single driver in the race, which is not a good thing. Here than every single driver in the race not added not together, right, Andrew? <laughs> it can't be cumulative, is it? Andrew's not even... Uh, not cumulative, <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> well, you know, no, I can talk about old guys. He's going to feel that one for a while. But I think Andrew has more energy than half of the young guys that are out there that are driving. 
Level five, Joao Barbosa behind the wheel on pit road, Jamie. but they are going to be making some bodywork changes. They're giving Jao Barbosa a new drink bottle, making sure the fuel is all complete. Now this team is going to get to work. What they're doing is they're going to change the shot cover because on their last pit stop, they noticed that their radio antenna was cut down, so they're going to put a new one on. They're also going to change the rear wing assembly. They think that they might have a latch coming loose on it. It's at the point in the race where you can't take any chances, and they're going to use this opportunity to also make a couple arrow changes because they are getting complaints of a little bit of understeer. You can see all the work being done right now. This is quick, quick, quick work considering the amount of work that's being done. The team had a meeting before the stop saying, just take your time, get it done. We have plenty of it. Nicely done. Nicely done. And work continues, guys. And obviously, you don't want that rear wing assembly coming off or your understeer will go to oversteer very quickly. See the Audi and Trillier, 12 almost 13 seconds in hand when he came to the pits and crew holding him for some reason and making some type of a change or adjustment to the car it would seem good that or just wait still on fuel i think i would want my vertical stabilizer to have a rudder on the back the, the bhf the yep. big honking fin and help with turning and I, I said perhaps making some type of adjustment forgetting that once again with the restrictor in the fuel hose takes right. some 30 seconds to fill 65 liters of fuel so those and it seems like forever. Stops out. I mean, it's seen, when you're sitting there, it might as well be five minutes. Yeah, and we talked about the minute hold for Stefan Sarazan and how it seemed to be so long. Trillier back underway. Pagano now has flashed by and taken the lead. Verts has gotten by as well. And Trillier will re-enter the racetrack about 38 seconds behind the leader, Simon Pagano, right now. But if things stay true to form, I would expect to see Simon Pagano in this lap. This lap, yeah, 262 is when he's, he's Except for due. the fact. One he, more. Yeah, he, well. 263. Was he not in? Wasn't he in with Chillier the last time they came together, did they not? Yes, they did. So if he goes one more he's lap, he's once doing. again, we're seeing that one extra lap. Yeah, they're doing the 12 laps getting. to the 11, so that would, in fact, you're right, put him at 263. And I know I keep harping on this, but the, has Pujo found the secret weapon to that extra lap and to the top speed with that wing adjustment, that uh, that different rear wing that they have on the Pujo, is that given them enough for the extra lap and a little top speed? Andrew? Yeah, I think they're uh, definitely going to do that extra lap again. I'm down at the uh, pit for Pujo. No sign of any activity down here at all at the moment. Uh, so, Jamie Howe, uh, you've got a report for us. 55 BMW is going to go into the garage area. As it came to a stop on pit lane, there is some fluid coming from the hood. So the team's pushing it in to get to work. Augustus Farfus had been up as high as third in GTE Pro, but it seems like they claw their way back up. They have an issue and they drop back down, and that is the ebb and flow of endurance racing. Jimmy Bruni right now in the 51 Ferrari. Any talk of a transmission problem hours ago that we heard seems to have been perhaps a little bit of a premature worry on their part because that Ferrari 458 running just fine. Tommy Milner holding down second place in GTE Pro being shown on timing and scoring at least right now until they cycle through one lap down. But we feel that he's just about two thirds of a lap behind. We'll have to wait and see if that is indeed the case. Yep, that is about 355. So they're right together on the racetrack, just about eight seconds apart. So right now, Jimmy Bruni just about eight seconds behind Tommy Milner on the racetrack. How much do you figure a digital LED pit stop board is worth? <laughs> At night to keep yeah. you from making a mistake? <laughs> <laughs> Just to, just to buy it? Yeah, just to buy it. Well, if you have to worry about what your pit board costs, I don't think you can run the car. That's for sure. Well, that, I'm going to try to get <laughs> Jamie, you know, to, to sweetly as she does go over there and snatch and it. See if you can get yeah, one. Yeah. Bring it back for us. I think the problem for Tommy Milner is that Jimmy Bruni is so close to lapping him and Bruni lapping about two and a half seconds faster right now than Milner is in the Corvette. And obviously the problems for Farfus in the BMW, the 
Yeah. Well, it looks fairly body severe. Work is off. Body yeah, work this, this is not going to be a quick fix. Looks like they're working up by the radiator, too. So if it's fluid leak up there, and, uh, that could be a whole radiator or whatever. Not an easy or quick fix. That should means. elevate Andy Prio then in the 56 up to the third position here in about a lap. He's being shown about three laps behind Jimmy Bruni, the leader in the GTE Pro category. In GTE Am, it is Patrick Vornhauser in the Lover competition. So we're looking at the, the nine Peugeot at, at the moment of Pagano, and he's going to go two laps longer. So he's, instead of pitting at 261, they're going to look at 263. So perhaps they've actually backed down the pace a little bit, changed the fuel setting, saving a little bit of fuel lap. and stretching that other lap. He wow. pitted last at 251, so they're going to go 12 laps. Which is stretching it at least one more than, than Audi has been doing. And that is just not good news for the Audi camp. I mean, if they can get 13 laps, that would be impressive indeed. As you see the number nine, Simon Pagenaud, the red mirrors on the nine car. It's difficult to determine which car is which, and really the colors on the mirrors and on window screens on some of the different GT cars, the only way you can discern team cars from one another. Peugeot's and the Audi's both use different color highlights. The red mirrors on the nine, white mirrors on the eight, and blue mirrors on the number seven in the Peugeot camp. For the Audi, Benoit Trillier, it's real simple. It's the only R18 left out on the racetrack, but uh, you ride on board. Tommy Milner doing all that he can do to try to hold off Jimmy Bruni. He doesn't want to go down a lap. You can, you can make it back here, but uh, with the staggered pace car or safety car rules that they have, makes it very difficult indeed. So Milner doing all that he can do. Try to hold on. Pagano picked up the pace a little bit, and Benoit Trillier not been around to click the start finish line yet again on a fast lap so don't really know where he sits other than about 36 seconds behind the last time by behind Simon Pagino. We expect to see Alexander Wirtz here in a lap or two as well in the Peugeot camp. Wirtz seemed like he was going another lap. He's, he's got cycled to do another right. lap further. Not, I mean, I think it's the same total lap for one stop, but just was able to cycle through for one lap further. And that's exactly what it appeared the last time that they had managed to stagger their cars for three different strategical approaches towards the end of the race. Pagano now coming into the pits. Just on time. Just as you would expect it. Dorsey's counting down the laps on the different cars here. Pagano. Peugeot as they usually are in the first three garages. Pagano is there and so is Andrew. Yes, I am. We've just been pushed to one side because uh, we think the seven's going to come in very soon as well. And uh, this is uh, purely a fuel stop. A uh, drinks bottle's been handed in and the, the door has been shut. The fuel is still going in at the moment. It just seems so slow this year. But this is uh, another clean stop from Peugeot and uh, out that car goes. I'm glad to see there's still a lot. Now it's the eight car we're expecting next. Pushing and shoving going on down there in pit lane as usual. And it gets worse the later it gets. In the final hour, on those final stops, the ropes come out. Yeah, the ropes aggravate me. <laughs> and they literally, <laughs> you'll have a, a guard that jumps out with a rope and then yeah, pulls the rope back up to the wall and knocks everyone along that rope. I got in an that rope. I can't, I can't guys. imagine that, Dorsey. <laughs> it was with the Vista flying. Yeah, they yeah, were knocked out of the way. He knocked me down, so I knocked him down. <laughs> I thought it was fair. I looked at it this way. The rope is only so long. I let the guy go to the end of the rope. I go a little bit further, and then I just run around him. I'm going to disconnect the far end of the <laughs> it, <laughs> it doesn't make him happy when you do that, but, no. you know, you got to figure out a way around him. Right now, Benoit Trillier trying to figure out a way around Alexander Wirtz, and it won't be a pass. It's going to happen as the different cars come to pit road, but Trillier is going to have to deal with GT traffic. You saw a gaggle of cars right there in front of him. He exited one of the chicanes. Now the eight on pit road. Stefan Sarazan. 
here's a look at the rear wing of the Peugeot. It's kind of hard to tell what we were talking about. It's just kind of bent down at the le at the trailing edge of the secondary flap, and that really takes that mandatory 20 millimeter wicker and moves it out of the airstream pretty significantly. Did we ever get to the wheel bumps? We saw the wheel bumps on the Oak Racing rear wing as well, and all of that is in the same effort to reduce the drag that the officials tried to install by mandating that 20 millimeter girdy. Imagine that, the engineers trying to overcome the rules packages. There's always gotta be loopholes somehow, some way. You talk about, that's the there other way go. that you were talking about. Now this concept came, believe it or not, if you believe what you read in print, from examining a whale and the efficiency of the size of the whale, and those whales have those bumps on the leading edge of their fins. Fluid dynamics. Fluid dynamics. and um, In nature. So yeah. now they have them on. Mother nature at, her, at its best. Figure that. So it's going to be interesting to see when Wurtz makes his way to pit lane, number seven Peugeot. Should be shortly, I would think. There he is in the number seven, the Blue Mares, working his way around one of the Lotus Avoras. And starting to see little puffs of smoke uh, out of the seven as well on yeah, they're getting tired. Diesel. They're getting tired. Not nearly as big as the puffs of smoke, flame, and uh, pistons that were exiting the exhaust from all of the Peugeots last year. I shouldn't say all of them. One of them had a, a tub problem when the suspension pulled out and expect to see verts. Not this time. One more lap. One more lap. I wonder what the conversation that's with, right. the, with the yeah, whale was right. like. Because they initially had pitted with Pagano on the same lap as Audi. Now they've gone a few laps longer. They stretched it already. Great show. Strategy beginning to play out. It's Jimmy Bruni that leads in the GTE Pro category. Get Tommy Miller in the Corvette. Catch it. We'll find out. Welcome back to Le Mans. And this uh, magnificent battle continues. Obviously, it's three to one. We just have the pit stop here of the number seven Audi, the Austrian former Formula One driver, Alexandra Burtz is at the wheel. They have a couple of tires ready here. In fact, we've had four tires ready, but they didn't use them. And the car accelerates out away from me. And Peugeot versus Audi. What a battle. What a Le Mans to remember in 2011. Uh, there's a lot to remember, yeah. and a lot, I know there are different parts of this race some people would like, like to, forget to forget and actually will have forgotten. I'm sure they don't remember bits and pieces of some of it, but Alexander Wirtz heads back on track. The youngest driver in history to win Le Mans at the age of 22. That was 15 years ago. He's now 37, but <laughs> Wirtz, yeah, clean even, even as a younger driver, thank you very much. Very mature. I had a conversation with him at Sebring several years ago, and he said, I can remember testing in Formula One and looking over and seeing the, the prototypes running, and he said, I want to drive one of those, and had his agent go over and start having conversations with the prototypes team saying, I want to drive one of those. I, I want to get that done, and uh, eventually did. One in the TWR Porsche at Le Mans back in uh, 1996, and then again in 09 in a Peugeot. So he has a love affair with sports cars and has really since the first time he laid eyes on them. And for a lot of Formula One drivers, the mentality that it takes to be an endurance racer just isn't there, but for words, seems to understand the game completely. And I think actually enjoys the the sports car side of it, the endurance side of it, the strategical side of it, much better than he enjoyed his Formula One career. Well, F1's no fun, and, and this is. F1 can be, uh, not that I ever competed full-time, went to Europe and tested over there, but uh, it's it's pretty cutthroat, and it's a, it's a lot of pressure, and these guys come over here and, and get the opportunity to drive, put in a lot of miles, have some fun, and not have the pressure that they do in Formula One. Yeah, the and not have the cutthroatness as yeah, it does. Yeah, it's just cut, cutthroatness well. is correct. This is a team effort, and so you can spread it out a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jackie, See Jackie Ix. Ix standing there uh, down in the 22 camp. Vanina, his daughter, I wonder if he's driving that Aston what? Martin Lola. He always has it tied up, but I've never seen him wear it. Fashion. It's a fashion statement. Here we go. Whistling Taking on time. 
Yeah, no need to. Getting by, I mean, this is one of those, we're talking about the strategic area of this race right now, and you're really starting to see some interesting fuel strategies come on board with the, with the Audi and the Peugeots that are left. Significant different in laps on where they're making their stops. And that's going to change the outlook of this race as we get into closing stages. We got five hours and 20, roughly five hours and 23 minutes to go. Yeah, Peugeot's going 12 laps with their cars. Audi is only making 11. You talk about back timing this race. Explain that a little bit. When you look at the end of the race and you're just thinking about how long each of your stops is going to go under green and what you need to do to get the least amount of stops to get to the checkered flag. That's what Peugeot's doing for sure. Julian Juice behind the, the wheel. Number of seven. Something on. Alexander Wurtz. Great shot right there. Was a beautiful <laughs> wear a tear on some of these cars with uh, just over five hours to go. You can see the punishment that they've been through. World feed keeping us guessing. Oh, there's a little bit of tape. tape. If that's all you got hanging off the car <laughs> right now, <laughs> I'd deal with that. So you're working your way from the end back, trying to look at the best way to get there in the least amount of stops. For Audi, it looks like they may have to go one more stop than the Peugeot's at this point. That's what Peugeot's hoping for anyway. For sure. the cars circulate around the racetrack. Jackie Ix, the six-time winner here at Le Mans. You saw him standing down there in the garage of the 22 that Vanina drives for. And Andrew is there. And Andrew, I'm sure you'll have an interesting conversation with Mr. Ix. Jackie, how difficult is it being a racing dad with your, your daughter out there? Honestly, not easy. Um, yes, it's a little bit painful because you have always the wish to see your daughter doing well, but you know it's Le Mans and everything may happen. Now, this is a terrific race. Can you remember battles like this when you were involved with them? You had several great battles. Um, we had some battles in the past, but this one I think is going to be really exceptional. That's what endurance racing uh, needs this battle between four Peugeot and one Audi without knowing who will get the glory that's what we really need it's still a long way to go it's now more la than last night we saw two big accidents can you imagine climbing out of a Porsche 962 after having an accident like Alan McNish had or like Rocky had Luckily, during these last 40 years, uh, race courses and cars never stopped improving. And I think you can call these two accidents where no one was really hurt, uh, a real miracle. And thanks to the technology, thanks to the improvement on cars, yes, a driver can go out of these cars unheard plus the fact that we i think we have been extremely lucky not having any kind of marshals or photographs or spectator involved in it so the word miracle it's the correct jackie thanks very much privilege to talk to you thank you i agree with everything you just yes, said exactly right yeah That's that was so spot true. on you know absolutely I mean, yeah, and Scott, I know you and I had a conversation about safety even at the last race where we were, and, and you know, you talk about it, and it's something that we take for granted, but when you see the incidents like we've seen here, you understand uh, just how far technology has come, but I think Jackie Ix was spot on. Miracle, because uh, as good as technology is, uh, the, the potential for disaster is still there, and while the crashes that we've seen at this event have been spectacular, the disaster seems to have been avoided. Well, I'll say one thing. I bet you anything when you come back next year, the area that McNish crashed in will not be full of, you know, of people right there. There'll be some For sure, and, and even they'll go back and expect the, 
the race cars and what has happened and what's taken place and look at making those better as well because from accidents improvements come and that's the that's the only good side of those accidents uh, as well as the survivability as the drivers is to come away from that with a good look at the car and, and just go back and go, how can we make these cars safer? How can we make the racetrack safer? No one who saw that accident down there could call it anything but a miracle that none of the uh, photographers or, or, or the fans behind that wreck were injured. It, that is a true miracle. While Andrew was talking to Jackie Ix, the 50, the leader in the GTE AM category, Patrick Bornhauser was in. Now here is Alan Nish's crashes early on. Now not only look at the car as it makes contact, but the spectators, the photographers, as Jackie Hicks was talking about, as you guys mentioned, take a look at this. And watch this, watch this rear suspension. It's gone, it's way above the top. of. It's gonna land next to this lady in blue, watch this. Oof. How close was that? And that wow. probably weighed 35, 45 That's pounds. on board with Timo Bernard. You see the speed at which McNish comes through and disappears and the reaction, obviously, of the Audi crew. And everybody was stunned. And I think they were just as stunned to see Allen climb from the car. I don't think anybody expected that. Obviously winded, obviously shaken, but at the same point in time, out of the car on his own power and uh and that was actually just absolutely spectacular to see the only thing more surprising was to hear that mike rockenfeller yeah. had climbed out of his car if you have his own power as well you know if you hadn't seen those accidents before you know no one was injured neither driver spectator or anything and two of the biggest wrecks that we've seen in just forever and one of the massive massive wrecks there is once again the 41, your leader in the LMP2 category. Kareem Oje behind the wheel right now. 249 laps in the book, second place. So he'll Ayari right now in the 26, the Signatech Nissan the car that started from the LMP2 pole, being shown two laps, actually four laps back, I should say, right now. So the Greaves Motorsport entry, a little bit of breathing room right now in LMP2, but with five hours and 16 minutes left. I wouldn't say breathing uh, room right now. It is Le Mans and anything can happen. Well, and hats off to these P2 teams who have done a great job of just keeping these guys out there and running throughout the night. These cars were known as being too brittle for a long time. They've come a long way, actually, uh, from where we'd seen none of them finish. And now they're actually coming to the point where they're racing quite hard and and pulling this off this Nissan power. Oh, another big accident. It's There's a big crash. Is that the Audi? Audi? It's the Audi. It's the Audi. Ben Rod, no, no, it's the no, Pujo. No, no, no. Seven. It's, it's the Pujo. Indeed, the blue mirrors. That is the seven. That is Alexander Verts. You hear him trying to get out, but obviously stuck in the gravel. And the other question is how much damage has been done to the front suspension from the long shot. It looked like the Audi at first, but it is the Pujo. So now there, it's two against there one. There it is. He just got too high getting in there, carrying so much speed and now that's not pretty good impact big. on the right front. Yeah. yeah, it looks like he'll get back to the pits and get that thing turned around I quite quickly, so but that's not the kind of thing that you need to happen. On board? He just doesn't get the car turned in. It's, it makes the move and then stops turning and then boom, the impact. And once again, late in the race, a lot of dirt off the line. And it seems to make the move initially but then kind of gives up and stays wide of the apex. And with that speed, and you're not you, going to keep it on the track of the exit. Once you get past midway offline, you're not coming back. You, you can't. I mean, you get so much dirt and gravel. You just take a look at the right-hand side of the screen. You look at all the gravel yeah. that's on the track. There's a point of no return, and he, he Look at the right front suspension, now, though, guys. Hard to see. But They're towing him further through the gravel trap as opposed to... Maybe get him behind that that road there. There. There's an access road back I don't see that right front tire turning. It's hard to tell from here, but that might have been a bigger lick than we thought. It's a, it was a hit almost directly on the right front suspension, so the concern would be, um, you know, that, that right front suspension, whether it's a, an A-arm or a push rod that could be bent or dislodged, but uh, obviously the bodywork is going to have to be addressed if he can get it back fired and back to pits. And it becomes, a, that's exactly right, it's a lot of damage. It becomes... Now, can we get it back to the pit, or can you know can it survive to get there? Well, you're going to have to tie him to the yeah. guardrail to keep him from trying to drive it back. That's for certain. The Audi crew looking on. 
a lot of interest. Now there it is, high and wide. And then of course, right on the edge of the racetrack is the gravel. Once you're in the gravel, you're certainly not gonna get the car turned. Yeah, when he was out there that far, there was no way it was gonna turn no matter what. Take Finish another look up. here, just too much speed. A big hit, now he's got it back on the track. And Andrew, he's heading your, your way. What do you have from the Peugeot camp? Yeah, they're already prepared to change that front corner. They've got the front corner ready to uh, fit on the car. What they'll do first, as they always do, they'll fuel it up and then they'll put it on the dollies and push it back into the garage area. Well, so uh, Persia are ready for this. It'll be interesting to see how quickly it takes them to fix it. I'm sure they have a full right corner already Absolutely assembled. Absolutely they do. We saw that happen earlier. You know, they'll, the they'll do a quick disconnect and pull that all off there and put a new one on pretty quickly. It looked to me like it was slightly askew, perhaps oh, yeah. too much negative camber in it. And one thing's for certain, at this racetrack, yes, it certainly looks askew. At this racetrack, you're not going to go back out with a suspension that might be suspect. The speeds here, the loads, uh, once again, we talk about risk and reward. The risk is way, way too high. Now, for the seven car, the chance at victory may very well be gone. But it's yeah. very well you gone want, right you, here. You certainly want to take... keep your driver safe. Yeah. And, and I mean, that, yeah, it, right that's gonna say, it, it's 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 taken quite a bit of hit. Now, the only hope is that it just bent to suspension and hasn't hurt the toe. Right. The second part of this equation is because of all the carbon fiber out there, will they throw a yellow, which some people could really use right now? And it looked to me like the right rear could potentially be askew as well. The camera seemed to be off on the right rear, although that portion of the car didn't take a big lick. No. But uh, to me, that right rear looks straight up and down, and typically you'd see a little negative camber in it. To me, it almost looks positive. I think that the front one's just... Oh, oh yeah, wow. you can yeah, see yeah. Yeah. Right the top. Definitely has an issue there on the front, and sticking by my guns that there's something maybe That's askew in the right rear as well. Andrew is there. The right rear looks absolutely fine to me. Can't see any damage on it at all. The uh, car will be fueled up, of course, first, as I said, and then it's going to be pushed back on the dollies. They do have that corner waiting to uh, fit on, as you would expect. So there it is on the dollies, turning it around, pushing it back into the garage. Alexandra Virch is climbing out of the car as it goes back into the garage area. And uh, this is major, major drama. And... Uh, the Audi press conference on Friday, Dr. Ulrich said, you have to have a perfect race. If your car goes on the dollies, even once, it's not going to win. That's your variable camber right front. Yeah, that's it's not, not what good. you want either. No, that's not what push you That's over. one of those things where you got to push hard, but you just can't take a chance on making that mistake. Even if it's a little mistake, it's a, a huge risk that, that turned out bad. And now there are two effectively in the fight and Stefan Sarazan still a lap down to Benoit Trillier and Simon Pagano. So really it may be mano a mano, Pagano versus Trillier, Peugeot versus Audi. It's exactly what we expected at the start of this race after watching qualifying. More action from Le Mans. We said it's not over till it's over. It is not disappointing. Make sure you stay with us. Verts. I don't think you call that an issue. I you <laughs> call that an off and a hit. And a contact. <laughs> and a I'm crash. Yeah. How's that? And I'm surprised they didn't have a pre-assembled right front corner for that thing. You see him now piecing it together. It takes longer. Andrew Marriott is down there, and knowing Andrew, he may be wearing a Pujo fire suit and actually doing some of the work himself. Oh, He's dear. very sneaky that way. Andrew, what do you see? That would be a very good idea. Well, frantic <laughs> French fingers are flinging around here. And uh, they did have a corner waiting, but I had a good look at it. Even the, the steering arm uh, wasn't even tweaked, and I think they probably decided that... Uh, well, I'm just looking to see if that corner... No, I think they have put a new corner on, actually. But uh, a lot of that, they did it so quickly, it all happened in the break. So they are connecting this new corner up. But uh, Alexandra Burtz wandered over with his crash helmet off, had a look at what they were doing, and with a very disgruntled look on his face, then wandered back into the management area at the back of the garage. Alexandra Burtz, all that experience, but even these top drivers, drivers like Burtz,
works with all the Grand Prix he's driven, they can still mis make mistakes when the pressure's on at Le Mans. And Verts, we talked about it earlier, had been the more calming influence when they ha w took the victory, he and Mark Genet and David Brabham in 2009. And this time, I don't know whether it was exuberance or just a little debris on the racetrack. It doesn't matter. The end result is the same. And that was the Peugeot in the tire wall and the damage to that front suspension. Looking at the it's BMW awesome. here, Dirk Mueller. The 56, is it coming in? No, he just... But look at the radiator opening the grill down below uh, the inlets there that are so much the BMW trademark. A lot of grass and debris almost Could be completely rubber too. blocked. Yeah, I wonder if that's what happened to the other car. We saw, I'm not sure what, what was going on with the engine. We saw a big puff of smoke coming out of the, the sister car to that BMW. Looked like one of them has been off down in Indianapolis that was recently. The car that Audi was reported boys. with fluid coming out from the hood. Looked like they were playing with the radiators. The Audi team prepares. The Montpellier has been absolutely magic this week here at Le Mans. 33 seconds in hand over Simon Pagano right now. And still consistently about six tenths to three quarters of a second faster than Pagano each lap and is it because he's taking more risks <laughs> we certainly have seen him do that or is or it because the R18 has really come into its own here in the latter going fuel mileage or fuel mileage or or that the Peugeots have begun to lose what edge that they had we don't know the answer we do know the result right now well we do know one thing he can't stay in for the next five hours so well, there's uh, going to change for day all helmeted up, getting ready to go. So Bourdais will take over what a from great, Pagano. What a, I mean, how cool would it be to win your hometown? Yeah. And that would be massive for Bourdais. And it's not just your hometown. It is Le Mans and all that means. Look at the gravel on yeah, the road from the BMW that was off there in Indianapolis. Trillier comes through that cleanly, but that could be a, an issue coming back later. We saw Burtz with the mistake in Indianapolis, and that was even before that gravel was laid down. So and we have seen so many punctures in the last day with all this gravel that's sharp. The other thing I noticed is the bodywork has not healed itself on the number two alley. And well, uh, it doesn't seem to get much worse, though. The engineers aren't worried about no. it. So no. whatever it is and what we're seeing is is a non-issue for the for the Audi team itself. Uh, and this is not what Trillier wanted. He's caught slower traffic through the Porsche curves. It appears that he's going to pit this lap. He must be able to get over and get in. If you don't get in, it's eight and a half miles around. The chances are, if you were scheduled to come in that lap, you will not make it around another lap. You can't gamble on fuel mileage at Le Mans. The lap oh, is just too up. long to gamble. And now Trillier on pit road. Well, he has put in a stint and a half here. 60K down pit road, a long run down, and uh, Jamie Howe, I'm sure they're set up down in Audi. They know Benoit is on his way in. Driver change this time, or will Trillier stay in the car? It looks like Trillier is going to stay in the car. They are going to help him out a little bit and give him a new drink bottle. He has been in the car for quite some time, but he's turning nothing but competitive lap times. No reason to take him out right now. He has not reached his maximum. They do have a new set of tires ready but I'm not sure that they're gonna put them on fuel still going in right now Brad Keller is knelt down that is the sign it looks like as soon as this fuel is complete they're gonna get truly a back out and underway and not take tires that's exactly what's happened cars fired up and he's out you know, as the car sat there I looked at it a little closer and I believe that the piece that we see loose is only a, a, a suspension cover I don't think it's the nose itself. I think it's a, a, an area about the size of a softball there on that nose that seems to be a little bit loose. And uh, if that is the case, then obviously any handling uh, deficiencies would be minimal that it would cause with just a little bit of turbulence. So perhaps that's why the Audi team not interested in making a change. A little more drag. It just dirties up the arrow a little bit, but not, yeah, not see enough. The, yeah, yep. it's nothing but a hump. That's what I was talking Locking about. Locking her up just yeah. a little bit. That's what I was talking about right there. <laughs> he is getting all of there is to get. Well, now I've changed my mind. I don't know. 
but it doesn't really matter because Trillier is saying, hey, it's not bothering the car, let's run. And in fact, he can't see it. No, he can't see that thing yeah, at all. He can't even see knows it. Our, our camera's on the other side. So once again, if the engineers aren't concerned and the driver doesn't feel it, doesn't matter. Borde talking to the crew. I believe that was Bruno Fenton that he was speaking with, and he'll take over from Pagano. Pagano takes the lead, obviously, when Trillier comes to pit road. Frank Montagny having a word with Borde before Borde gets ready to climb aboard the nine. It'll be interesting to see with this amount of time left, almost five hours to go, when Bourdais climbs in, takes over from Pagano, will they hand Pedro Lamy the car to finish the event? Some feel that Pedro is a little more prone to unforced errors this season than what they've seen in the past, and to cycle him through to be that driver that's in at the checkered flag would be a little surprising to me if indeed the team feels that way as well. So Bourdais getting ready to get in, and that means they're either going to pull Pagano and let him rest and then put him back in and not put Pedro back in for the rest of this event or uh, put him in and, and send him to the checkers. It, it remains to be seen. It remains to be seen. We're just under five hours now left in 24 hours of Le Mans. And without a doubt, you want to put your strongest drivers in at the finish. You're going to let things unfold just a little bit more. They're starting to, now you can see the end of the race. You know, now you can see that checkered flag and start working yourself backwards. And as you get closer and closer, it becomes a little clearer, a little clearer on how you want to play out these last stages and who and which driver is going to be uh, going to work. Right now, Chile, about 23 and a half seconds back from Simon Pagano. Pagano, a pretty good lap that last time, and Chile getting back up to speed. So about eight seconds off of Pagano's pace the last time by. But when you look at the segment times, uh, he was spot on with Pagano through segment two, segment three times yet to be turned in just yet, riding on board with Chile. tippy toe here through the Porsche curves. This is not where he's been doing a lot of tippy toeing <laughs> over the last hour. It was this uh, last portion of the Porsche curves, this left-hander just uh, coming past the karting center off to the right where he was using all of that extra asphalt and almost <laughs> then some uh, to make a couple of passes that we saw there, some spectacular stuff. And while it may not have taken his breath away inside the car, it certainly took our breath away watching it both on board and from outside. Well, he found that little extra road that he could pass on, and once he got realized it was like there. It looks like it goes from black to green yeah. to black again. So yeah. if you're going to commit to going, you need to go all you the way. You need to go all no. the way. And once he found it, you know, then he uses it. Yeah, yeah once you realize, hey, it worked the last it's time, a, maybe I'll do it again. <laughs> it's like that road at Elkhart that comes off the, <laughs> yeah. the blind left tanner. I mean, who doesn't exactly. go over there? Tommy Good Milner legend. in the 73 Corvette, about two minutes right at three minutes behind right now Fisichella he's made up some time Jamie Tommy Milner has now climbed out of the car Antonio Garcia is getting behind the wheel you can see the Corvette crew cleaning off the windshield making sure Garcia has a clear view when he gets out looks like they are going to take a set of tires right now fuel still being put in the car no other work can be done other than just cleaning it up and driver change Motorsports behind me, they just fired up car up on the jacks. Tires going on now, perfectly orchestrated for Corvette racing. They pride themselves on this. They, they do competitions amongst themselves between the two cars. 73 cars, everything going great right now. One gun, two guys, fourth tire on. He's off the jacks, and Antonio Garcia is out of the car needs speed so it doesn't surprise me they're putting tires on it i mean they're going to have to really start running some they, laps. they do they have to run uh, some hard laps it's so like i said it, it seems that tommy miller had closed on fisichella a little bit there in that last segment and it could have been that fisichella was just in the pits as well those out and in laps are absolutely critical if you catch traffic and you got to back off we've seen cars carry big speed out of the porsche curves all the way to pit in if you're not able to do that, you lose valuable seconds. And when you think about it, right now, after 
what, 19 hours and change. We've got the leaders of this race overall only 28 seconds apart. And it's that's just phenomenal when you think about it. The battle in GTE Pro just as close as well. So you can't afford to give up that time on the in laps and on the out laps. You can't afford to give up any time. I don't care if it's in the pits, changing tires, whatever the case might be. They're trying to stretch everything and get every ounce of a performance out of, the can, out, out of the car that they can. But at the same time, if they can run two stints, three stints, four stints on a set of tires, they absolutely will because there's a penalty for that tire change while they're sitting in pit lane. And they're always doing that calculation of lap time compared to do I need the extra performance from that new set of tires or can we go ahead and leave these on? Gain loss. Try to figure out which is going to be more important. The 10 is in. The 908 HDI of tire. Hugh Deshaun X. Yep. Yeah. The absolutely. problem, and you saw the the left front lockup when he came yeah. in, which kind of gives you an idea that the cross weight in the car is off. And the reason it is that right rear Michelin has uh, decided to give up the ghost. Let's go back to the racks on the racetrack. We saw the yeah, BMW with a problem in Indianapolis. The stones out there, like, you know, it's, we've talked about that every year here. These stones and gravel traps are very, very, very sharp. sharp. And I, I remember going out there and doing a piece on it, actually going out in a gravel trap and grabbing some of them. And they're just like knives. Unbelievable. Well, that was you in the think they would have changed it. That was in the rental car, right? You got out. Uh, no. no, that was, a, that was a, <laughs> a different deal. That was a different, different rental car. Yeah, different, rental <laughs> different track, different place. <laughs> now you see, what is, why is the crew member just sitting out of the way or something? Yeah, interesting. Perhaps just trying to stay out of the way of the tire changers and a very quick tire change there as well. You see the crew member as he runs past the rear of the car pulls the air hose. Lucky to get that back with no damage. Yeah. No Off further damage with that carcass flopping around like that. There's the Pescarolo entry as they flash by, as well as the number seven. Anthony Davidson behind the wheel after Alexander Burtz had his issue. So seven car now back on track. And I believe it's still Julian Juice behind the wheel of the Pescarolo running fifth, first in the petrol class, as we call it. We and should be seeing the number nine Peugeot making his way to pit lane, potentially this lap, is by our, at least by our calculations. He should be uh, 270, 275 or 274 right now. And that's 12. There's Julian Juice coming up on I believe it's David Murray right now in the Ford GT for Robertson Racing. Get a good idea of the speed differential between petrol powered LMP1 car and a GTE Pro class car as they flash by. I so sure do like the look of that Ford GT. Yeah. And with the history here yeah, exactly. at Lamar, it just it works. The Maytech works. Fords that ran in GT1 last year were Absolutely beautiful cars as well. And you, know, you go back to the history of this great event and it just seems that that body style, that Ford GT modeled off of the the uh, Ford GT that ran the back GT in the 40. day, the GT40. Um, just an impressive, a beautiful car. Love to see Ford come back with that. I know they're not producing that car currently, but there's been a lot of talk that they may be doing a new design of that car. And it would be perfect to come back here. I mean, the retro look of that car coming back here would be massive. That's what's selling nowadays is retro, retro cars. Retro everything. You know, everything. <laughs> it's kind of funny. The older, we get, yeah. the older we get, the more we like the retro look. Why is that? Well, what worked for right? <laughs> I mean, all these funny little cars they made didn't, didn't do anything. Scott, do you want him to bring back a McCrewer? Uh, no. <laughs> 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 that Thank, <was> you. <laughs> Thank you. Not so much. Thank you. Not so much. <laughs> Never <laughs> really hit well here in the States. Might have no. done good in Europe, but certainly I can tell you that the car I did drive was incredibly fast and fun. Not that I had a street car like it, but the race car was pretty yep. impressive. Well, I think anything that came out of that stable was pretty fast. Both you and Dorsey know that. Jack's pretty hardcore. Yep. <laughs> he hated that little four-cylinder <laughs> turbo, though. <laughs> That's the way he brought in Lee White. And here we go. Our leader's in. See the red mirrors there signifying that that is the nine Pujo. Simon Pagino behind the wheel. Andrew Marriott, will it be Sebastian Bourdais climbing behind the wheel? It most certainly will. I can see his blue 
and yellow helmet hovering. Pagano was already out in going to the back of the garage. And now a lot of pressure on the shoulders of the man who was so successful, of course, in Champ Car over the years, Sebastian Bourdais, the man from Le Mans. His father's raced here as well. Might remember him in the uh, last time we ever saw one of those big thundering painters. It's, it was uh, the father of uh, the man who now sits at the wheel of this number nine car who drove it. The door is shut, the drinks bottle has been changed, the, uh, they're going through the uh, tyre changing sequence now. They can use two guns of course, but not at the same time, so there's a, another gun stationed at the back. And uh, that is the end of the stop, the car accelerates away, and now probably a double stint, maybe even a triple from Sebastian Bourdais, and that can make the difference between victory or second place. And the lead goes back to Benoit Trillier in the Audi, so he'll take back over the point. You know, for Bourdais, his success and what he is known for is his four IndyCar Champ Car Championships four years in a row and disappointment in his Formula One career. You know, he, he tried it and so many people thought he would be successful and yet he struggled. Now, the eight on pit road, the driver change happening there as well. On schedule, as usual, 12 laps. And they're in. Stefan Sarazen climbs out of the eight. Meanwhile, Benoit Chaudier on the racetrack has taken over the point, and Bourdais will be giving chase. And we talk about the disappointment in Bourdais' Formula One career. You know, I, I talked to him at Sebring last year, and he was glad to be out of that Formula One circus. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Back in Champ Car in the IndyCar series, as it is known now uh, this year with Dale Coyne, doing some races with them, trying to help that team and trying to get back into open wheel racing, which I think is one of his true loves. Talk to a lot of the guys who go to Formula One and then come back and not many have good things to say. Now back on track, another Peugeot heads back out, but right now it is Peugeot against Audi, the only two cars on the lead lap right now. Benoit Chulier, Sebastian Bourdais. Four hours and 47 minutes left to go here from Le Mans. It is far from over. Anything can happen. We've seen it so far. We'll see more. Thanks, Krista. I've got to say, guys, she looks a lot better than we do right now at this, <laughs> yeah. at this time of day after the coverage that we've had. Some, what, uh, about 20 hours worth at this point in time. And Krista looks nice and fresh. And uh, quite honestly, Dorsey, you don't. It's I, not I, I fair. don't know how to say that other than no, not so much. It's not a fair world. I think I'm, is my mic working again? And I don't hear no, you. No, you, you sound great. Oh, okay. My ears not. You don't working. look real good, but you sound good. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I've gone deaf. <laughs> That's what it is. Right now, the number nine, Sebastian Bourdais, 58 seconds behind Benoit Trillier, and uh, uh, once again, Trillier really setting the pace about eight tenths of a second faster. Well, we went to break him. Last he was, lap, he was slamming across the curves like it was nobody's he business. He has no problem driving over everything. It'd be interesting. You know, there's going to be a lot of strategy play out these last four and a half hours, four hours and 40 minutes to be exact. We got the few, little different fuel strategies going on. The Peugeots are able to go another lap, solid lap, uh, and that's kind of stretching them out. So there's a good chance that they will have to make one less stop in, in the closing stages of this for this 24 But hours. they're going to have to figure out a way to get Montigny back on the lead lap. Otherwise, it is truly one against one, mono against mono, the two against the nine, because with the problem that Verts had, Davidson now sh being shown four laps in arrears of the leaders, and Montigny one lap behind. Remember, Serzan not able to get his lap back. In fact, it was Trillier who took it back from him. He had actually gotten it at one point in time, and then that daring move by Trillier to get it back, and it has stayed that way ever since. So and their two, penalty. Yeah, and the penalty. So only two cars on the lead lap, one Audi, one Peugeot. And it's still a long way to go. Anything can happen, obviously. But, but you uh, can see the, I mean, when you get down inside that six-hour mark and now we're down inside that 
four and a half hour mark or just over the four and a half mile hour mark you're seeing the end of the race the focus becomes more clear it's very clear and you are realizing what you need to do uh, the engineers are going to work looking at strategy looking at the cars where their strengths are what they need to do even from the standpoint is you know you you'll be start throwing everything at it you might do a little bit of wicker change you might do some bodywork change if you feel like you need you know less drag or, or more downforce you're looking at tire compounds you know what do you need to do do you three stent them do you four stent them are you looking for pure speed there's a lot of issues that are going to play out here in the next four hours and 39 minutes nicholas prost in the rebellion the toyota powered lola heads back out on track he was just in once again that team doing a great job and, and great to see toyota back in sports cars in prototype racing that team doing a great job with both the 12 and the 13. Problems uh, for the 13, but they had a great battle going earlier. Remember, it was the Cuscarolo battling with the two Rebellion cars. 13 has dropped by the wayside. Yeah, Leon had his problems earlier, but uh, right now, Post in the 12. That car was withdrawn after a pretty good crash. Another there. tire down, the another 58 tire. right rear. And this is the 58. How many times have we seen this car with problems today? Obviously, they were involved with Alan McNish right at the very there beginning. There goes the carcass. It's gone now, so it won't do body. Ah, oh, another one. Or wait. Ten. I think, uh, I think oh, this the world is, okay. is showing world some tire is issues. Backing this up, yeah. Yeah, because there's the problem that Farnbacher had earlier. He wow, scared of, me. A lot of flat tires all at once. They don't tell us this stuff is coming, <laughs> so all of a sudden you kind of go, oh, my goodness. Yo! <laughs> Good move there. Tire yeah. issues have certainly been a huge issue here, as we've seen just in the recap right there. And, and I know that, Dorsey, you said it a minute ago, we've talked about it, the rocks on the racetrack, but um, I'd almost like to bring some home from the fans who don't have a chance to come over here and, and give people an idea just how sharp they are. Is that uh, the JMW Ferrari? And they're pulled off. That is not... I think that's a 66 car. This is a mechanical issue. The driver pulled off. Should have thrown it in neutral. And I know, he's got it going. To, uh, yep, indeed it is the 66 He there. probably just got the, the starter going. Yeah, he's, I think you're right. He's got it in gear and he's running on the starter. I think he's got dead engine. And Xavier Mason behind the wheel right now. No relation to Sasha Mason, the Porsche driver that uh, we're so familiar with. And there is another good break. I, I saw I saw you, Scott, shake your head. Another corner worker running across the racetrack. You will not see that in the United States, guaranteed. But uh, Mawson with a problem there. Running further back in GTE Pro category. They had some other problems get earlier across on. the track on the starter mode. Oh, you cannot do that. Please tell me that's not going to happen. I hope not. Mawson sharing that car with Rob Bell and Tim Sugden. Well, as I said, they had some problems earlier. He's right at pit in. On the wrong side of the race, are you? Yes, he is. Be be kidding me! Oh my gosh! This I wonder if it's out of fuel. Right there. Probably not, though, because of, he would have coasted it in. The exit of the Porsche curbs. We saw the crash that Magnussen had there with Felbermeyer Senior. The speed with which they came through. The prototypes even faster at the exit of that corner. And to try to get a car to limp across on a starter motor there, if indeed that's what they're trying to do. That's what they're doing. Uh, to me, is just inexcusable. It is endurance racing. <laughs> yeah, but you don't endanger your life and other people's as well. I'd hate to come along and find somebody running along on the starter motor. The 16 in. There's Andre Loiterer. Oh, uh, it's exciting. Yeah, a little yawn. I'm just going to sit back and relax. Conserving energy. That's, it. That's right, conserving energy. 16, Julian Juice behind the wheel. He'll stay behind the wheel of the Pescarolo. And look at this car, nice and clean, not a mark on it. They've done a good job of uh, making sure that they did not it. a foul. <laughs> yeah. That's what they've done. A little work to do, but uh, by and large, they've had a great run. Currently fifth. He oh, made it. Look at that. He made look it. Look at that. But he's still got a long way to go to get to the pit in. I mean, that's pit in, but to get I to mean, the he's lane. still very much in a target zone sitting oh, yeah. there. And when you've got leaders that may need to come to the pits, that is not a wide pit lane, especially yeah, when you get to that first chicane. I just uh, And the craziness continues. I don't I don't understand it. I know 
several chief stewards uh, back in the States who would not be yeah. pleased by uh, that performance right there. That is for sure. I'd say we got about another four and a half hours of craziness before this is over. 30 cars still under power here at Le Mans. Take a look at some of the graphics, the, the two that stand out, obviously the number one and the number three Audi, who went out in spectacular fashion. The 66 tries to get back to pit road. Benoit Trillier, the Audi team, tries to hold on for a victory. Four and a half hours still to go. Now, well, just a short while ago, Alexander Wirtz behind the wheel of the number seven Peugeot. Problem in Indianapolis and pretty hard contact with the barrier on driver's right. Managed to get the car back to the pits. Just didn't get it turned in, gets up on the dirty line. Bam, big impact there. Not a mistake you see very often. Wirtz out of the car, Davidson in, and Andrew Marriott had a chance to talk with Alexander Wirtz. Andrew? Alex! Pushing hard and caught out by the gravel. Ah, uh, no, uh, got caught out, missing talent on the entry. Ran out of talent. Um, yeah, my first driving mistake since 2008, which I'm not happy about. It's not like you, Alex. Yeah, exactly. I mean, at one point you, you do these mistakes, but I'm really angry with myself again since 2008. Not one time I put the car wrong. And then at this important stage of the race, it happened. So I apologize to the team and my teammates. But we, you know, it's win or spin. Do you think it was down to tiredness? No, definitely not. I, was, I knew what I was doing. I was just pushing it. I missed the entry by 50 centimeters. Not so much. And there was quite a bit of dirt next to the line. And then I lost it. So uh, really a little misjudgment. But I was on purpose pushing it. So c'est la vie. Thanks for your honesty. Thank Thanks for his honesty. Welcome back, Calvin Fish. He's had a little beauty nap. Dorsey Schrader still here. Brian Till. Looking in the mirror, I think they need him. <laughs> <laughs> a bit more. Yeah, they've been accusing me of that. <laughs> Man, incredible honesty from Alexander Wirtz, yeah. and that's what we've come to expect from him. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't expect those mistakes. He doesn't expect them from himself, but it's nice that he stands up and uh, fesses up when he when he does make those mistakes most guys would be happy with not making mistakes since 2008 yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know? he's a really cool guy we've really got to oh, yeah. over the last uh, three years and uh, super bloke one of the best and uh, as we've seen today some of the best do make errors I over think, the course of absolutely. 24 hours I think one of the things that i was particularly good at was running out of talent in the middle of the corner you just probably the punch <laughs> there, <didn't laughs> exactly you knew that yeah was i knew it was coming so i had to defend myself by a little self-deprecating humor. As you see the number two, Benoit Trillier, who has been behind the wheel of the Audi for quite a while oh now, and there we go again. I mean, he, he is, is willing driving. to use every bit of asphalt and more inside, outside, it doesn't matter. Trillier on a mission, about a minute in hand right now over Bourdais. Been launching off curbs, I mean, he did get big air. And that's what he really needs, Brian. If you think about it, one extra trip down pit lane is going to cost you about a minute, a minute plus. So that's the margin he really needs if Peugeot are able to do it on one less stop. And if they are stretching their mileage, one extra lap every yeah. run, that's what it's going to be. It'll be one extra stop for Audi to get to the checkered flag here this afternoon. And all their cars are doing 12 laps now. Mm -hmm. All the Peugeots, and, and of course the Audi still has 11. We saw the 49, the Oak Racing, Oak Pescarolo, with the Judd BMW being pushed into the garage. That's the fourth place car in the LMP2 category being driven by Nicholas de Creme right now. So a problem, obviously, there at Oak, and they'll push that car back into the garage, see if they can get some work done on it. It's still the Zytec of Kareem Oje, the Reeves Racing entry, the number 41, who leads in the LMP2 category. So right now, Oak Racing looking to try to maintain a spot and get a shot at uh, a podium finish, but uh, be going into the garage with four and a half hours to go is not the way to find a step on the podium. On board, that's the 41 right there, the Zytec with the Nissan power plant in it. Indeed it is as Kareem OJ heads down through the Porsche curves. And a lot of people said the Nissan was the power plant to have in LMP2. And right now, holding down the top two spots, both the 26 and the 41 have that Nissan power plant. And then in third, 
It's the level five entry. Scott Tucker and his team, Christoph Bushu, Joao Barbosa holding on to third. And uh, that's uh, quite a feat with the HPD power plant that they really felt was down on power and that the long straights here at Lamal would punish them, but they are doing a good job using good strategy, staying calm, hitting their marks, staying out of trouble to maintain a spot lap in the top three. Guys, this should be a pit stop lap for the Audi. No, I think you do one more. So this Delier. would be 10 laps here. Yeah. On to the front straightaway. Looking back. Oh, 272. Oh, yeah, you're right. Should be one more. Team set up, ready for him the next time by. We expect Andre Lauder to take over and look at this there is the 51 and there is Antonio Garcia and I believe the 51 trying to put a lap right now uh, on that 73 Corvette and that cannot be a two lap he's already one lap up no actually once it's cycles you're right that would yeah, put yeah. him a lap down just just right there on the tail end of it it's been yeah. this way for about the last hour about eight seconds in hand is what Tommy Milner had had before they made the last stop. And uh, you don't want to see that. The leader right there behind you, you're in second place. You need to stay close. Fisichella now breathing down the back of that Corvette. If you can get in front of him, it will be a lap down for sure. And there's the flying lizard Porsche. The outside, the 80 having its problems. But back on track, Lucas Lohr behind the wheel right now. Garcia took on fresh tires, so. That Corvette should be at full potential. Great to see the diversity in the GTE Pro category as well. Corvette, Porsche, Ferrari. Porsche really struggling for speed a bit here. Throw in the Ford GT, the Lotus Evora coming along, the BMWs as well. And the BMWs showing excellent pace here. Just not particularly good luck, although the 56 has worked its way back up into the third position, so a podium in hand right now, but still a long way to go. And as I said, the diversity of my manufacturers is great to see right now in the GTE category. You see Danny Binks on the radio, really acting as a spotter, using the monitors here in place at Lamar to just talk him through, talk him through traffic, tell him where the 51 car is. They realize the importance uh, to have any chance here. They've got to keep him on that lead lap. Still, he's doing a good job. That's a ring guy's duty. Keep your driver up, man. Keep that adrenaline flowing. When that crew chief is talking to you, Dorsey, does it really do the trick? Does it help you? Does it give you that little bit of extra fire that you need? Yeah, it does. It really does. I mean, particularly if you're a little bit on the tired side or whatever, to have somebody like Danny Biggs telling you you're doing good, go for it. You know, you you know you got to stay in front of the you know the, the ferrari and, and not go down a lap but that little encouragement really does because there's somebody behind you it seems to make a difference when you see the passion that's put into the effort here at le mans by all of the team members but when you have a, a team leader like danny binks i mean it really makes you dig deep and the other aspect of this type of racing when you've got teammates is you, you're not doing it just for yourself. You make a mistake, it's just not your mistake. There's a real responsibility and um, that runs deep when you're competing in one of these big events. I was about to say, he'll praise you, but if you do something wrong, he will scold you too. No question about that. Well, and we've seen mistakes made on both sides. The Peugeot with the penalty for the crewman with the visor up. Yeah. That penalty being served by the driver. We saw Alexander Wirtz, the driver, make the mistake, create the penalty for his team and as we talked about it when both of those incidents happen it is very much a team sport sometimes that is forgotten but it takes all the people behind the scenes to make the cars go out on the racetrack and uh, you've got to accept the mistakes that each of those yep. team members makes 11 lap run once again for the two machine yep, so this is the number and Persia have been hitting 12 all day long absolutely and I tell you what, the execution by this number two car has been brilliant here today by the drivers. They've run at a really, really hard pace. All three of them. There's no weak link in that team, which is great because there's no compromise in terms of the strategy of who you put in when. They can all get the job done. He was Trillier to his marks, and Jamie is there. He was 
perfect on his marks. And guys, he's also going to stay in the car. He's getting a fresh drink bottle, but he is going to stay behind the wheel of this Audi. We did think that Andre Lauder was going to get in. He was awakened from his nap, but not going to get in this time by. They do have a fresh set of tires out, but again, looks like no urgency to get ready to put those on. We're going to have to wait and see until the fuel's complete. No other work can be done other than cleaning that windscreen. But Brad Keller down on his knees giving the signal. No tires again for the R18. Boy, I tell wow. you what, that is a heroic effort right there. Maybe they have a seatbelt problem. They won't come on, yeah. on last or I, something. I think that's a, this is a quadruple stint. Yeah, they talk about going up to five. I mean, the stints are slightly shorter this year, so there has been talk about going up to five. And then the driver time, maximum four hours in a six-hour period, really comes into play, which they have yeah. to keep your finger on. But this is great stuff. I mean, uh, not changing tires. It just saves you that time. Of course, fueling has to be done and completed before the tire change. So you're just saving time on pit lane. And that is Bourdais right there in front of Trillier as he heads back on track. And l while we talk about the cars out on track, let's go back to the pits with Jamie. Brad Keller, a sign of relief on your face. This crew, these drivers, flawless so far. Are you surprised at the amount of pressure you're able to put on these Michelin tires? Four cents? No, no. We've done a lot of tests. We've uh, done a lot of 30-hour tests and so forth, and we've pushed real hard before, but it's been a, a heck of a race. We've been, been under a lot of pressure for a long time, so we've got a long way to go. You have kept your driver in behind the wheel for four stints now. I know there's a lot of pressure on this team. What is the strategy moving forward in the closing stages of the race? Well, both teams are trying to do what they can do to uh, to minimize the time in the pit. We're having real good tire wear. Our car is real good on long runs, and so we're we're uh, we're just trying to adjust our strategy to get the absolute most we can out of our tire time. All right, thank you. I know you need to get back to the box. I think that guy was going to give him a kiss there. <laughs> Sneak up on him. Brad Kettler, such a good guy. So open, so honest, so approachable, and so dedicated to racing and to this Audi team. And right now, Sebastian Bourdais has taken over the lead from Benoit Trillier, but at the line the last time, just a second and a half. Trillier absolutely spectacular behind the wheel of this R18. The battle, we knew it was going to be a good one, and when we saw two Audis drop out early, we thought maybe the battle was over. Far from it, it continues to rage yeah, from here at Le Mans. But I, I... while you catch all the action from right here at Le Mans. You can also check out all the extras at speed.com, including video highlights, driver blogs, photo galleries, notebooks, feature stories, and more. So go to the Le Mans section on speed.com and get even more information. We talked a little earlier about back timing and when do you start looking at the end of the race? Well, it's time, just over four hours to go. Calvin Fish is back. He is the master of strategy. He's pulled out his little calculator and begun to do the math. Cal, what do you figure? Well, Bourdais is going to be hitting pit lane here in another couple of laps, and I think at that point he'll need just under six stints to go, which will be five more stops. And after the two cars last stop, they need just under seven stints, so it'll be six more stops. So once we get this last cycle here, so Bourdais uh, made that pit stop, uh, Trulia should uh, retain the lead, or retake the lead, should I say, and uh, then the Audi will need one more stop compared to Bourdais. Now, the delta between coming down pit lane and staying on the racetrack is about 35 to 37 seconds. You're going to need 30 seconds of, of fuel, so you need about a 65-second lead. So we'll uh, go back over this here in about 10 minutes and probably be able to give you a more accurate read. And that's why they've left Trulier in this long is because they're maximizing or minimizing the time they're in the pits and trying to gain that 65 plus seconds needed for that one extra pit stop. He's comfortable. He's fast in the car. He's not making any mistakes. He's getting the job done that you need to have done. Leave him in. Yeah, he's not fatigued, I mean, and the tires are well within their, their limit. And he has Bourdais right in front, three-and-a-half-second lead Bourdais had over Trillier at the line the last time by. So a problem for the 35, that is the Oak Racing entry of DeRocca, Lafarge, and Barlesi. That might be a cut-down tire, too. That car has been limping along there for a while. And there is Bourdais, the red mirrors on the nine, and there is Trillier. 
So really trying to hold on as much as he can, and he'll stay close. And <clears throat> that stop, if he stays that close, will be that minute that we talked about, 35-second run down pit lane, 30-second stop for fuel. If they don't do tires or a driver, which you would not expect the Peugeot team to do, and that then turns into that minute lead if there are no mistakes or no errors. But remember, there was a penalty earlier on the Peugeot crew for not having a visor down. We keep saying it's not over till it's over. The mistake can come from the cockpit. It can come from the crew. But either way, it can cost you the race. I don't think that mistake will happen again. It better not anyway. No. And also traffic laps, remember, we, we saw earlier in this race, the Lauder at the time set the fastest lap of the race at a 3.25. His next lap was a 3.37. That was 12 seconds difference between a big traffic lap and a clear lap. So those are the moments you don't need. You don't need to be making those type of decisions, Dorsey, because you know you've got to get the hammer down. You're trying to get a second per lap on the car that's chasing you, and suddenly a whole stint's worth can go away in one lap. I mean, you gained a second a lap over... Uh, 11 laps and then you can lose that in one go on board with Trillier and we looked up in front it looked like the two Peugeots or perhaps they were going around a lap car but it looked like the two Peugeots were side by side the first one in line was Antony Davidson Davidson in the seven car and then Bourdais and you wonder if perhaps you're gonna let Bourdais get in front of Davidson put a little uh, blocking back in between I don't know if that was indeed the case as Trillier goes through Indianapolis and then he'll head up to Arnage very slow right hand corner that leads you toward the Porsche curves Reinhold Yost looking on, I tell you what, every time one of these Audis hits pit lane, he's always in the background with his stopwatch, just keeping tabs on how the team performs, how it executes, and he's won so many of these races here just on that, the time in pit lane. He believes that is the key to winning here at Le Mans. And that is indeed what has happened. Bourdais has gotten in front of Davidson, as you saw him flash by. Pujo with the red mirrors out in front now. So uh, perhaps a little blocking back there as you see the lights flashing. And oh, that was has pushed wide. That not, was really in the models. Oh. He has not been concerned at all about making those moves about how many times, we said this earlier, Dorsey, yeah, yeah. how many times can he do it and get away with well, it? Once he's learned that he can do it there, but I tell you, that was a close one. He was really loosened up that time. I think he might have got some dirt on the yeah, tires there absolutely. when he went wide, got into that next one, didn't have the grip, but just let, he didn't pinch the car and spin, do you know what I mean? He's got the feel in the car right now. You're really into a rhythm at this stage of the race. You know where the grip level is, and if you feel it's not just biting, you just let it go. You just let it float outside of your normal racing line. And he, yeah. kno he knows where all the racetrack is at the exit of this corner. He's used it multiple well, times See the today. wiggle there, yeah, see the wiggle. wiggle. That's what I was talking about. That's yeah. where it got loose in that dirt. You can see it starting to pick the dirt up off the racetrack and throw it out the bat that right there, there. Was right there's right a great there. save but and that wasn't 35 miles an hour worth of wiggle oh, that's, no. <laughs> that's huge but like you said calvin he's fully in control of that car right now he's got the feel of the car he knows exactly what it's like underneath him. and it's not his first wiggle either three different marks in the gte pro category there the corvette 73 antonio garcia behind the wheel and i think he has lost that lap i think fisichella has gotten around him and no, no, nope, nope. nope. Fisichella is back there he's, in the background, looking at timing and scoring. It shows that lap, but it's hard to see until it cycles through. So Garcia now pulled out a little bit of space, and that is good news for the Corvette camp. It's Fisichella, the third car, back in the background, some distance behind the blue Porsche that you see there. And he's still going to need a caution flag to get this to be in his favor, but as long as he can stay on that lead lap. Yeah, it's all he's got to do. The problem with the caution here is, though, again, we've talked about it many times here today with three pace cars. It's not like you basically yeah. eat up three quarters of a lap just by being on that lead lap. You're only going to get a, a third of a lap. That's if the most you're lucky. you get. Yeah, if you're lucky. If you're lucky. Yeah, you could you certainly get nothing. Yeah, if you're in the same segment that comes out in front of you, then the other guy's right on your yeah. tail. You gain nothing at all. You would have to be. You'd have to time it perfectly, and the safety car would have to have come out behind those three GTs and in front of Fisichella to gain, as you said, Calvin that one-third of a lap. 
That's what uh, the European drivers find hard to uh, really fathom when they come over and do the Rolex 24 at Daytona. The fact that with the caution rules there, you can keep getting those laps back. You just wait for the leaders to pit. You stay out. You gain the lap. You gain the lap. We've seen teams gain multiple laps there this year with those new rules. You can't do that at Le Mans. You've got to really eat it up on the racetrack. You just got to keep chipping away at it and really hope that the other teams have the problems that you had earlier in this race to get back in the game. Sound of the big V8 in the Corvette. It's Garcia, Spaniard heads up towards the Porsche curves. Good stuff. We've ridden with the prototypes through the Porsche curves, ride with the Corvette. Feeling Bourdais, our leader, should be pitting on this lap. Man, I'll tell you what, even with the lack of downforce that a GT car has, and it still has some very good aerodynamics to it, don't get me wrong, but to listen to Antonio Garcia go through there, he was firmly in the throttle, at least through the first portion of the Porsche curves. It shows you just how stable these GT cars are at speed. The BMW, the Porsche right behind him, hanging tough. And once again, great to see the different manufacturers in the GTE battle. And I think when you're at this stage of the race, Dorsey, you're, you're obviously very tired of seeing the 22 car have a quick off there. Doesn't look like any damage. You know, I think that the adrenaline is flowing. Here we see the leader in, but the adrenaline's flowing. You're chasing, you got the hammer down, and I think it gets you through that tired period. And this is where Trillier needs to have that clean lap to see how much of a gap he can get. He needs a little hiccup on the, por on the part of the Peugeot team. Justin. Yeah, I'm not sure that hiccup's going to come as I look. It's very systematic down here. Obviously, getting visibility for the driver is the number one objective in this pit stop from the point of view other than fuel, especially not doing tires. They need to give these guys with that restricted vision through the windscreen as better chance as they can. And they go off very clear. That is actually, in my opinion, slightly quicker than we've seen. They were right on top of it. The, there's a good energy down here. They know what they've got to do. You know, the, the number nine car, they've got a very, very fast Fox chasing that uh, Audi rabbit there. And, uh, you know, it was really, really well put together pit stop. And this is not what Benoit Trillier needs. He's got GT traffic and he has Anthony Davidson right in front of him. It is not what he needs at all. He needed a good outlap while the, the nine car was on pit road. And I don't believe he got one here, Calvin. No, he's definitely got a little bit of traffic. I mean, uh, I think Davidson's going to be able to run certainly at the pace that he needs. But, you know, he may need to clear him. Like you said, you know, when do you start playing the strategy? If you just say, OK, the seven is now out of the mix for the win, you're going to be the team player. If you can, run at a pace where the two car can't get by you. But if you can just keep them down at our pace or even slow them down below the number nine car's pace, maybe you can be a factor still for Peugeot. That's pretty easy to do, too. I'll be honest about it. Now, Frank Montagny in the eight car, the eight number, or number eight Peugeot on pit road as well, being serviced. And Chilier, with Davidson in front of him, wants either Davidson to light it up and go away, or he needs to get past him. Story still to be told from here at Le Mans. The strategy really beginning to play out right now. And even though Peugeot has only one of their cars on the lead lap, they've got two in position to help with the outcome here of the 79th running, the 24 hours of Le Mans. Audi with only one car left, trying to hold on. They want to take yet another victory. We'll be back to more Le Mans action right after this. Stick around. Right at four hours to go from the Circuit de la Sarthe, the Le Mans France, the 24 hours of Le Mans, the 79th running of this great event and from the drop of the green flag, and we knew it would be this way. It has been Audi versus Peugeot, the four rings versus the Lion, the new R18 versus the new 908. And when you look at the cars, very similar as far as turbo diesel, but a very different approach to the 3.7 liter power plant. That's right, Audi utilizing the V6 and uh, Peugeot using the V8, talking to both camps. There's uh, 
definite reasons why they went that way. We spoke to Bruno Firmino about the V8. He said, well, it's a lot more similar to the V12 we are running, so it wasn't really a revolutionary engine design. We felt comfortable with that. You talked to Audi. They went with a clean sheet of paper. They just felt that with the air restrictor has to run through. They wanted to save weight with the V6. And uh, certainly both cars are performing pretty similar. I think it's really the aero factor as to why they're getting slightly different lap time. Audi seems to have the pace in terms of having the fastest lap time, but the Peugeot is definitely quicker down the straightaways. I think I just saw moisture on the lens of the camera. They had called for some showers a few days ago throughout the night. We didn't see those in the last weather report that I had heard was, well, perhaps late in the afternoon. Certainly a little bit of moisture on the lens of the camera there. I think one of the big changes, though, this year for the drivers in the Audi, not just the, the coupe, but a six-speed gearbox as well. And they yeah. had been used to a five-speed in the R15 and the R15 Plus and the R10 as well. And that extra gear is something that they had wanted for a long time. But I think perhaps this 3.7 liter power plant just a little more suited to a six speed gearbox. Certainly no, no shortage of torque or horsepower in the uh, in the engine previously in the R15. Yeah, when you spoke to, when we spoke to Ralph Jutner earlier in the week about that, he gave us a great walk around the car. He said, why the six speed? He said, really, if you look at it and uh, think about it on paper, there is no reason for it but the drivers push really hard <laughs> and uh, he said when you get into traffic it can certainly be a factor with a massive torque they believe that that power plant should work well with just the five gears but uh, they've gone with six and uh, the drivers love it they think it gives them more drivability more options obviously jamie Number 73 Corvette has come to a stop. Antonio Garcia will stay behind the wheel right now. The crew working to clean off the windshield. They also cleaned off the headlights. Fuel going into the car right now. It does not look like they're going to take tires there. Ooh, they might actually take tires. Nope, not going to take tires. Number 73 back out. Antonio Garcia trying to hold on to Tony V. Lander, not let that Ferrari get too far ahead. Anything can happen. Remember, we had a report in the middle of the night the 51 may have a gearbox issue. That seems not to have cropped up, or perhaps they, they're just dealing with it. And with just under four hours to go, anything can still happen. We've had problems. Flying Lizards had an electrical issue. Um, they got that sorted out and got back out, but they lost time, and it can happen to anyone. So still a long way to go. When you think about the sprint races, that we run here in the American Le Mans series for these types of cars, two and a half hours, two hours, 45 minutes. We have more than just a normal sprint race, and we certainly know that problems can arise in those. So still a long way to go from here at Le Mans. Meanwhile, Trillier trying to bring Audi a victory, and uh, a little, from time to time, just a little bit of moisture as he works past some of the traffic, a GT car, an LMP2 car, and right now Davidson not a factor in holding him up, but uh, that GT traffic is just a minute and change, a minute 1.8 seconds Julier had in hand over board A, and he's gonna need a little bit more than that, Calvin, I think. Uh, if you start looking towards the end of this race, he's going to need a little bit more than that. He wants to still be there to battle for the checkered flag. Yeah, just sort of like looking at the numbers again, Brian, since the last round of pit stops for the number nine car, I believe that the two car and the essentially needs since his last pit stop, 6.7 stints. So just shy of seven full stints to get to the checkered flag. That means he needs to stop six times to do that, of course, because he's got fuel in the tank right now. For the number nine, 5.8 stints, the fact that they're getting 12 laps a run, so he needs five more stints. Stops. And a pit stop just for fuel should be, uh, I'd say, about a minute 10, somewhere in that region, 70 seconds. And right now the margin is 61 seconds last time they crossed the stripe. So Trillier certainly needs to gain on the nine car a little bit more to get that buffer that he needs. Then what's going to come into play is when do they need to take tires? You know, again, your back time, not only fuel, but also tires that you can put on and get to the checkered flag. And, of course, one of the hindrances to gaining that time is right there in the seven car. Anthony Davidson running fourth right now. He is the lowest placed of the factory Peugeots. He could very well be that sacrificial lamb, run just fast enough to stay in front and hold him up. He's going to take him deep into this break zone. Watch this. Andy Davidson is not going to give this up easy. 
And Trillier oh, needs to be careful. Right he is going to do that, Brian. This is where Trillier needs to be really, really careful because Davison will be given the mantra, do not let him buy. Just be aggressive. Don't take him out, but he's not going to open the door for him, Brian. But Pujo has nothing to lose. Davidson has nothing to lose. If perhaps they got together, both cars were damaged, would elevate Board A to the lead. And we go back now in this situation to having multiple cars on the racetrack is a much better option. Audi down to one. We've chronicled the problems that Mike Rockefeller, Alan McNish have had. And for Pujo, it's been a pretty much a flawless run. Bourdais, the only Peugeot on the lead lap with Trillier, but Montigny and Davidson still out there in the sister cars, the seven and eight, and they can have an impact on the outcome of this event. Yeah, and I think that's why Dr. Ulrich there is very, very thoughtful. He's deep in thought there because he knows that right now they do not have the margin they need with the extra pit stop that is uh, needed. And uh, we're getting an update on whether they're in Le Mans. There is definitely potential for some showers there over the next couple of hours. So, uh, as we say, there is a long, long way to go in this one yet. Well, now, and think about this. We've talked about the R18 being new and uh, the fact that the Peugeot camp since 2007 has run a closed cockpit car. Many of the Peugeot drivers used to driving that coupe in weather conditions, in rain. Audi drivers not. They're used to the open cockpit cars, the R15, the R15 Plus. So if we get weather, it'll be interesting to see how the drivers adapt. The battle continues to rage as it has since the drop of the green. Right now, the hand is played to Benoit Trillier. He leads minute and three second lead over Sebastian Bourdais. Still a long, long way to go from here at Le Mans. Definitely beginning to see moisture on the lens of the camera and on the windscreens of some of the cars here at Le Mans. I mean, if you don't think that the racing here is exciting, if you think endurance racing is boring, take a look at some of the battles over just the last hour or so. It has been intense. It's been like a sprint race. No holes barred, every bit of road being used, and perhaps that's why we see a message at the bottom of the timing and scoring screen seeing team manager, team two, report immediately to stewards as Trulier been using too much of the racetrack for the stewards' liking. That is possible. We saw uh, Jimmy Bruni get a similar warning, uh, warning for exceeding the track limits, as it was called, and uh, that had just gone up on the ACO website as well, that the two team manager has been asked to report and we'll certainly give you an update on that well you see right there a couple of raindrops on the lens of our camera so why don't we head down to the pits and our favorite weather reporter jamie howe <laughs> Weather reporting is one thing I've never done, but I can confirm that there is rain coming down. Right now it's still very light. I can't imagine teams coming in to switch to intermediates just yet. But looking at the radar, it is coming. There's a whole band of rain that's making its way here to Lama. So we're going to all have to stay alert for that because it could get exciting. And you're going to need to make another pot of coffee and make sure that you're completely caffeinated there at home so that you can stay awake. Why would you even think about falling asleep through this? It is far from done. And there are a lot of stories we keep saying yet to be played out. And uh, this one is a good one. I, I'm anxious to hear what the stewards want to talk about to uh, the, the two team. I think with this rain coming, we need your best Caddyshack impression, Brian. <laughs> Let's see, I'd, I'd go ahead and play through. I don't think the heavy stuff's gonna come down for quite a while. <laughs> so there you go, there's my best Caddyshack yeah. Im impression. And we, you have to wonder, there's a lot of uh, politics in play here. Maybe Persia have been complaining about the road that Mr. Lauder, uh, Trillier, and everyone else has been using. DCH, as he's called. Adam Haynes, the engineer, has now uh, walked over to assist with the two car. They've got a lot of experience there in the Audi camp. Lauder is suited up and ready to get in. Heard Jamie say Lauder is suited up and ready to get in. Dr. Ulrich walking back over to the garage and look at the moisture on the windshield. That's through Molson Corner. And as Jamie said, not enough moisture yet to put rain tires on, but it is enough to begin to change the complexion of the handling of these cars. And at some point in time, what do you do as a team? They do have intermediate tires and they do have two different types of rain tires, but 
at this point in time, a hot slick, I would think. And we're far from needing a rain tire. Yeah. Uh, the drivers are just going to have to deal with grip conditions going away because right now a hot slick is going to be better than any other tire option that they have. Yeah, absolutely. Right now it's definitely still slicks, but uh, they do have options. They have two rain tires. They have like a monsoon tire, which is a heavy block tire. If we get heavy, heavy rain, which we're not anticipating, there's a normal wet, there's an intermediate, and then they can basically hand groove anything from there. They can take that intermediate, put more grooves into it. They can take a, a slick and, uh, you know, put some grooves in it. And the gap right now between the leader and Bourdais is a minute seven, and uh, that's getting pretty close to the margin that they need, but it's a bit too close for comfort. They're going to try and increase that. So Trulier is doing a great job here. He's uh, managed the pressure very, very well and hasn't put a foot wrong. I notice slippery or debris flags by the corner workers as Trulier came through the Porsche curves. Justin, what's going on? Well, I have had that uh, experience out there where in the pits they're saying to me it is not really raining, Justin, and out <laughs> at the back I'm saying, well, at 215 miles an hour, believe me, it is raining. Um, this is a, where the sort of symbiotic relationship and trust between the driver and his engineers really comes into play because it is a huge t uh, sort of geographic uh, footprint that the track covers so the the worst weather is the one we're getting right now which is a very slow crawl of low hanging clouds with a little bit of condensation and what you'd rather have is a storm blow through so it gets the whole circuit wet and clear out the other side and it makes it very hard because at the speed they're going the truly a off track there you saw the car twitched because it was probably a little damp where he was out having overtaken a, a slower car and he goes out wide and then he's getting an off track excursion so Bear that in mind, guys. The track is so large that the, the team are in, uh, in control with all the information because they have the radar. The driver's feeling it through his hands. I also want to want make a quick mention about the protest. Very funny. Chatting with one of the Audi guys over the week whose job last year, he made 27 trips to race control to lodge protests <laughs> for Peugeot. Uh, but, of course, it meant he had to go past... He had to walk past Peugeot every time. He said it, he kept on expecting at some point they were going like, to have security to stop him because they knew where he was going. Whereas, of course, when Peugeot go to protest Audi, I mean, for whatever infraction, they just it's like a constant nagging that they do to race control. Audi can't see them heading up there. So uh, it's quite funny. Audi, you know, this poor bloke is the most harangued man in the, in the paddock. He has to walk past all the uh, Peugeot guys on his way to protest them. Uh, but, of course, as you know, protests don't always result in any action. It's just like they wear down the race control, the race director at some point. But bear in mind that rain is going to be pretty tough out there. Uh, even it makes the drivers more on edge. If it, does, if it doesn't have a physical effect, it makes you mentally very stressed. Two car could be in this next lap, Justin. And uh, we've just got some updates on the medical side. We obviously had some major crashes here over the last 20 hours or so. Uh, Felbermeyer Sr. supposedly has concussion, but mainly OK. Uh, Rocky is going to be kept in the hospital, heavily bruised with a cut arm he is also okay and we also got word from Audi that uh, McNish has been in their hospitality area since his crash so uh, good news all the way around when you look at the severity of those accidents this weekend very good news indeed it sounds to me like you need to have a Washington DC lobbyist on your team if you want to come run over here so they can go lobby race control we've seen some umbrellas popping up uh, from the fans on different parts of the racetrack and as Justin pointed out, this racetrack is so long, covers such a large geographic area, you could have heavy rain literally on one end of the racetrack and completely dry on another. So you do have to rely on your team, your spotters, the information that they have for you, and they have to rely on the information that the driver then passes along to them. Right now, drivers have nothing to do other than just deal with some conditions that uh, may not be ideal on the racetrack right now. I agree with Justin. You'd rather have it rain hard so you know definitively yeah. uh, what the conditions are. The changing conditions make it really tough as we're watching some replays here of uh, various prototypes. We saw the leader there. It's in the 41. That's the leader in LMP2. That's your leader in GTE Pro, the 51 Ferrari, and GTE Am, the Corvette of Larbor Competition. Julian Canal behind the wheel of the 50 right now. Here he comes, 11 lap run, so that is consistent, unless they got something up their sleeve, and I can't imagine they've gone this long without utilizing it now. It is 11 laps for Audi consistently. Benoit Trillier behind.
behind the wheel. And uh, Jamie, I know you're down there. I got to believe it's going to be a driver change this time around, I would think. It certainly is going to be a driver change. Andre Lauderer is going to get in. We also knew that they were going to take tires this time. The guys are ready. Gives them a pat on the back, says, go ahead, go get him. Andre Lauderer getting in the car now. I spoke with Andre earlier in the week, and he said that this car is much more mentally exhausting than the R15 was, but it does level out a little bit because it's easier to drive. So they are able to still spend a lot of time behind the wheel of the car. We just saw Trulier do four stints. Fuel is done. Car is going to go up on the jacks now for four new Michelin tires. Those tires coming off just did four cents. That's unbelievable on a track like Le Mans. A lot of work has gone into this, especially with the larger front tires this year for the Audi and the Peugeots. It's a purpose-built race tire. You can see how large it is. Perfectly orchestrated. One gun, two guys. Tire on, off the jack. out and you see Bourdais flash by in the number nine Peugeot and you know, wonder if to a guy like Andre Lauderer who's won two championships in the Japanese Super GT uh, division that uh, this closed car is not that big of an adjustment obviously the cockpit a little bit smaller but he is certainly used to that uh, the tight confines of a closed car and those Super GT cars in Japan are high-tech machines indeed the only other issue with Lauder, it's been said from time to time, he lets his emotions kind of get the best of him. That's not what you want in the late going. You want a nice, calm head, but he has been blazingly fast behind the wheel of this number two Audi. That is for certain. Look at that, Brad Ketlin, the whole crew just giving Ben big cogs all the way around. Tremendous job. His work is probably done for the day, but I tell you what, with 340 on the board, I don't think this set of tires that they just strapped on is going to go the rest of the distance. They'd really be stretching it to a fifth stint if they do that so um, I think we're going to see another set of tires thrown at this number two car before the end even if we stay dry and don't be switching to the wet tires so Benoit Trillier has handed over the controls of the number two Audi to Andre Lauder. What can Lauder do with Bordet? What can Bordet do against the Audi? We'll find out. Make that other pot of coffee and stick around. Back at Le Mans, Sebastian Bourdais leading over Andre Lauderer right now, but we do expect to see Bourdais on pit road here in the next few laps. Lauderer taking over controls from Manuel Trillier, who we put in a spectacular run, and uh, some of the daring moves that he utilized to build the gap that he needed were, uh, I mean, feats that if Audi does not come away with the victory, he still has absolutely nothing to regret as far as his driving goes. He did everything within his power and perhaps a little bit more. Maybe that's why we saw that uh, message at the bottom. But for Benoit Trillier, what a fantastic job. Jamie? Benoit Trillier doesn't even look tired. You have a smile on your face. Fantastic stint. How exhausting was it? Yeah, it was long was hard and I just woke up a few minutes before I jump in the car. I just had time to just dress and uh, jump in the car and honestly to jump in the car in that situation it's not easy and uh, especially because I was in between the Peugeots in the same lap and to wake up was I had really to push myself and then finally it was okay. I'm not good at the morning normally but this morning was not that bad. <laughs> Le Mans has a tendency to do that to drivers. Do you feel like you're carrying a lot of the weight of Audi Sport on your shoulders when you were in the car for four stints? Yes, but I try to don't think about it because if I think about it, I give a steering straight away to my teammates. <laughs> we do see some rain out on the circuit. Is it getting worse in other areas? Uh, it was a little rain around, uh, all around the circuit, but it was not that bad. We still have grip, just have to be careful a bit, but uh, it was fine. I'm sure you want to go sit down. Good job. Thank you. It's fantastic, as I said, and nothing to be ashamed of. That is for certain. If Audi does not come away with the victory, it was not because of a lack of effort on the part of Benoit Trillier. Some of his uh, passes there of lap cars, his pass being passed by Stefan Serzan and then taking it back to make sure that that Peugeot stayed a lap down. 
uh, with just absolutely spectacular driving and uh, win or lose, uh, I'm sure we'll be seeing those highlights for quite a while. Yeah, it's been awesome stuff. And uh, just to really give you an indication that the track still has grip, Lottery just did a 327, which is only a couple of seconds off the fastest lap of this race. So this track still has grip and you can see those sprinkles on the windshield, but with the tire temperature, the track temperature, you need a bit more drizzle, really, before it really starts to affect grip and lap time. You've got to be careful on the painted curb, stuff like that. That can certainly catch you out. But in terms of the black top, the grip is still there at the moment. First flying lap for Lauder. He was about 10 and a half seconds behind Bourdais. That uh, lead by Bourdais has been cut to four and a half. And we know that Lauder will then retake the lead when Bourdais comes to the pits. Uh, based upon your calculations, Calvin, I think you're looking at least a minute and 10 seconds is what you want to have in hand to be side by side there on that final stint. So uh, the more out he can get, the better off they're going to be. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be really, really tight. And we have to factor in maybe the Pursuit can do it on just one more tire stop. Whereas I believe Audi are going to need two. So you've then got to add 20 more seconds yeah. there. Yeah. And, the, and then, of course, the strategy is, you and I were talking in the break, what does Audi have that Michelin is providing as far as compounds that they can utilize? Do they have a compound that's a little bit softer that they could run for only a double stint at the end that would be fast enough to make up for putting that compound on? You know, you're going to lose time when you put it on. You need to make sure you can gain that time back and even more. Do they have those compounds? We don't know. No, and, uh, you know, as Brad Kettler said, they've done numerous 30-hour runs, and uh, they've been working really hard with Michelin to really, you know, find the right tires for this car. We talked about the fact they've gone to the wider, bigger front tire this year, and uh, that's really been a learning curve for them. So they will have all of the data, and they'll know what they need to do, and if they need speed, the fact is then if you go to a softer tire compound, how many stints can you then do with that? So you've really got to divvy up the pie here with what's left in this race, make the right calls. But I think the fact that there's rain is in the area may factor into that. They're going to really try and wait. You know, I think he's got six stints left, five stops for the number two car. And you'd think that you'd go triple, triple. But if there's rain in the area, you may extend that, do a quadruple thing. that, Or maybe we're going to have to throw some intermediates at it anyway. So let's keep him on these tires for as long as we can. Not like it wasn't close enough and interestingly interesting enough. We bring weather into the equation now as well. Five and a half seconds now. So Lauder lost a little bit. We saw him in traffic there and that cost him a second. Every second gained or lost here is important indeed as Lauder heads into the Porsche curbs. Borde just up in front some five seconds or so. And there he is, not even five seconds. So Lauder now, once he's cleared the traffic, really beginning to cut in yeah. to Bourdais' lead. You can really tell from the dynamic of the car, almost like the body language of this car, that Lauder is hustling. He is really driving hard, and I think that's the directive that he's been given. You've got to push, 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 get everything you can. Don't take chances in traffic. As we've seen, that's certainly gone wrong for Audi today with their two other cars. but. When you've got clear track, you've got to maximize your lap time. And he has a rabbit as well, and his rabbit hung up with GT traffic at just the wrong place. We've seen passes made through here, and he gets past the BMW relatively cleanly. A little hold up there just at the beginning of the Dunlop Bridge. He gets through. Now it'll be Lauder's turn to see if he can slip alongside before they head to Terre Rouge and on to the ball to, I think. Yes, yeah, indeed he, he does. Yeah, and, and, and they can be the brakes, just the, the timing, the rhythm. You'll have some laps where you just can't believe you catch the guys in all of the wrong places, and then you'll have another lap. It's just like the, the sea just parts for you, and there you go. And uh, these are the brakes that you can get. Typically, there's an ebb and flow to it. You'll gain some laps, you'll lose on others. But right now, Lotter is having a really good run. Really good run. He's worked his way through the traffic, closed on Bourdais substantially. At the line the last time we talked about the gap closing, it went from five and a half seconds to 1.7 second lead for Bourdais, and that's beginning to close down even more, I think. And that is good news for Audi, but still a long way to go. Now, right under three and a half hours left here from Le Mans. So Bourdais leads up ahead. We're on board here with Lauder. Bourdais leads, and we think he has the pit within the next two laps. 
Traffic once again. GT traffic looks like the 51. That's the lead in GT Pro. Look at that. Pro. Oh. I tell you what, that 51 car has not been doing these prototypes any favors at all. We've seen it several times. We saw it with VLander on a restart coming out of Tet Rouge. They're just using up all of the road. They can see them coming, but they've just got kind of the mantra that we're going to use all of the road we need to get our lap time. Watch this. You would think that it'd see him and give him a lane. He doesn't. He just runs the car all the way out to the edge saying, you're going to have to slow up a little bit and go to my left. And that's Vlander behind the wheel of the 51 right now as well. And look at Ulrich. Yeah. Dr. Ulrich, come on, come on. Yeah. Pay He's attention. Saying, come on, you got to give us some room. And uh, Vlander's under no pressure right now. I mean, uh, you know, they, ha they have a lead, but they can't afford it to give up too many seconds here. The Corvettes are chasing them hard. Looks like Corvette able to close down on Vlander. It was a minute and 20 seconds, so that is a much, much improved position for the Corvette. Vlander has been into the pits recently, but uh, that, that is closed down. That is good news for Corvette. Still a shot at, like we said, a long way to go. And Dirk Mueller in the BMW hanging on to a podium position right now, running in third. They are a couple of laps back, but uh, once again, they'll put their head down, run their pace, do what they can do, and just see how the chips fall. Look at this at up the ahead. Look at hours. that. That was pretty hairy there. Porsche curves and you, oh, now this is the, where you can make up time or you can lose yeah. a tremendous amount. Got to be look careful. At look at that. Oh. Look at that. Look at that. Here is comes he Trillier. Get Bourdais now got a really poor run there through the Porsche curves with the traffic. Question is, Bourdais got one more lap and what the team will be doing for Lotterer, sorry, I got the drivers mixed up there. It's Lotterer now behind the wheel, obviously, of the Audi. That He'll be getting radio communication. They should be telling him when they expect Bordet to pit, which I think is on the next lap. Don't risk a low percentage move right. to get by He's when gonna you know be that gone. car is going to be coming in. He can go cleanly, and he lets you have it go. But if it's risky, don't throw it all away. I'm sorry, you said if he lets you have it? Well, you know, <laughs> but Bourdais knows he it wants as to well. win the race. Yeah. He needs to win the race. So I mean, Bourdais is not going to trade paint with him, I don't think, and right. throw it all away. He is really in a very good position, uh, too. I mean, this is really, really close. The way things are shaking down right now, they're literally going to be seconds apart at the checkered flag if they maintain their pace and they maintain the same fuel strategy. We're talking about literally seconds at the end of 24 hours. 20 and a half hours in the books right now. Did you think it would be this close at this point? Well, it, we knew it was going to be a thriller. Do you know what I mean? Had all of the makings with the pace that both cars have had throughout the course of the week, but you never know what's going to happen when we lost the two Audis here. We're looking at a replay there of the traffic on that previous lap coming through the Porsche curves. Bourdais was stymied, but he positioned the car well enough to say to um, Lauder, don't think about it. And then at that point in time, Lauder hung up behind the Ford GT there in the chicane. So there is this ebb and flow that we've talked about with traffic. It was Bourdais hung up by the GT Porsche, and that time Andre Lauder lost a little bit because of the traffic in the chicane. Yeah, I, I, I think Lauder needs to be more careful around the other two Peugeots than he does this one. I mean, because I don't think Bourdais is going to no, throw it away. I agree. I agree. This is the battle for the lead. The other two Peugeots somewhat blocking cars that are out there right now. They can use them for strategic purposes, but for Sebastian Bourdais, he has a very real shot at taking home what is his country's biggest sporting event. That is for certain the Indianapolis 500, if you will, of Europe. Take a look at just how close this is. The Lauder are coming out of the chicane right up behind you. Coming out of the second chicane there. V-Lander just uses all of the road. And I think the protocol should really be, if the guy knows he's there, and I think you see there, Dr. Ulrich is saying you should move over to the left and leave the lane for the faster cars. This is going to be a, a wild one. Uh, we anticipate Bourdais, if he's on a 12-lap run, to be pitting at the end of this lap. We haven't seen anything any different to this point. Does Peugeot have something up their sleeve? Can they stretch it to 13? In Indianapolis, oh, oh Lauder yeah. forces his way through. He's got to be careful there. There's he's no grip in that corner. you got to be so careful if you stuff it down the inside of Arnage. 
You saw Bourdais make it past the traffic into Arnage, and Lauder just said, I've got to go. I've got to go. I cannot let him get away. 1.6 seconds at the line the last time. He knows he's going to have the speed through the Porsche curve. This is where the Audi really excels here. There's a little bump there on entry, and then through here, it's got more downforce. It's got more grip. He's going to close this gap to Bourdais, and then he's going to look for Bourdais to pit, and he wants to be basically on his tail, on his gearbox, wow, as Bourdais peels into the pit lane. Two or three car links at least through the second right-hander of the Porsche curves, then a couple more through the left-hander. Look at him close. The R18, absolutely magic through the high there speed cornering goes. sections. Bourdais to the pit. Bourdais to the pit, and that's exactly what he needed to do. That is exactly what Lauder needed to do. If you can't pass him, be as close as you can. So when he pits, you then have clear road ahead. And it's now go time for Lauder. He needs a clean lap. He needs to build that lead. Justin Bell down at Peugeot. Absolutely. Can I tell you what was spectacular? I was being asked, are they coming in? I was listening to Calvin. There was no way to know. Nine seconds later, all the tires and all the mechanics came from the back of the garage. It took them nine seconds to set up in pit lane for Bourdais to come in. You know, obviously, the front windscreen being cleaned, front lights being cleaned, fuel going in, great tension here at Peugeot. Watching them, obviously, every drop of gas they need to get in there. Bourdais motionless behind the wheel. The guy with the lollipop got it ready, and it, his cars fire and take off in one fluid motion. What a fantastic sight. But don't you like that, Calvin? I was standing in their garage, and I promise you that when they entered the Porsche curves, there was no indication that they were going to come in. And obviously, that is down to the fact that they don't want the live feed to be shown to Audi. And nine, within nine seconds, they were set up in the pit lane. What an operation. The game is on back on track right now. The battle intensifying. Jackie Ix having a conversation down there as well. There's a look at the pit stops. 26 for Audi Sport Team Yost, 24 for Fujo. The battle still rages on. Thanks to Brian Till. We'll hear from Brian a little bit later. Good morning, folks. Lee Diffie back with you alongside Calvin Fish and Justin Bell and Greg Kramer working pit lane. What a race to the end we have in the 2011-24 hours of Le Mans. And the number 10, Orica 908, Peugeot 908. Not lying down just yet either. Loic Duval is in the top six on their comeback trail. The next car on their list is the petrol powered number 16 of Henri Pescarolo. Hugues de Schoenhack versus Henri Pescarolo. <laughs> A terrific French battle right there. Yeah, and you know that Hugues de Schoenhack has not been the race they are anticipating. We saw the damage to the car in the middle of the night, cost them valuable time. And uh, they expect it to be nibbing at the heels of the factory diesel cars, but. Behind a petrol car still, they're going to try and chase that down, and uh, that would be somewhat of a result, and really ultimately the position that they were thinking they would end up with, because this new technology, the cars that from last year, the 908 with the 5.5 liter diesel power has been heavily restricted and really is not able to run at the pace of the new cars. And that is the fight right there. There's the Pescarolo. There is the Orica 908. That is four position. All right, the nervous pace begins. Back and forth listening to the communication between the engineering department, the guys and girls on the wall for the two. Meanwhile, this man here who's used to life in the fast lane, Andre Lotterer in Japanese Super GT and Formula Nippon. He's never been in a situation like this at Le Mans. No, he hasn't. And I think what's good, Lee, he's really got a directive. You've just got to get as much lap time out of that car as you possibly can without taking any chances in traffic. And I think that allows you to just focus and you have one goal. You're not being too conservative. You don't get out of your rhythm. You're just really hammering that car. And the car's performed beautifully, as we can see from the lap times. He's just run laps in the 326, 327 range. That's a second off the fastest lap of this race. So the grip is still there. The car is working well. It's got to be a lot of fun, even though you're tired. And this won't really be a fair fight here. Henri Pescarolo knows that his car will be swallowed up there for that top five spot by Hugues de Schonac. Good to see the RML P2, the uh, HPD still circulating after all of its woes throughout the night. 
Yeah, it hasn't been an easy day, but uh, they keep battling on, and uh, the P2 division is certainly a good battle. It's great to see the HPD-powered number 33 level 5 machine having such a great run, currently in third spot. That would be a real victory for that team to bring that new technology here and uh, stand on the podium for the first time. As we watch Loic Duval get even closer to Emmanuel Collard and Hugh de Schonach, the man behind Orica. Well, top five, if he can say that, that might bring some relief. It is not the result that he was hoping for. And there he goes. He's chasing him down. Clears the RML car. Now he's going to be right on the tail of the Pescarolo of Collard. And there's something a little bit extra in it for Peugeot as well to say they filled four of the top five places with Peugeot power. Four of the top five, the top spots yet to be determined. That's right. <laughs> yeah, four of the top five is good as long as you've got the win. Second through fifth will not be the result that Persia were looking for coming into this race. And you'd have to think when they saw the crashes of McNish, Rockefeller, they thought this one should be ours. R Audi are running out of ammunition, but that two car to this point with just over three hours to go. It's really had an awesome run. It's had a run that you have to have here now with the amount of competition to win this race. They've executed, they've had no problems whatsoever, no contact with the drivers on the racetrack. Perfect. French and German teams, obviously, Peugeot and Audi fighting for the outright win. However, French teams well represented right down through the order. And there you go, Collard into the pits. So the position is handed over quite easily to Loic Duval. Top five moves the number 10, Orica 908. And just a very subtle, gentle nod from Hugh de Schonach. Okay, that was made a little bit easier. We'll take that spot and move on. The Labra competition team well represented. They had two cars in GTE Am, and they run first and second with a split strategy. One Porsche, one Corvette. Good going from those boys. We'll tell you about some other positions when we come back on the other side. In many ways, these closing three hours, these closing minutes, are more torturous than the rest of the race. Especially when you're in the position of being up front, like the 51 AF Corsa Ferrari, the combination of former F1 Grand Prix winner, Giancarlo Fisichella in excess of 200 Formula One Grand Prix. And that pressure is mounting. Ooh, look at this. Tight. This is tight for Andre Lotterer and the number eight Peugeot of Frank Montagne, who did him no favours. He didn't do any favours whatsoever. And there you think about it. Our team tactics coming into play. We've thought about it. We thought the issues would be with the other two Peugeots, not the number nine. I think the number nine is going to give them a good, clean fight for the eight and the seven. What have they been told? Wow. We are really seeing what Peugeot's tactics are here. Montagne is putting that number eight Peugeot 908 all over the track in front of Andre Lotterer. And Lotterer needs to keep pushing. He has to keep pushing. He needs to get that gap up a little bit further to have enough cushion if he needs an extra set of tires compared to the Peugeot. And for those of you who may be just joining us to explain that number eight car is not vying for the lead, it's not vying for the win. Yes, there's still three hours to go, but at the moment it's not on the same lap as Andre Lotterer, the man behind him. However, the fight is between its sister car, the number nine of Sebastian Bourdais. So Montaigne in this car ahead is doing everything to distract and disturb and to frustrate Andre Lotterer. We saw Davison take him in really deep into the break zone. That was Trulier yeah, behind the wheel at the time. This is where he's got to be careful. He has to be careful. He has to be patient. Yes, he's got to get his lap time, but he can't afford to throw it all away. There is the only Audi bullet in the gun right now. Lotterer needs to be careful. Montagny is going to be aggressive. That call would have gone out on the radio. Be decisive, get it done, but be careful. And it's difficult because the Peugeot does have the straightaway speed. Oh, he goes to the inside for Malsan. That is a really hairy move. He pulls it off. That is brilliant stuff by Andre Lotterer taking that track position away from Frank Montagny. 
It is only this young German driver's third appearance at LaSalle. We saw him a couple of years ago for Colin Collis' team in the customer Audi operation. Here's the replay. Last year was his first year with the Works Audi team. And this, this shows is, you the mark of the man. This is not easy. He hops up on the curb there. He has to get to the inside. You're unweighted on that right side. He didn't lock anything up. Boy, oh boy, what a move. We talk about the extra downforce in the Audi, but still, that was a brilliant move by that driver. That has to give Dr. Ulrich a lot of satisfaction. There you go, and the applause from inside the sole remaining Audi team. That's given them a shot in the arm. That's given them a boost. Wow, that is a statement right there. He is on a mission. Montagne, you can see the sails got out of Frank Montagne there, the wind out of his sails. Look at that. Look at that. That is Alan McNish's crash from yesterday afternoon on the front page of the newspapers in France. Here's a replay of it. Tried to thread a needle inside that Ferrari. A lot of people will talk about this for many a day in terms of was it a mistake by one of the best in the business. We saw on Twitter that Alan said that he believed Timo Bernard got a little bit wide. He just went inside him, thought it was a normal move on a GT car, and then the door was closed. We saw a little bit differently, but we're not behind the wheel of the, the Audi R18 and the visibility that that provides, those high wheel arches, the very narrow windshield. You'd have to say it was a mistake, and you could see the consequences. getting reports at the 51. Uh, AF Corsa car is in class leading car. Justin, tell us more. Yep, they, it's their scheduled stop. The 51 Villander state remains behind the wheel. Same tires, they are not changing them. Um, they do have uh, a little bit of concern about the pace, obviously, of the Corvette that is creeping its way every lap with sort of a, I'm not going to use the word monotonous, but a... I do think they may have something going on with the car, uh, but they wouldn't tell me what it is. Uh, it's running strong, but they have lost a little bit of ability to take the fight or hold the fight against Corvette. So uh, a short pit stop, but uh, I think they wish it was only an hour left to go. Yeah, I think they may uh, be in trouble, Justin, because uh, Garcia certainly hacking big chunks off of their lead. And you also saw there V-Lander getting a little bit of a help from the mechanics in terms of getting off pit road maybe he's got some clutch issues too and all he had to do was take a look at the last lap time with uh, Villander a four minute 14 lap Garcia a 403 I think Lotter is going to be in on this lap he's got 10 laps on the board on this run this will be his 11th and that is the mark they've been hitting that was a stunning move Lee. yeah fantastic. that was really really cool Fantastic. It just shows how in the groove, how focused, when you can execute such an important move like that at this stage of the race with absolutely 100% conviction and then just forget about it in a second and get on with the next challenge. And that is dealing with these constant reports we're getting of the, the drops of rain. It may be getting heavier. Signatech Nissan is running slow here. This is the second place P2 car. Frank Malu was behind the wheel. He was also driving right at the beginning of the race when starting from pole. And they had that initial tyre problem when he had to limp back to the pits. No surprise that Lada is getting the job done. I remember way back when, when Bobby Rahal was leading the Jaguar Formula One team, they tested this young man. And Bobby was super impressed by his ability behind the wheel. He thought he had all of the potential in the world to be a star in Formula One. Came over and did a champ car race. We saw him there with Derek Walker, I believe it was, down in Mexico City. Yep. And uh, every time he steps in a car, he is very, very impressive. It's interesting to watch the path of young drivers because I know our broadcast is going out to my home country in Australia. And uh, Andre Lotterer was the then teammate of reigning V8 supercar champion James Courtney. They were both teammates at the Jaguar uh, Formula 3 team and they both were testing for Jaguar Formula One. Andre went the Japanese route, while James Courtney headed home there we go. to take on V8 supercars. All right, here we go. 
Lotterer is in. Just a couple of minutes over three hours left in this race. You saw the fist pump and the emotion from the Audi leader, Dr. Wolfgang Ulrich, with that decisive move. Here we go. This should be fuel only. They've been getting a really good fuel flow right here. It's been about 25 seconds in terms of getting this 65 ladies, about 17 gallons of fuel on board. What are you seeing, Greg? Absolutely, I, I was spot on too. On uh, uh, when they brought it in, the marker that they used to delineate where they need this car hit, he was absolutely on it. Not just where the car stops on the front end, but on the side. Perfect. Oh, very close. A couple of photographers almost getting clipped as Lauder took off. They danced, but it was very, very sketchy. This team is a little bit lit about that. Now I'm going to see if I can find Ralph real quick to have my chat here. We have a question we want to ask and see if we can get Ralph uh, Jutner out here. He's having a chat with Romain Dumas, but uh, hopefully I could get him out. He's back in the bay a little bit and they do not let us in that area of the track. So I'm uh, gonna try and grab him. It looks Still like in the midst of his uh, chat right there. Yeah, it looks Ralph. like he's explaining to uh, to Romain Dumas exactly what the scenario is. Dumas. Exactly. That looks like it's... Chat with you real quick. Hello, Ralph. Thanks you very much for taking the time. Uh, we're wondering why a little while ago we saw posted on the board the team manager for number two was being summoned uh, to the race director. Just wondering uh, what is that about? Uh, it was about uh, Ben lost lost his car a little bit, and uh, he had a, a counter steer and a little bit of a wobble. You might have seen that, and then he went a little bit off and came back. But uh, you know the rules are you have to stay within the track limits. But that's something that has happened hundreds of times this race with different cars, and uh, they agreed with that, and uh, everything is fine. Sounds like it, uh, there may be a little bit of punch counter punch because uh, there are reports that one of the Peugeots ran a red light and that uh, you guys have talked about that. Uh, obviously a little bit of back and forth at this point perhaps? Uh, I don't think so. We, we have a, a good relationship. We are racing hard each other, uh, but we keep a very good relationship to the Peugeot guys and uh, we, we give everything on the track, uh, but whatever the outcome will be, you will see us having a celebration tonight together. So it's racing, it's hard, you see it. It's, it's about tens and hundreds here, and of course, adrenaline is very high, and things happen, but uh, after the race, that's over, and, and we keep a normal sportsman relationship. In terms of pure performance, car looks good, running well? Yeah, the car is running well up to now, knock on wood. It's quick. Our stop frequency is a little bit higher than the one of the pressures, and we have to make up for it. That's what we are trying. At the All right, thanks very much, Ralph. Appreciate you taking the time. And in terms of that little bit of a wobble, and not overtaking a car, boy, that one pass where he went right back around Sarah's and right before I went off the air a little while ago, that didn't look like it was a wobble to me. That looked like it was one heck of a move wide. And we just saw a replay there of Frank Montagne making his number eight. Peugeot very, very wide. This is Frank Malieu for the Signatech Nissan team just limping home with rear tyre damage yet again. And this is frustrating. It's It will give uh, the Level 5 team a real boost because Joao Barbosa, while he is not on the same lap as that number 26 Signatech Nissan, it will help bridge the gap somewhat. And with two hours, 58 minutes to go, it'll make it very, very interesting. We're off for a break. There's a snapshot of your top five. Four Peugeots and one Audi on top. Brought to you by Mazda. Zoom, zoom. Well, how are things swing and turn and change by the minute here at Circuit de la Sarthe. And it's appropriate we come back with these world feed pictures and see Scott Tucker's level five HPD powered Lola. The reason why, 
is the car that it was chasing some two laps ahead has stopped out on track. That's uh, Signatech Nissan. Here it is. It currently leads the ILMC in P2. It was the car to watch, the car to chase. This Nissan power plant has been very, very strong, but the Signatech car has stopped. They're trying to salvage something, trying to prevent a retirement. However, there's only a two lap margin between it and the only American team in the prototype category, and it's this car right here. The Microsoft sponsored Scott Tucker owned Level 5 Motorsport, run by David Stone, Ken Swan, and John Marchione. And this will really give them a, li a lift with two hours, 53 minutes to go. Yeah, it really will. Uh, Scott is the only American in a prototype here in the field this year. And uh, this car was traveling very, very slowly when it passed the pits last time by. We see the tire gone down. Not sure if there's some kind of differential issue as to why he cannot move any further or... Hard to say. We'll try and get an update on this one, but this is devastating for this group because they've done such a stunning job. That Nissan has gone really, really well here this weekend. It was the favorite coming in. It looked like they were going to execute, but this is drama here with under three hours to go. One thing that I was remiss to say is it's not for the lead in the category, but it is for second in P2. Tom Kimber Smith still leads in his Greaves Motorsport machine. What a day it would be for that little team. I mean, this is a team that's competed for so many years here at Le Mans, but never really been a factor in terms of the win. And with that driver lineup, a young rookie on board, Olivier Lombard, I mean, this is uh, this would be a turn up if they could pull it off. And for Tom Kimber Smith, it'd be his second Le Mans victory in a different category. One in GT2 in the Painos Esperante. Yeah, and then here for another small team that's taken on the larger names and perhaps be victorious. But we won't get ahead of ourselves. Greg? Well, of course, that team fairly familiar to people in the United States who have been watching the American Le Mans series over the years as Brooke Laddie, uh, the racing program, now just going by the name of the team owner, Tim Greaves. But the update here is first on the number 33, the Level 5 Motorsports machine. When they got word that the 26 car, the Nissan, had stopped on track, they'd been dealing with a little problem, apparently, with the tow had been knocked out somewhere. So with that car stopped, they brought it in, backed it into the garage very quickly so they could get everybody working on the car, worked the, uh, the tow, which was on the front end, took the rear deck off as well just to make sure they didn't have any issues back there, took the time a little bit, came, came right back out, was not in the garage very long. They said we wanted to make sure the car was right because now we have a shot. We're two laps down, but they know that maybe they're in it and speaking of having an opportunity of being in it of course uh, watching what's unfolding with the number 73 Corvette Doug Feehan uh, this isn't your first rodeo here and you got you know three hours yet but it looks like the, you have uh, uh, some speed now in hand over the 51 it looks to perhaps be slightly wounded uh, what's your take on things at this point you know Greg if you look at that Borgoni Warner Trophy that sits down at, at Indianapolis Louis Chevrolet's mantra was never give up we adopt that mantra from our very first appearance here in 2000. And I think uh, we pretty much embodied that spirit today. This is a group that never, ever gives up. All right, so now that margin we're hearing is down to a minute uh, at this stage, so obviously things coming along. We've talked earlier about how uh, the, the French fans seem to have really embraced Corvette. Well, Chevrolet, Louis Chevrolet, uh, there's definitely a connection there. Obviously, they love the sound of these things, but also the performance and what this team does with that. Well, if I could write the script for the simultaneous celebration of the 100th anniversary yeah. of Chevrolet and Louis Chevrolet, the 10th anniversary of our first win here, this would probably be the script. Yeah, it's about as good as it gets, Doug. Thanks so much for taking the time once again. Good luck uh, up for the rest of this one. Gentlemen? And perhaps the boys from Detroit deserve that one. After what happened to the 74 with Jan Magnussen at the wheel, our race leader, Andre Lotterer, he's handled tougher traffic than that as he whips by uh, one of the Flying Lizard machines and a P2 car. Stick around. Kind of get the feeling the best is yet to come. to tell you about the race to win corvette.com the corvette sweepstakes it's a very special corvette gr uh, grand sport and to top it off with a trip to next year's 24 hours of le mans go to race to win corvette.com for more details for this once in a lifetime experience and we could be saying corvette a whole lot more 
because things have turned around dramatically for the team. As we just heard from program leader Doug Feehan, Tommy Milner in his third appearance at Le Mans is sitting second in class at the moment and he is bringing that gap down to the lead GT Pro car dramatically. Last time around, seven seconds on that lap. Yeah, and uh, Tommy's certainly doing the job, but Tony Vlander is really off the pace. I mean, he's been running laps 408, 410s. The last one was a 47. So, um, you know, there's something going on with that Ferrari number 51, you have to think. And there's something going on here as well with the Signatech Nissan. Frank Malley did a terrific job to get out, to do what he needed to do, Justin, to get this car back in the pits. But the drama's building because Joao Barbosa is closing in on these guys. They need to get him out. Yeah, they did, and they almost blew it, mate, because they left one of the wheel chunks underneath the tire when they dropped the car down. So, of course, that wasn't about to go anywhere. A little less hates, more speed, as my dad used to say. But it was very interesting. We obviously saw him get out to what looked like switch over maybe the electrics, you know, to the uh, to the backup uh, after, while he was having his puncture. But when they got back here, it was very hard to define what exactly they did. They took the rear end off, had a little play around, um, but I will try and grab Hugh in a minute, and uh, obviously this is one of his chassis, uh, but it's not uh, not clear cut from any of us here. Well, they actually did, but they almost uh, tripped over themselves trying to get the car out. I'll give you an update when I find out. Thank you, mate, and we'll continue to monitor this. Meanwhile, let's get back to the top storyline. That is Audi versus Peugeot, and the last time by, Andre Lotterer had about a 42-second lead. Yeah, and I think if we really shuffle this through and think about the end of the race, I mean, I think both teams, the number two and the number nine, need four stops. Now, they're on a very different sequence, but I think four stops will get them to the finish for both camps. So if you play that out, I think both teams will need a set of tires to get to the finish. So it's really very even in terms of the amount of time they'll spend on pit lane. So the, the lead that Lauderer has, you'd assume if we don't see any weather, he will then keep that at the end so Audi have the upper hand right now but still a long way to go Tom Kimbersmith in the Greaves Motorsport Zytec it's the LMP2 class leading car there goes the Robertson Ford GT that is just magical that that car is still running and cross your fingers for another two hours 45 minutes for those of you who know the Robertsons and Dave Murray the Georgia based team that they will see the checkered flag running in the fourth position that is amazing i mean david will be super happy but for the robertsons this is a dream come true to be here at le mans meanwhile the number nine car is in driver change that red helmet i think that might be simon pagino climbing aboard it's, it didn't look like Pedro Lamy's yeah. helmet. Sorry, I was distracted. I was looking at the timing and scoring, but I just saw a flash of red in the cockpit. I think it might be Pagano. Tires normal. Justin, what do you see? Yeah, no, I would say it's definitely Simon getting in the car. Uh, he was actually getting a lot of briefings in the run-up. The two laps before this, they were taking him from inside the, the garage, out to the pit box, having discussions, talking strategy. the pace he had to run, all that kind of stuff. Um, but he was out here early, mate. Just uh, you know, keep your eye on what's going to happen. All right. Will Pagano take it to the checkered flag? Might be Pedro Lamy. Spin oh, this is the Kronos car. Spinning on the front straight. The 22 machine with Maxine Martin behind the wheel. Oh, look at oh, this. Oh, the Orica 908. What has happened here? It's the second time we've seen this car damaged off track. Wow, I can't believe he pulled his way out of there. Oh, and there goes the tail. It had come adrift. As soon as he got up to speed, like a piece of paper, it just flies off the back of that race car. That was at Indianapolis, because that's our Naj. That's where Verts had his problem a couple of hours ago. Everyone pushing really hard, everyone tired on the ragged edge. This is a separate incident. This is on the front stretch. This is the Kronos Aston Martin. And this is Maxime Martin behind the wheel. Pictures are going to tell the story for us. Whoop. 
You can see some raindrops on the camera lens yeah, there. It could be getting slick enough. Not sure how many laps they had if he's just out of the pits. Just lights it up there. And again, that was a separate incident to what we saw with the number 10 of Loic Duval, the Team Orica Matmut 908. Hmm, Hugh Deshonak. What has happened? What has gone on? We didn't need that to put our top five in jeopardy. Tell you more on the other side of this. Well, if you didn't think it was interesting enough with this Audi versus Peugeot battle, what the scrap that's going on in P2 and in GTE Pro and Am, well, we're going to throw a little bit of weather in there for you as well. Tell us more, Greg Kramer. Well, I'm all the way down by Pit Out, which is uh, where the non-factory or non-French teams are squirreled away. And it's out from underneath that little bit of overhang that's over the rest. We were getting sprinkles there, but as you can see here, it is definitely getting damp. And as a matter of fact, if you take a look at the wheels and tires that are going, uh, being pulled out and ready to go on the cars, they are going to intermediates. And we've actually got one of the Ferrari 430s in the AM class just dropping down off the jacks. They did, in fact, go to the intermediates on the number 83. So they are definitely concerned about conditions on the track right now, and we're seeing evidence of that uh, on the track as well. Yeah, cars are spinning now with uh, regularity. This is a car that just made a stop. Nick Manassi and Knight out on intermediates and certainly running at a reduced pace. The grip level is down. We saw our P2 leader, the number 41, have a spin into the gravel trap up at the first turn. Let's take a quick look at that. You see the end of it, Tom Kimber Smith beaching it. And we'll need a toe out of that gravel trap. And this is an example where you get rewarded for good, strong running earlier in the race because Kimber Smith and his Zytec for Greaves Motorsport has a very healthy lead over the second place car of Frank Malieu, who's keeping a watchful eye on uh, the level five Lola that is now within a lap of it after its trouble. So far from over in LMP2. Let's find out more of what's going on here after Loic Duval went off at Indianapolis. Justin? Yeah, Lee, this is the consequences of what was, a, I mean, not an innocuous off, but one of those, whoop, slipped, went out wide, went across the gravel. Look at that. It's completely destroyed in that wheel arch area there as the bodywork comes down around the front tyre. The rear under, they had to replace the rear of the under tray. They had to replace the rear wing assembly. I mean, going through the gravel like that, bang, bang, bang on these low profile tires these low clearances underneath the car really absolutely trashed the underside of the number 10 and i mean due to shonak uh, i mean I, i'm not pinning any blame on drivers but i you got to look at it he is a very mechanically procedure driven team and repeatedly he gets taken out or damaged by his driver lineup and, you know not throwing any stones but uh you know hugh does his job but i don't you know his drivers poor poor guy kind of keep uh being the victim of either their own mistakes or the situation, don't they? This car will go out and it has got intermediates on. But guys, intermediates to me means you're halfway between somewhere and halfway between nowhere. And you have to come in very soon after to put the right tires on. So I hate intermediates. I don't know about you guys. Well, they certainly give you that comfort factor in these type of conditions, but these type of conditions typically don't stay consistent. So you're either going to see it dry out or get more wet, and the Inters won't work in either one of those very, very well or for very long. If it dries out, they'll burn up pretty quickly. As a result of Duval's off, which you saw a replay there during Justin's uh, pit report, they have lost their top five slot. The Manuel Collard and the Pescarolo Judd has gone back up into the top five. It's the lead petrol powered car. Here is the Audi of Andre Lotterer. What do you do here? If you're Lena Gard, the engineer, the strategical crew, do you call him in? Or if conditions dried up enough, does it look safe enough to keep him out there on slicks? Well, we said that she's probably gonna have a couple of tough decisions to make before the end of this one. And this is that 
period where you remember a few years ago when H won the race and he had to make that hard call. He was fighting with his drivers on the radio saying, no, 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 it's dry here on the part of the racetrack and they were calling for wets. And this is where the pressure is now on to make the right decisions. A lot of pressure on this young man, but boy, has he performed well today. And he has really slowed down his lap times last time by a 352 that compares to a 325 being his best. So on slick tires, he is 26 seconds slower. That is how slow he's having to tiptoe around this racetrack. He'll be working with the ASR, which is effectively the traction control to really give him some grip, give him some work with the electronics. And here we see the seven car, Anthony Davison behind the wheel, going to be hammered down. He has nothing to lose at this stage. Here's the Pescarolo. Fifth place overall, and as I just mentioned, top petrol-powered car. That'll give Honoré a little boost to come back as the team owner, the man in charge, and to grab a top five. And the top French privateer team, he'd, he'd like that one too, against his uh, old nemesis, Hugh Deshaunac, who just had to go through some repairs on the 908, number 10. He said he couldn't imagine life not coming back to Le Mans with his own team. And he had to do that for one year, as we've already detailed. That was last year. And he said it just didn't feel the same. It didn't feel right. And some financial assistance came his way through a couple of dear friends. And here he is back at La Sarthe where he feels he belongs. Looks like it's dried out a little bit. Don't see the precipitation and the pace seems to have picked up. Last lap was a 3.52. Long way to go. We'll see what he clicks off on this lap. See if the pace has picked up. For Chevrolet fans and American team fans, Tommy Milner is hammer down. He's got it from over a minute when we were speaking to Doug Feehan to 33 seconds. The gap between he and the lead GT Pro car of Tony Vilander in the AF Corsa Ferrari up against the Works Corvette. We ride with Tommy now. Put in a storming drive last week at Watkins Glen in the GT class. Flew straight to Le Mans. It's his third appearance here and he could stand on the top step of the podium. His dad, Tom Milner Sr., is here, who is always very tight-lipped. He doesn't want to publicly give his son <laughs> too much credit or too much adulation or, you know, but he is so vehemently proud of him. Well, it goes against his uh, common statement, I hate drivers, so uh, <laughs> his son is one. We're hearing reports that the 41 of Tom Kimber Smith in the Greaves Zytec has made it back to pit lane. Remember, they have plenty of laps, not to downplay the drama, but they do have plenty of laps in hand. We'll continue to monitor that and just how close Frank Malu gets. And at the moment, it's 290 laps completed for Tom Kimber Smith, 283 for Frank Malu. So that shows you the margin there. Pace has definitely picked up. You can see that just the dynamic of the car is totally different from the previous lap. It's not going to be down at those fast times, but I'd say it's going to be somewhere between the two. 325 is the fastest lap of the race. Last time by, Lauder ran a 352. This is the JMW Ferrari 458. Just struggling to get going again. Tim Sugden's behind the wheel. And the British team coming to his rescue. Porn there, the driver must not reverse the car down pit lane. He has to be pushed, otherwise he would be excluded. And that happened to the legendary Bern Schneider when he was driving for Mercedes here in 1999. We'll be back. Speed's coverage of the 24 Hours of Le Mans is brought to you by Mazda. Zoom, zoom. Zoom, zoom is exactly what some of our American teams are doing. And you see there the number seven of Anthony Davidson has got by. Now, it's not for position, and it's no immediate threat, but he did get by Andre Lotterer. Quick update on our American team. Joao Barbosa for level five is running third in class, trying to elevate himself to second. And in GTE Pro, Tommy Milner for Corvette Racing, sitting second. Joey Hand is sitting third. So we've got American teams well placed. While we're in that last commercial break, we need to show you something that went down between Davidson and Lotterer. 
Again, this is not for position, but it could have an impact on the overall result. Certainly could. He forces it down the inside, down there into the second chicane, and uh, Lauder got a little bit wide. You'd have to think there's some dampness there. He didn't get the grip. Certainly he was looking for when he tried to get the car turned in, took the escape route. And then you're going to see a bit more precipitation on the windshield. So the weather conditions are certainly changing lap to lap, and that has really puts enormous pressure and stress on the driver in terms of feeling that grip. It's not going to be the same lap to lap. There you see some of the spectators with their little raincoats on. Not heavy, but really, really difficult conditions to read the road. Justin, there's an amazing battle that is just, well, it's not simmering anymore. It is bubbling full on from one minute, one second, down to 24 seconds, the gap between Tony Villander and Tommy Milner. It's on in GT Pro. It really is. I have the feeling by the look on the faces of the Ferrari team in here at the, the 51 garage that uh, it's been a long time coming. I believe they are losing power and they have not had any ability to uh, to fight. Awful with a driver of uh, Villander's talent, not able to sort of fight back against Corvette. And, uh, but anyway, uh, nothing's been confirmed, but it's on. It's up there on the screen, isn't it, mate? You can tell they, uh, you know, they got plastic cutlery at this uh, sword fight. Yeah, and I think a lot of the rival teams thought that about the 458. It was unproven. Could it go 24 hours? It's a brand new engine, a 4.5 liter direct injection. They have not done any sim runs. I spoke to the technical director at AF Corsa of the 51 car, Giuseppe Petroda, and he said, no, we are, have some concerns. We had problems at Sebring with the 458, even though we didn't run it there. And we believe we're on top of things, but he had a wry grin. He said, but you never know, 24 hours, a different deal. And uh, 21 hour race, they had a bit in good shape. Tyres getting ready for Andre Lotterer and the number two out. Remember that this is twofold. We're talking two stories here. It's not only the 24 hours of Le Mans, it's also the third round of the Intercontinental Le Mans Cup, the seven round championship. It's got nothing to do with drivers. It's all about manufacturers. And with that AF Corsa Ferrari running into trouble, BMW is third place. This could help them leapfrog them in the standings. Lotterer should be in on this lap. He's probably got a little bit of a fuel save in these uh, damp conditions but this is the 11 lap run that they've done all day long got to be careful here remember the line on the racetrack gets dried out by the cars running on it this is treacherous you got to be on your toes even though you're in pit lane you cannot afford to relax they're satisfied that the weather has stabilized enough to go slicks for slicks no sign of intermediates at the top of pit lane Greg's there. And so is the number uh, two machine. Absolutely spot on the marks. He was actually a little bit more casual coming in. Obviously just wanted to be absolutely sure. And uh, fuel is going in at this point. They are ready to go with tires. Now one thing that we've uh, been told by a number of teams is if you get too far away from that little mark, even though it's only a foot or two, it can add up to two, maybe three seconds to a tire change. So they have these very defined marks. They opting not to do the tires, just fuel. He is back out. They were happy with what they were seeing with the tires, so it saved a bit of time there. Yeah, and I think it's a good call. He's only done a double stint. We've seen them do up to four here today on the tires, so the tires are nice and warm. They've just come off the racetrack, and I think it's a good call. It saves you time as well. It's about 20 seconds to change the tires, so if there's no need to, just keep them on. He's done a tremendous job dealing with the pressure. We thought that the seven car and the eight car would be the bigger problems other than the lead Peugeot, which is the nine car we're looking at right now. In terms of if he got around those cars, that could pose problems. And we saw that when Davison stuffed it down the inside in the second chicane, forced him out wide. He dealt with it nicely, didn't panic and uh, continued on his way. He came here two years ago, driving for Colin Collis's customer Audi team with Charles Walsman and Narain Karthikeyan, who of course has made his way back to Formula One. They finished seventh in class. Last year, he teamed up with his now 
regular teammates and co-drivers Benoit Trellier and Marcel Fessler to stand on the podium in second place. That's why the car displays the number two here at Le Mans 2011. Can he go one better again here? He will know in two hours, 19 minutes. But it's been a, it's been a defining moment in Andre Lotterer's career, the way that he has handled this pressure. It's the last Audi out of three. We know what happened to the other two. Horrific crashes to Alan McNish and Mike Rockefeller. But fastest lap of the race belongs to Andre Lotterer. Perhaps one of the moves of the race belongs to Andre Lotterer. A huge responsibility on the 29 year old German shoulders and he has handled it with such maturity. When you have got a company and a manufacturer like Audi and all the hopes are riding on you in these important stages, that is massive pressure and he's handled it just nicely. Gap in GT Pro is down to 16 seconds. Tommy Milner is storming. to relive all of the magical and not so magical moments like this one for Frank Malu after starting on the pole. This team, Signatech, is still in with a shot of a podium. This was the first of the nasty incidents. Alan McNish there trying to thread a needle. It wasn't open. Massive, massive crash. Watch him hit the tyre barrier. Watch the debris that gets scattered amongst those photographers. There's Alan comes down upside down. Scary, scary moments for all of us here and certainly at the racetrack. And that, we all had a sigh of relief when we saw the Scotsman stand up. Tough day for the Quiffle team in LMP1. It went up in smoke, as simple as that. So too for BMW. Boy, these guys, every time they get up, they get smashed back down. It's been two hell years here in the M3. Romain Dumas didn't have many smiling moments either. He didn't like some of the driving antics around the racetrack, and uh, he was pretty vocal about that. Took a quick spin at Tet Rouge. This is the 62 Ferrari for CRS Racing. Sean Lynn, Roger Wills, Pierre Eret. Not many happy times there either as Charlie Schnitzer looks on. This is the sister BMW. It had a misfire, the 56. He did. Joey Hand gone for the triple crown. That has certainly thwarted his charge a little bit. They're up in the top three. And then Mike Rockenfeller gets it all wrong, entering the pit lane in the number one Audi. Then, when he left pit lane a couple of laps later, dealing with Rob Kaufman, GT traffic up ahead. Puts the right-hand side wheels off on the grass, in the dirt. This is a huge shunt straight in and then rebounds back across the racetrack. You see the carnage and debris there. And we had several scary moments there where Rocky was laying on the ground. We understand he's bruised. He's still in the hospital. He is okay. Just a cut to his arm. Damage to the front of the Orica Matmut 908 Peugeot. It was repaired and sent again and got back up into the top five. And then Jean-Christophe Bouillon in the Toyota powered Rebellion. The Lola chassis car had that hard impact that brought out one of a handful of caution periods. And Joao Barbosa on cold tyres. Yeah, just got caught out as many people did. It was really, really treacherous conditions there in the cool midnight hours. David Halliday in the sister Orica Matmut machine. This is the Nissan-powered Orica in LMP2. It was a class-leading car for the majority of the day. And then Olivier Beretta had this little hiccup at Arnage. Yeah, it had some uh, fumes get in the car a little bit early. They put him to one side, got him back in the car. He made that mistake. And then Jan Magnussen gets it all wrong. Look at this huge crash book for him and for Horst Felbermeyer Sr. Their days were over. Both drivers are okay, but certainly bruised up a little bit. Very unlike Jan Magnussen and one of the four Oak Racing prototypes. Oh my goodness. This was scary stuff. I mean, this is just antics you cannot see on the racetrack. Look at this. Benoit Trillier around the outside. He did take position. Ralph Jutner said he didn't gain anything from Roma. He did. He got around one of those Peugeots. And then you don't see this very often. Alexander Wurtz getting it wrong down into Indianapolis. He said he tweeted it's his first mistake in three years. And he was kicking himself. He put his hand up. It was my fault. It was my mistake. Hey, we've seen this happen before, haven't we, to the Signatech Nissan? We're not playing the same piece of video. That's a separate incident. This was a scary moment for Loic Duval at Indianapolis with rain starting to fall heavier and heavier. Yeah, we didn't see the beginning of that and watch that the bodywork will just peel off here as he gets up to speed but I have to think that the dampness of the racetrack caused that one and then the lead car in LMP2 Tom Kimber Smith for Greaves Motorsport 
He had seven or eight laps off the top of my head lead at that point in time. And Davidson squeaks by Lotterer. Yep. No major harm done. Got the lap back and forces Andre wide. He deals with it nicely, continues on his way. Lost a few seconds there. So there you have it. That brings you up to speed. We welcome Le Mans winner Scott Pruitt back to the speed booth. Tenth anniversary of Corvette's first win here, 2001. There's your Just For Men uh, race recap and the positions as we stand. And we are getting reports as Mark Genet gets ready to step into the car that there has been a big crash involving the 16 Pescarolo machine of Emmanuel Collard. We'll update you on that. The Signatech car is in trouble there. It is. So uh, maybe that 33 level 5 car can move further up on the podium and that battle in GTE Pro is now really, really tight. Scotty, did you get some rest? Ready to, ready to go to the yeah, end? a little rest, and, and it's going to be the interesting part, rain. It's kind of coming on and off. We're seeing kind of light rain, heavy rain. I was watching this a bit uh, uh, on the monitor while I was kind of waking, <laughs> waking up, seeing what was going on. It seems like it's just kind of that, it, it's not raining hard enough to go to rains, but just enough to be annoying just seen one of the top prototypes go to Winters, and that was car number eight first up. This is car seven, Anthony Davidson uh, bringing it to the pits. His job at Le Mans 2011 is done. Marc Genet will take over the wheel. They put some intermediates on the eight car on the previous stop. Let's see what they're doing here. What is the read from Anthony and the team? As Marc Genet gets on board, will they put slicks or make the switch? Looks like they had. They slicks. do have slicks. As this routine stop goes on, this is the incident I was talking about just a few minutes ago. Massive for Emmanuel Collard while sitting in fifth place overall. And that is a destroyed Pescarolo. Wow. Wow. We do not have any replays from the world feed as to how that happened to Manu. That's entering the Porsche curves, I think. It's coming into the pits. Yeah, oh, this is the no, wrong shot. Sorry, wrong shot. sorry, but yeah, I, th I think that's the Porsche curves, uh, the entry of the Porsche curves where Christensen had that incident with Prio last year. Oh. We're talking about the rain. They, you know, they, these guys are all still on slicks, and it makes it very treacherous out there. You, it's not really wet enough to go to full wets, but at the same time, it's a handful to drive. We just dealt with this last couple races, and as a matter of fact. That's right. It is really difficult. So the track conditions are changing literally by the second. While all this was going on, we've been updating you on the time gap between the lead car and GTE Pro, which is Tony Villander and his AF Corsa Ferrari. Well, guess what? Young Tommy Milner just kept that foot to the floor yeah. and said, I'm taking the lead of this category. Yeah, I think the Ferrari definitely has some power issues. Look at that. There you see, I think that's where Roggy had his incident. And Tommy Milner takes the lead. The 74 car looked like it was going to lead the way. Then Jan had that massive crash. But they had two bullets in their gun. The other one looking strong right now. Race leader, Andre just Lotter, a 40-second advantage over Simon Pagano. Everybody just kind of tippy-toeing. I mean, if you look at there, nobody wants to put a wheel wrong at this point in time. Nobody can really make a move at this point in time. With this rain kind of intermittent on and off, it makes for some pretty tough conditions to drive in. Well, you'd have to think, if you're leading this race, do you play it safe? Do you put the inners on? You make that wrong call, suddenly that cushion you have to win this race goes away. And, and that's on fuel mileage, they need three more stops. But if you make an additional one, and it's the wrong one, you have to come back in, suddenly it all goes away from you. So the hand, they're putting the pressure now in the hands of the driver to really deal with these conditions and try and stay on their fuel sequence. Oh, look, look at that. how slippery it is. It is really tough. I think Manassian's on Inters. That's why he's just going to blow by here. As you start to get a little bit more drizzle, the Inters are going to come into play. Tough call. Tough call for Lena Gard and the whole Audi team. See the rain just kind of trickling down on the windshield. And Lotterer has lost some of that advantage to Simon Pagano. It's down in the 30-second range now. Down to 36 as he errs on the side of caution getting close to just two hours left as he weaves side to side trying to keep maximum heat in those tires see you in a moment
riding with the class leading Corvette C6R of Tommy Milner in his third appearance at Lasarth. Dad on hand here. Hold it together for another two hours and the Bowtie boys could be celebrating. Still a lot of work to be done, however, and conditions still proving to be tricky. We welcome Dorsey Schrader back to the booth. Just about all hands on deck here for the final two hours. Dorsey, this one has been interesting for quite a while. Yeah, since yesterday morning, actually. <laughs> it's been quite a race. I don't think I've ever seen the likes of it. Now you add the element of rain and how that's yeah. going to unfold. Is it going to just, looks like it's kind of lightened up again. It's going to just kind of be annoyance. Tip-toeing could be a way to describe what Andre Lotterer is doing. His very healthy lead margin has come down now to 20 seconds. He's only 20 seconds ahead of Simon Pagano, but they're going step for step, stop for stop. So we'll continue to monitor that for you and update you. Let's get an update from pit lane. Well, gentlemen, uh, indecision seems to be the word in play right now in the Corvette pit. While we were in break, they brought out, rushed out intermediates, had them all set on the ground, looked like they were doing the stop, then suddenly grabbed them, hauled them back into the garage, brought out slicks, stood there ready to go, then they hauled them back into the garage, and uh, they, it's just these conditions, part of the track virtually dry, other parts quite slick, and uh, they just really weren't sure what to do. Now they're getting ready for a stop proper and they have opted to bring out the slicks who knows by the time that car hits the uh, pit lane it may be back to enters we'll keep you updated yeah, conditions are literally changing by the second and uh, right now Manassian and Pagano are running laps considerably faster than our leader and uh, we we know that Manassian's on enters I have to assume with the pace that Simon Pagano is going he must be on enters as well and uh, when the track dries out, suddenly Lauder is the man. When the track's a little bit damp, here we see it. Pagano hits pit lane. We'll see what comes off his car. If he is not on Inters and he is on Slicks, he has really been pushing very hard, and Lauder is just being very, very cautious in these conditions. Milner is in. 73 car lead car in GTE Pro. I think Slicks is the right decision for right now, but yeah. who can tell the future? It can change quite quickly. And and when it comes down, you talk about an eight and a half mile track and it can be soaking wet on one side and completely dry on the other. And that would make, makes it incredibly tough to make that decision. Boy, and the driver's just gotta be so heads up aware of that. You know, you go down these long straightaways, you better be looking way on out there to see what's going on. Justin. still on slick tires mate he is still on his slicks so uh he, as far as you can see it's pretty hard to see on you know from here um but it was uh, a standard pit stop they just cleaned everything off and got him out there um it's now not raining in the pit lane just so you know um which but yeah, i tell you it's amazing these pit stops are so uh, are rotating so fast at the moment it seems they're coming in every 20 minutes obviously they're not but uh what's it like your end greg Well, pretty much the same story. Uh, the 73 Corvette came in. They did elect to stay with slicks, and uh, it was so it was just basically a routine stop, very quick change, and the car is back out, obviously cleaned the windshield up, did the, uh, the standard work. One of the things that I think uh, really, they're showing, I think, a tremendous amount of faith in Tommy Milner, his first time with the team here at Lamar, in these sketchy conditions, although it does seem to be drying up a bit, uh, deciding to go with slicks when it could be wet and slippery. I think they're, uh, they're showing that they have lots of faith in this young American driver. I tell you what, if Pagano is on slicks, I would have to assume he's on a softer compound because the laps he is running. And what you get, Scott, you know, if you start tippy toeing the temperatures just plummet in those tires. If you're able to get some cornering load, you keep the temps up, but it kind of balloons on you, the problem. It, right now, we've been talking about how cold it is over there. We're talking about the chance of, uh, of rain, and it certainly is kind of intermittent of some sprinkles. So you almost have to go for that play of, of soft tires. Even if it goes back to, let's just say, solid dry conditions, you're still going to be okay. It's just that much cooler over there right now than, than what you need to run. And, and running that softer compound, you can get away with it. And, and what are you going to do? you got to take that gamble. So it's one of those 
Chicken and egg situations. You need cornering load to keep the tire temps up. If the tires aren't giving you the grip, you can't go. And the tire temps drop, and then you have to slow down more. The tire temps drop even further. And as a driver, the way to get, I mean, we're talking about this eight and a half mile track. As a driver, the way you gauge how much rain's coming down is just looking at your windshield. You'll see the racetrack, you're gonna see the windshield, and uh, you, you can come whistling down into Arnage or some of these other areas, and it can be significantly wetter than, than let's say, the Monson. And you just gotta be heads up all the time. Peugeot is this that's in. It should be the eight on rotation because we saw Janae come in a little while ago, take over from Ant Davidson. This is the eight. Yeah. Justin? Yep, they just came in. Right now they have fresh uh, slicks ready to put on, just run from the ovens at the back, and uh, the intermediate is coming off. The slicks are going back on. I'm um, interesting, can you see how the way that uh, shows the, the battle scars of this car, even just from the natural environment? See the way the uh, paint, the way it's actually a wrap on this car, not paint, has all peeled off on that front, uh, on those front fenders. Clean the windscreen, obviously. It's, uh, you know, two guys, one gun, so it's very well choreographed. Um, and the car is on its way out. Gotta say, uh, you don't, I don't think, at home get the, uh, or in the booth there, get the benefit of. But when the Audi trails past us to go up to its pit stop, I cannot hear the car. The only stuff I can hear is like the running gear clanking as it goes down. You, you can hear the dip, you can hear mechanical movement, but you the engine what a what a strange phenomenon diesel power is and when you stand beside the track and watch them come all you can hear is just this little whistle and the protesting tires it is quite a bizarre sensation the ever ongoing Analysis of tires, so important. And the Michelin engineers just checking out the intermediates that came off the eight. It's the only front running prototype that we saw switch to intermediates. And they're doing their evaluation now as everybody looks at the sky, wonders how much more rain we'll see at Lasarth. Once you wipe around here. Talk about the undertaker for Michelin here at Le Mans. They bring 6,000 tires to this event to cover all of their teams and uh, Talking to John Love, who handles Michelin PR, he said there were 96 different combinations Gosh. for the prototypes alone in terms of mixing and matching and the various compounds. All coming, well, particularly from the uh, the Michelin camp, all coming from Clermont-Ferrand, a little south of Le Mans in central France, where they basically own the town. Here is car number two, a minute 51 to go and a minute, an hour 51 to go and a minute 21 lead between the two and the nine. Both these cars should need three pit stops, so effectively if they have the same pit stops in terms of tires and fuel and so forth, then you'd have to assume that the Audi would maintain that lead. Sprinkling right there. Just saw a quick shot of Dindo Capello and Marco Bonanomi. I was thinking a little earlier, I didn't mention it on air, I was thinking a little earlier when we saw the despair on Dindo's face, once he knew Alan was okay, that was pure relief, but you saw a little bit of despair, and I think Dindo nay, knows that his days are numbered at Audi. He's not getting any younger, and he's getting towards the end. And, and Audi do it very respectfully as they, they rotate out their older drivers like they did with Frankie Beeler, like they did with Emanuele Pirro. It doesn't matter how many 24 hours of Le Mans you've won, you've got to bring the next generation on, and that is Marco Bonanomi. Yeah, he's got time in the R18. In fact, he was at the Le Mans test. It is uh, mandatory 10 laps there in case they needed him as a reserve driver this weekend. Really nice young man. We ate dinner with Tom Dindo and Alan McNish and uh, Marco on Monday night in Le Mans. And, uh, super young man, great personality. Tom calls him junior and uh, maybe he's being groomed for future stardom in one of these cars. Take a look at the windshield here. Mm -hmm. You can get some sort of sense of how the rain's coming down. As a driver, that's what you look for. You look, at the, you look at the surface to see if it's shiny, you see if it's wet and shiny, you look at the windshield, you, you, you sense all these things and trying to really figure out how hard you can push the car. And you're also in a position with Audi where you're that much ahead, 
you're kind of watching to see what's happening to the number nine car in second and kind of gauging how hard you need the press or you just need to roll. I'll tell you what, you can almost use the car in front of you with the Peugeot as a gauge. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. He goes in there and just, you know, be that buffer where you've got enough room, but you can see what he's doing, how much speed is he carrying, is he getting through the corner okay, is he twitching? You know, it just kind of gives you a read on the road. Lotter are just letting the JMW car, driven by Tim Sugden, know that he's coming through on the inside. Just give me plenty of space. This is serious stuff. There's a Le Mans victory on the line for the new R18. Think about the wins with the R8, the R10, the R15, all the iterations, all the generations of Audi endurance sports cars have experienced victory. The R18 could do it on debut here at Le Mans. Remember, we didn't see the R18 at Sebring. Its race debut was at Spa in the second round of the Intercontinental Le Mans Cup. Qualified very well there, didn't race well, they learned a lot. That was really important in the prep for Le Mans to get that race under their belts. The drivers dealing with this new cockpit environment is sits very, very low as you can see. The narrow windshield, it's only about 11 inches, the aperture that they look through. The cockpit position is about four inches lower than before. You've got those really high fenders, and it's one thing to be driving on an open test track by yourself, but around traffic, getting that feel for the race car, they had to do it in race conditions. Prototype number seven for Peugeot up ahead. That's Mark Genet, who is some three laps behind, almost four laps down on uh, the race leading Audi that we ride with. And I would be content to just leave that Peugeot up there as a pick, you know, just watch him, let him get into the trouble before I do, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Absolutely. In prototype two. Oh, he locks up. There you see him, he locks up on the entry to Indianapolis. That's how treacherous these conditions are. Tom Kimber Smith still leads P2 comfortably over Frank Malu and Christoph Bouchou behind the wheel of the level five HPD Lola. So the only American team in prototypes we may very well see on the podium in an hour and three quarters. One of the beautiful things about endurance sports car racing in this event is just when you think things are getting rhythmic, <laughs> the drivers and teams surprise you. This was just a few moments ago. Andre Lotterer attempting a move on Marc Genet. I do not get this at all. I mean, that is the potentially thrown away this 24-hour race. He does not need to pass him. Use him to read the road. He is fighting really, really hard here. You know that the seven car and the eight car are going to do you no favors whatsoever in terms of allowing the nine car to really chase you down one of their teams. And now you've cut the margin of error down to zero, and you don't need to be crashing his car right now. You've got a big enough buffer. They're in the catbird seat. They do not need to throw this race away. It needs to be talked to and just say, look, ride behind us. Much safer. This is when a team manager needs to come on and just go, whoa, 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 whoa. You know what? Pull it back. Just look at these conditions. If you can get by safely and smartly, fair enough. But you can also, we were talking about earlier, you can also read the road from the guy in front of you. Absolutely. Which would help him out right now. And now he's going to probably yeah. take another look. Now he's got a difficult position. He's got to defend yep. from Janae. He's going to be aggressive. And that's going to break your concentration of doing your job, which is right now staying on the track. Staying on the track. Staying on the track. Look and at this. Outside into our nose. This is foolish. Makes it happen easy around the Kronos Aston Martin car. Talk about a rhythm of a race. You can't afford to back off too much, but we have to believe that they are in good position with the lead that they currently have. Both the Audi and the Peugeot camps need the same amount of s stops. Look at nice. that. That's there shows the uh, what he thought of what was going on there. He That's shows stupidity. his disgust to Jeanette. Again, that is just absolute yeah. stupidity. You're getting caught in the race emotion. away because of your emotion. Yeah. You can't see out of the Audi that well. He could have clipped it, yep. hit a rear corner or just, <laughs> quite frankly, put that Puzo in a position to go back after him. And again, we're all reliving these moments, uh, what was going on between Mark Genet and Andre Lotterer. Back to live pictures here with Tommy Milner, class leader in GTE Pro, the Ferrari. For AF Corsa, Tony Villander is still second, and American Joey Hand is third in his BMW team Schnitzer M3. So we could have two Americans on the podium. 
in GTE Pro. Wouldn't that be something to celebrate? Let's talk more about Corvette. And what? This was Beretta. Just got back in the race car. Gets it wrong down into Arnage. Then Magnussen, the exit of the Porsche curves, gets it all wrong. Gets a big twitch. Hits Felbermeyer Senior. Both cars destroyed. Thumbs up from Tommy Milner as he gets ready to get on board. And there we see the pass on the Ferrari, which is wounded. It doesn't seem to have the power. Tommy Milner goes to the lead for Corvette late in the going. And he ran him down from like 15 seconds back, which was pretty cool. And we saw it from some 61 seconds, just whittled it down very methodically. This is the overhead shot of Mark Genet, number seven. It's fourth place overall, that car and some three laps down, make it four laps down now on our race leader, Andre Lotterer. It was Calvin mentioned, so long as nothing silly happens like we just saw, Audi is in a very good position of strength here, so long as it stays in the grooves, keep it between the lines. Tell you more in a moment. Lead car is in. Andre Lotterer brings the number two Audi R18 to pit road one more time. Weather is holding off, thankfully. And this long, slow grind up the hill, it's something that TV does not show you. This is not a flat pit lane at Lasaf. Greg Creamer is standing by at Audi for this stop. And the number two is in. Fuel goes right now. Driver is staying on board. They have tires pulled out, but as always, we don't know really if they're going to do tires or not at this point. It, uh, the guns are in hand. Driver door is closed once again. That part of the game is complete. Fuel just waiting on that. Watching to see what they do with tires. I don't think they're doing tires. The reaction I'm getting from Brad Keller at the front, he's saying, no, go, 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 go. He is gone and away. Now, you were talking about the slope and pit lane right past where the Audi pit is. It gets fairly steep, so that adds a little bit of an extra element to it. They didn't go to tires. Now, guys, uh, Calvin, you've been doing, I'm sure, some serious strategizing and crunching numbers. Uh, this stop, at least one more. I don't know. Do they need two, do you think? Yeah, I think they're going to need two more, Greg. I wonder if there's a member of the Audi team that is the lucky charm. It's the guy who jumps on the front of that car and cleans the windshield. His name is Thomas Leutsch. He's been with Yoast for many, many years. He's part of the furniture there. We've seen him in a lot of those shots, standing alongside Wolfgang Ulrich and Ralph Jutner. He was the guy back when Bentley won, when a lot of the Yoast staff were on there with that beautiful coupe, when Tom Christensen, Guy Smith and Dindo Capello won. He was the windshield guy then. I wonder if he's the lucky charm for this closed cockpit Audi number two. Yeah, it certainly would be great to see him get another win but looking at the strategy, an hour and 33 on the board. They've been doing about 38, 39 minute runs, so one more stop will not get them there. They'll need a second stop. That last fuel uh, fill will not need to be a full one. And the question's going to be, this is the fourth run on these tyres. Will they just keep them on and take it to the finish? A five stint on those Michelins? Or will they play it safe, want a bit more meat on that rubber? to well, take him through that final stint. They have talked all through the race of doing five. No one's done it so far, but there has been talk. And uh, they tell us that the tire is capable. Well, do you want to risk it? Well, a couple of things are coming into play. Obviously, you've been talking about the weather. It, it continues to kind of come down, kind of spit, kind of make a mess of things. Now, with that being said, we're also looking at slower speeds, and that means they can extend their fuel window perhaps a little bit. Uh, the further they can extend their fuel window, that means a shorter stop on the backside as they, they finish up to the run to the checkered flag. Top seven cars, the top seven positions uh, occupied by P1. It's Lottera Pagano who's done a terrific job in car number nine. Nicholas Manassi and Mark Chenet, Nicola Lapierre is the best petrol powered car. Uh, sorry, I take that back. That's the 10 Orica. The best petrol powered car is your own Blick Molen in the number 12 Toyota Rebellion. And then Maxime Martin 
is in seventh. The best P2 is in position number eight, and that's Olivier Lombard, the young rookie in the 41 Greaves machine, the 26th of Malieu, and then Christophe Bouchou is 10th overall, and then the Oak Racing machine with Yann Chirouz. That's the top 10. Then you get back into GT territory, and Tommy Milner leads that class over Giancarlo Fisichella. That's a comfortable margin. Joey Hand is in 15th overall, third in GTE Pro, and in the AM class, Canal, Belloc, and then you have to go back to third place in GTM, Manuel Rodriguez with the Robertson 4 GT, fourth in class and still running strong. Let's wish him well for the next hour and a half. come back with the Just For Men race recap. It shows you our four respective class leaders. Now, there's an interesting story unfolding. As we went to the break, I said, let's wish the Robertsons well in their Ford GT. They could be in with a shot of a podium because the 83 JMB Ferrari said that Manuel Rodriguez holds down third place at the moment. That car is stationary. It's in the pits and not much going on. Wouldn't that be a, a, an amazing result if the Robertsons could stand on the podium their very first visit? And with Dave Murray celebrating his return to LaSalle for the first time in 10 years. It's really covering both ends of the spectrum with the factory teams and then the Pro-Am drivers. It's, it would be a great story. It means so much to them to visit here for the first time, to stand on that podium. I and mean, it, it is quite a sight to see all those people that come oh. down to pit lane, just the sea of the crowd standing up tall. It'll be very emotional, that's for sure. Scott, you were part of a very special story here with Corvette Racing 10 years ago, and and as we appropriately go to the Corvette, but for the Audi boys in car number two, it's an amazing story as well. We've been describing them as the lesser spoken about of the three cars. The reason why is all of their teammates, their other six teammates, are all the more winners. The number one car with a single win to each of their drivers. In the three car, Tom Christensen, Mr. Le Mans with eight wins, Dindo Capello with three wins, and Alan Mcnish with two. It's no no wonder they're the lesser spoken about. However, today they've come to the top with good strategy, good sensible driving, a little bit of good fortune on their side. So we'll see if they can hang on for another hour and 25. I say they were playing it smart, but I was seeing some moves out there. Uh -huh. I say we're a little less than what they should be doing right now. You need it. to get, you know, keep an eye on what's going on, get into the checker flag, but don't put yourself in harm's way. And as we saw him swerve over in front of the Janae, make him mad and just drop you into one turn. That's not what you need. Yeah, I think they should have really given some directions over the radio from the team there. You know, you can put it in the hands of the driver. He's getting antsy and he's getting impatient, but you got to be able to put it into the overall perspective of the race. What's going on? How much of a margin do you have? If you keep it here, we're good to go. Everyone's going to need three stops. Everyone's going to need a set of tires, potentially. You know, just read the road, read the dampness of the racetrack. Try not to make a mistake. Don't mix it up with anyone. So on board with the Corvette, there was a little sprinkle coming on the pit straightaway once again. They're showing us the split here between first and second in GT Pro from Tommy Milner to Giancarlo Fisichella. Isn't that something that the 25-year-old American <laughs> could never dream about? I'm leading a guy who's won three Formula One Grand Prix, done something like 220-plus Formula One Grand Prix starts. Simply amazing. He'll be pinching himself. And then the gap back to the third place GT Pro car of Joey Han. So flying the flag for BMW. Hey, we're going to switch gears within the GT division. Let's talk GTM. And we've got an update about the situation with Robertson Racing and the 83 JMB Ferrari. <laughs> Interesting developments here. You guys were alluding to it for JMB. They have a serious clutch issue. They were in. It was a very long stop. Uh, they got him back out and running again. Just talked to the team, and they said, we don't know if it's going to last. They don't sound at all confident. And, of course, it means that that number 68, Robertson Racing, for GT, uh, might be in with a shot at the podium. Uh, again, what a wedding anniversary it would be. Great present for this team. Just talked to David Murray, and... Uh, He's just trying to be very calm here. He told me earlier, he said his entire 
mission here was to make this a very special experience for the Robertson Racing team in their first visit to Lamar. Boy, if this pans out, it will be huge. They're all trying to remain calm, but you can see it underneath. They're amped. Well, and that would have a special significance for Dave Murray, who's going through some tough times with his elderly parents at the moment. His mum just had open heart surgery, and unfortunately, his father was just diagnosed with cancer. So that would be a special time for Dave Murray, and I'm sure he'd dedicate that podium if they get there to his folks. 68 cars, about two and a half laps behind the 83 car, and behind them, they have a massive lead to the 81, which is out of this race. So if the 83 car quits and the Robertsons keep going for a few laps, they'll be guaranteed a podium finish. So that is amazing, amazing story. See that body work still loose. It's been like that for several hours. Oh, wow. You got to be careful when it's sprinkling like that, getting on that yeah. slippery paint. And you can that see car can get away from you really fast. What you were talking about, too, Scott, you could see the shine off of the headlights on the asphalt, so you know it's starting to get a little damp in that corner. And that's where I saw on the Corvette windshield that it was, it was raining down there. A little over, actually, an hour and 22 minutes left. Getting into the checkered flag. Audi has it, I wouldn't say it in hand, no. but they certainly have pretty good position right now. It's going to be interesting to see how the, the pit stops play out and how much fuel each of these cars are going to need to get to the checkered flag. Think about if you're Olivier Canel or Bruno Fermin at Peugeot. We've got three cars out there, four if you count the ten, and we're still chasing just one Audi. For those of you just waking up, either on the east or west coast, welcome to Speed's continuous coverage, 25 hours in total of the 24 hours of Le Mans. And this one has been a race to remember for a variety of reasons. One of the Peugeots takes an off-track excursion. Which one was it? Was it the one doing the chasing? Was it car number nine? Or was it two of the Peugeots that aren't really in the race? The seven or the eight? We'll find out. There is car number nine. The red mirrors tell us that. I think it was nine, actually. Simon Pagano has been doing a remarkable job. As his boss, there's Olivier Canel. Believe that Simon will have to pit on this lap. This is his 12th lap on this run. Yep. This tells us what happened. Seven car. Uh -huh. Whoa. Whoa. And well, you, could seven. you could see that Pagano got slightly distracted by that as well with Mark Cheney making that off-track excursion. Here's our race leader to the tune of 20 seconds, Andre Lotterer. Still got some annoyance of rain. You can see it there on the windshield. Just continuing to spit down here. Oh, had a hard time getting the turn. You want to push hard, but you don't want to step over the line either. You put that thing in the fence and it's all yeah. bets are off. Changing conditions are not making things easy to judge that. We keep a watchful eye on the number nine Peugeot. It is coming in to stop. Justin Bell has headed towards the Audi Hospitality Center where we understand he has tracked down Alan McNish, the first of those two very frightening crashes for Audi Sport. Let's go to Justin now. Yeah, Lee, uh, Alan, first of all, on behalf of your fans, your friends, uh, it's very good to see you sitting here. Thanks, Justin. It's, uh, you know, what, nearly 23 hours ago or whatever, uh, 22 hours, and uh, sitting here without any big bruises, you know, a little bit of grazing on the shin from getting out the car and nothing else, and uh, no one injured. Uh, it's a, yeah, very fortunate situation. I mean, obviously, you've had time to digest it, and I know there's always a blackout moment where you don't really track through the, the incident, but can you just walk us through what happened? It looked like suddenly you were forced into a situation, in my opinion. You took a risk. You judged risk. What happened? Uh, basically, Timo got caught. He just spoke to him. No, I didn't realize the first part of it. He got caught a bit in traffic and then was on the dirty side and ran off uh, the track. And I ran around the outside of him, and there was a Ferrari ahead, and I went to slide down the inside before the S's. And it was Anthony Beltoise. I didn't know that at the time. And Anthony, uh, I read this morning in one of the French press, said that he just basically saw one Audi coming into the corner and one coming out, which was Timo, but he didn't realize I was alongside him and coming through. At which point, uh, his right front touched my left rear. 
as he turned down into the first part of the S's, which uh, then turned me left and into the wall. And uh, on a ranking of some spectacular career crashes, where does this one lie? It was certainly uh, quite a... It wasn't as big an impact as what it probably looked on television. I saw the TV footage, which gives a kind of funny angle of it all, to be honest with you. Uh, not Certainly not from the view I was coming down the hill, but uh, it, it was more just a long accident because it just didn't stop. It just kept on continuing, continuing. And then when the car was sitting on its side, you sort of look around and realize everything's okay. Radio to the mechanics and the engineers that you're okay and how bad is the car, but there was nothing coming back because the radio was obviously damaged with everything else. But the monocoque was perfect, absolutely perfect. It did its job stunningly well. So, so, so right up there with your Suzuka Formula 1 crash, I'm sure. Well, better. I came out of that with a few more injuries. You did. Oh, that's very true. Now, have you seen Rocky's crash? No, I haven't. No. Well, when you do, you're both going to have to get a T-shirt saying, "Mine was my crash was bigger than yours because they were both spectacular. You know, we re you're, you're part of what Le Mans folklore now. Um, what do you feel? Uh, obviously, sitting here, it's just not the way you want to end the race, but you've got one car out the front and the pressure now, you know, from you know what he's going through, don't you? I mean, a lot yeah. of pressure on him. We've been in that situation uh, a couple of times where you're leading and it's really tight towards the end. And uh, the good thing is that Andre's been pumping in the laps when he needs to and being careful when he needs to. And they've that crew has done a f superb job all through the race, as far as I've seen. Really, really good. So, you know, in that side of it, uh, I just hope they manage to pull it off, bring the big trophy home. I'm sure. Well, listen, thanks for taking the time to talk to us. You know, we'll be back here. Lanny Prochen, mate. Lanny Prochen. Great stuff, Justin. And good to see Alan in such high spirits. Absolutely. And good to hear his account of what actually occurred. So with an hour and 13 to go, there's a minute and 23, the margin between Lotterer and Paginot. Oh, you want to see the number crunching going on here in the speed announce booth. <laughs> hey, we're going to take you back. This is Paginot coming in for his second to last stop. This is why we were listening to the McNish interview. It'll be fuel only. Again, 65 litres this year, about 17 gallons. How do you been getting that fuel flow in in about 26 seconds? We've got to watch on this one to see how the two camps compare in terms of the fuel cell design and everything else. A quick wipe of the windshield. There's one more lap. 26 right now, so it's taking a few more seconds here. 29, so uh, Audi have a better fuel flow into the tank. Same restrictor and everything else, same rules, but they've got a better system in getting that diesel into the tank. These are back to live pictures now in the sister car, number eight, with Nick Manassian behind the wheel uh, in for his stop. Also second to last stop as well. Just thinking about Simon Paginot, and this race is not over yet. He could still be a Le Mans winner in just over an hour's time. What a year it's been for him. He's got high hopes to do IndyCar. He did do make his IndyCar debut at Barber Motorsports Park earlier this year, where he finished eighth behind a lot of big names and really impressed everyone. Later this year, he's going to head down to Australia to compete for Gary Rogers Motorsport in a V8 supercar on the streets of the Gold Coast. And he's very excited about that. He's a very diverse and skilled driver, the reigning American Le Mans Series champion champion he is and uh, bmw announced this weekend that three of their factory guys joey hand Andy prio and uh, dirk Mueller are going to be heading down and we also hear word that augusto farfus may join them so there may be four of those bmw factory drivers down there which has become a tremendous event scotty you were down there you i went with the best of teams <laughs> but uh, it's quite the event yeah it was good going to australia i wouldn't say the event was very good but <laughs> It was certainly a, uh, I always love going to Australia. Love being down there. I really enjoyed getting those text messages from you. My teammates just crashed. Again. We're starting from the back. <laughs> I'm not enjoying myself. <laughs> Never mind. So much more to come from Circuit de la Sarthe, Le Mans 2011. Stay with us to the end. for Team Orica Matmut. The older generation 908 was just forced to come into the pits for some additional service. Our lead car taking evasive action there. Andre Lotterer, he's had to do plenty of ducking and diving as he comes past the Oak Racing prototype. The 35 
still circulating and flying the flag for the Le Mans based Oak Racing team. Yeah, he's still gonna have to be on his toes here for the next hour or so. Just looking at the strategy here, I think Audi are gonna need two more stops for Peugeot, it'll just be one, but they hold a healthy lead, the number two car, which should allow them to do that and still maintain the lead. So the upper hand's still with Audi right now. Something we haven't mentioned is uh, this is Jacques Lacan's Labra competition team, and it could be a double victory for Corvette. It's something we haven't mentioned because Corvette Racing, the works team, leads GTE Pro, and Labra competition with Gabriel Gardel leads GTE Am. That'd be a big day for Corvette. Yeah, I was about to say the same thing. After losing the one car, you know, yep. it would still give them a, a double win. And uh, hats off to the Labra team because they allowed the Corvette factory drivers to come over and drive that car at the test, get some seat time, learn some things, try some development pieces on their car because uh, the car that they use is a year-old Corvette with the GTE AM division, as we've discussed throughout the course of this show, the cars have to have one year old technology, you're not allowed to run the latest and greatest, that's why you don't see any of the 458 Ferraris in that field, 430s only. We know that many of you will be turning on, it's just before 8 o'clock East Coast time, just before 5 West Coast, and it's just before 2 Le Mans time. What's the story? This is the story. Car number 2. Andre Lotterer, Marcel Fessler, Benoit Trollier have been in a very strong position for the majority of the race. They've been just going blow for blow, move for move with the Peugeot squad. And at the moment, the ball is in their court. It's up to Audi just to maintain this pace, not to make any mistakes. And they are looking good. They're in the position of strength versus Simon Pagano's number nine Peugeot. Couple of laps, he'll have to hit pit lane. That will give him right about an hour mark to go. They've been doing about 38 and a half minutes on a fuel run, so that last start will be half a tank of fuel that'll need to go on board. That's the story for overall honors. In P2, it's a comfortable seven lap lead for Greaves Motorsport Zyka, uh, Zytec over the Orica for the Signatech Nissan team with Christoph Bouchou, that Scott Tucker's level five team has one foot on the podium. In GTE Pro, it's the 73 machine that has done the business, Tommy Milner in his third appearance at Le Mans, Jamie has done a magical job. He's handled the pressure. He's fought off the likes of Giancarlo Fisichella and leads and leads comfortably. Yes, he does, and he led it all the way into pit lane. Tommy Milner has now gotten out of the car. Antonio Garcia has gotten in. They're not gonna change tires. They're gonna put Antonio in on the same set of tires, fresh fuel, and Antonio is now out and underway to finish this race. Greg? Robertson's in. Okay, and this is a huge story in the GTM division. You're looking at the number 83 Porsche, or, excuse me, Ferrari, crawling out. Right in front of them is the Robertson Racing Ford. This is a huge scenario. That Ferrari is wounded. They said if it's a clutch, they think they might be able to get it to the finish. It could also be diff, and they said if that's the case, they're in deep, deep trouble. Meanwhile, for Robertson Racing, that's the battle for third. They just put David Murray in the car. They are putting intermediates on. They're putting the veteran behind the wheel just because of these conditions. If it does start to sprinkle a bit, get a little bit more sketchy, uh, they want that experience behind the wheel. But if that 83 car, and as I said, it could barely make this climb out of the pits on this slight incline. That car is in deep trouble. These guys, this Robertson Racing team, uh, it has an opportunity to perhaps be on the podium. And they're thinking uh, ahead here, as I said, putting the experienced David Murray behind the wheel, who has really been the man that has helped out David Andrea Robertson make this program develop and happen and give them the coaching. And uh, they are now, the report is on the same lap. They're back a ways, but they're on the same lap. This one is on. Well, they put intermediate reins on, which, Greg, I'm a little bit uh, perplexed about. We don't see much rain out there at all. Is, uh, does it look that's to just, you? That's just it's plain, plain and ultra cautious. Yeah. The only thing that can happen, I mean, their chance is, is to beat the 83 car. 
And to do that, they just have to, you know, they're going to expect something to happen yeah. to the 83 yeah. car. Yeah. And they're just going to go out and circulate. Yeah. yeah. Putting those inters on isn't going to throw you off the road. It's just going to give you that safety net if it does start to sprinkle. I think it's a good call. If that Ferrari is really wounded, as they're saying, with the clutch issue, then he just needs to put keep putting some laps on here till the checkered flag drops. And they will assume that third position and be on the podium. What a story. Clutch or exactly diff, right. either one. Diff would be even actually worse. Lotterer lets... The Ferrari of Giancarlo Fisichella let him know that he's coming through. Just the obligatory flash of the lights as he flashes down Les Anudier, the first part of the Molsan straight, into the first chicane. A little bit of traffic. He needs to keep that lead margin, but he also needs to employ safety. Good decision making, of which he does. He hasn't always done that. He surprised us on a couple of occasions <laughs> where we've applauded him for really nice moves, but then he took us by surprise and taking some risky ones with Mark Genet, the most recent one. Lotterer's lead is a minute, 21 seconds, but as you heard Calvin mention a little earlier, we'll expect him in any moment now. Should be in on this lap. This is his 11th lap of the run. This is what they've done all day long. And then the question will be, what will they do with tyres? Will they stretch it or play it safe, put some fresh rubber on there? And even though the grip level is there, you obviously wear that tire down a little bit. If there's any debris out there, maybe that will be the safety caution. I think they have enough of a buffer in terms of the lead they have in this race. It's always fabulous to do Le Mans because you've got to tell the worldwide, the global story about all the drivers, all the teams. But because we are speed, we are American centric and we've got a 25 year old American who's just stepped from a Corvette C6R. Let's hear from Tommy Milner. Tommy Milner, your first words to me just now were crazy. What do you mean by that? That was the hardest stint in my life, for sure. You know, with the pressure of, you know, two hours to go in the race and, you know, one lap, the corner is perfectly dry and you can run your normal speed and the next lap it's soaking wet and you have to roll through in second gear at, you know, 30 mile an hour. So, <laughs> Dan, Danny Banks got me back sort of, you know, I was, I went off, once I passed a Ferrari, of course, straight away, I, I went off in the first chicane there, and I mean, I break way early, and just, I just locked, locked the fronts and lost some grip, and I, you know, I had to go wide, so, I mean, it's not over yet, so I got an hour to go, so, um, in some ways, for, relieved to be out of the car, because it's not fun out there right now, I mean, I hope, and I, I know Antonio will, 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 will do a great job, he's, he's awesome, he's the ice man, basically, he, we've, we've been checking our core body temperatures here this weekend, and he's been the coldest, so, uh, you know, fingers crossed. Tommy Milner, you're 25 years old, you're a student of the sport, and you led Giancarlo Fisichella at Le Mans, what does that feel like? Just leading at Le Mans is, is special, especially being this close to the end, I mean, just to have that opportunity here with Corvette and, and Chevrolet, you know, on their 100th anniversary for Chevrolet and the 10th anniversary for Corvette's first win here at Le Mans. You know, I'm 25 years old, you know, American kid driving American icon. It's uh, very special for sure. And it would mean a lot, you know, to me to win this race. I've had bad luck here in the past and uh, this, would, this would make up for all that. Great job. You did everything that they asked of you. Go get some rest. Thank you. And he's only ever driven American muscle cars here at Le Mans. The Panos and Esperante and the Corvette C6R. And he's less than an hour away from standing on top of the podium. See you in a moment. and one more is what's anticipated going after that windscreen fuel going in this audi team very calm very deliberate uh, this is uh, crunch time here and this is when you even have to pull it down a notch don't get too excited make sure everything is done make sure every ounce of fuel goes into this beautiful r18 it is done that car is underway very efficient stop and they are and once again, no tires. They are doing everything they can to maximize uh, time and off 
perfectly confident in the Michelins, as you would expect. And they're just going to need half a tank on that next fuel run, but this is the first time they made a liar out of me. They've done 11 lap runs all day long. What does Audi do? Maybe it's a slap in the face to Peugeot. They just did a 12 lap run. Yeah. Remarkable stuff. But Scott, do you think there's a reason for that? I think that uh, what's been going on is the pace has been slowed down a little bit. We're seeing some, some rain coming down, and you just can't run the pace that you've been able to run. And with that, you can save a bit of fuel. So the Audi engineers, I'm, I, they are absolutely on top of how much fuel they can go or, or can't go lap to lap to lap and made a calculated move on going for the number 12. And I think what we may have been seeing, we talked about the fuel flow rate, the fact that the Peugeot has been doing those 12 lap runs, their fuel stops have been two to three seconds longer, but they're probably having to put a full fuel load in. Audi, you know, the lap here, getting that extra lap is eight and a half miles. They may have seven more miles left in the tank. And so the, what that means is when they're filling the tank up, they're not having to put 65 liters in, they're putting like 60 liters in. That obviously speeds up that fuel flow. And it kind of forces their hand on their final pit stop to take that half a tank of fuel and not take tires. Go on to that fifth fifth stint on those tires. Well, they're, they're kind of in a position now where they're not going to change tires. You're right. going to go yeah. to the checkered flag because if you're going to do a splash to the end, just enough fuel to get you to the checkered, you're not going to want to take that time to put on four. Yeah, they would have done it just there where they had to take on the full fuel load and the tires in, but by not taking tires, they'll just go now with that half a tank of fuel and no tires, I'm cost sure. them 59 seconds to be on pit road there, so that's the number. They had a minute 21 lead the lap before, and it's 22 second lead after that pit stop. Updating you on another story that we have been telling you about in GTE AM. This is that 83 JMB rating Ferrari for the final slot on the podium in GTE AM. And it swung the Robertson's way, hasn't it, Greg? It has indeed. Actually, Dave Murray was able to run this car down and get by it, but it is now in the garage once again. And as you can see, they're cleaning it up. They're just, they're not even really working on it. So uh, my guess is at this point, they're just trying to get it cleaned up. They'll send it out maybe for that last lap just to be able to show a finish and bring it by. But uh, tough, tough day for the JMB racing crew. So competitive for so long. But now that car is parked in the garage. And that means Robertson Racing on the podium in their first visit to Le Mans. This is a remarkable story in the making. Of course, there's still some time to go. There you go. And in their words, for them to come to Le Mans in a Ford GT at that car's ancestral home, Le Mans, Circuit de la Sarre, makes it even more special. We'll see. There's still 51 minutes to go. I'll tell you what, Simon Pagino has done a great job, and I think the faith that Peugeot have put in him, he was the fastest man in qualifying for Peugeot and uh, then they're put him back in for this final stint and that really makes a statement in terms of the belief in this young man he's got a tremendous career going by the way uh, just on that story with Robertson Racing what makes that very special you talked about the ancestral home of the Ford GT it was Dave Robertson he said what really fired this whole thing was as a kid watching those GT Ford at Le Mans, wide world of sports in the 60s. So, boy, talk about coming full circle and a great connection. And by the way, the class leading number 41 entry from Greaves Motorsports in P2 just completing what might well be their last stop. They are back out. With the young rookie Olivier Lombard behind <laughs> the wheel. There's so many good storylines throughout this entire field. There's the Robertson's Ford GT with Dave Murray behind the wheel. Shared some time with Dave the other day, and he said, boy, it's a, uh, it's a real reminder of how fast time flies. I can't believe it's been 10 years since I've been here. But, it, boy, is it great to be back. In his second in the GT class uh, with Johnny Molum and Sasha Marson back in 2000. He's actually part of the Porsche factory team uh, with the open-top Porsche back in 1998 alongside James Weaver. Didn't go his way that day, but uh, great for him to return and... Uh, he has really mentored the Robertsons. He talks them through every aspect of this racing game, and uh, this will give him tremendous satisfaction, not only from the driver's seat, but to bring along two uh, drivers who don't have a lot of seat time and get them on the podium at Le Mans. And they've kept the car clean. You can see that. They haven't run into things. They kept it out of trouble, reduced pace or whatever. we got to get to the finish. Here's Pat Long. Got to get that checkered flag. Patrick Long knows how to do that. 
And it's nice from a driver's coming in the first time to have somebody look up to, have somebody talk to the track about, uh, be in that situation to really kind of get some sort of a feel what to experience at Le Mans for your first time. He did some sim time prior to the test. Darren Turner, the Aston Martin drivers, has a simulator over in England. They came over, did some simulator work, and uh, even the week of Le Mans, after the first day, they had an onboard camera. They then had Andrea sit in the driver's seat and play it on the dash and just get her through the motions, just trying to get into the rhythm of the racetrack. So they worked every angle to get those guys comfortable with this Le Mans circuit. That's the GTM class leading car. That is the Labra competition Chevrolet of Gabrielle Gardel, the Corvette running strong. It's a really good team representation as well because they're 70. They came here with two different cars. Labra competition, they're one, two in class. And then as we mentioned, the Robertson Ford GT. This is Joey Hand in the 56 BMW team Schnitzer M3. It's the same, the same two cars that they ran here last year with significant aero updates. And they were determined. They showed good pace at the, uh, at, in qualifying and in practice, despite the uh, hiccup that Andy Prio had with his car that damaged the front of it. They showed good pace. They showed that they may have been able to go uh, with the likes of Corvette and Ferrari. It hasn't worked out that way. However, a podium will be some sweetener for a frustrating campaign yet again. However, a lot better result than what it was last year. Absolutely. They've learned a lot. The car's been very fast. They've got some straightaway speed this year. And uh, as a question of what might have been, that one misfire, correcting that electrical gremlin, that cost them two laps, and that's exactly the margin they are away from the lead. So after that, the cars run really, really well. Different is too, it doesn't all end here, Scott, does it? Because this is part of the Intercontinental Le Mans Cup, of which BMW is fighting the likes of this car here, AF Corsa for Ferrari. It's all about that Manufacturers Championship in the ILMC. All about the Manufacturers Championship, uh, all about BMW when they're talking about it. When you come back to Le Mans and, and the disastrous year they had last year, to come back, yeah, it may not be exactly where they want to be, but wow, it's such a huge step forward from the disastrous year we saw double points here this weekend so this is massive I mean it's really if you don't have a good point score here it will really dig a massive hole in the championship it's like having two problems throughout the course of the championship season rolled into one Antonio Garcia on board in the Corvette so you're working twice as hard to lose twice as many points that's right <laughs> that's not good what's the magic link between Corvette and victory here at Le Mans perhaps it's this guy the quietly spoken Spaniard, Antonio Garcia. The last time Corvette stood on top of the podium here at La Sarf, this man was part of that successful trio. He and Jan Magnussen and Johnny O'Connell. Johnny O, no longer part of this program. He's got World Challenge commitments with Cadillac. And we know what happened to Jan Magnussen today. Very uncharacteristic to see Mags uh, involved in an incident like that. Here is the level five Lola HPD machine. Still third in class, third in P2, Christoph Bouchou driving. Well, Christoph has an overall win here at Le Mans. He has an overall win at the Daytona 24 hour race. He's won at the Spa 24. He's got a lot of experience under his belt. He and Scott Tucker have been tied at the hip for three seasons now and uh, just done a tremendous job in mentoring Scott Tucker. He's a difficult teammate to have around. Uh, a lot of guys who have cool driven with him <laughs> have a lot of stories to tell. But uh, he can get the team done. You talk to David Stone, he believes in him. And uh, they made a great, great, wise choice in Joao Barbosa being part of their ILMC team on a permanent basis this year. He will be at every race in their ILMC campaign. This, this is the car that they ran at Sebring at the 12-hour event after their other car was severely damaged at the Spa event, round two of the ILMC. ILMC. And it's, a, uh, it's been a good collaborative effort, hasn't it? Um, doing their work with the Status GP team based out of Silverstone. Collaboration, they've brought their best staff over from the US based in Madison, Wisconsin, teaming up with the British team. And Mark Chitteron, uh, along with David Stone, it's really been a two-team effort, if you'd like to say, but come together as one. Very, very effective. And now the rain has all but stopped. Sohail Ayari 
who is one position ahead of Christoph Bouchou, second in the P2 class. They, at the moment, are uh, not within a shout of bridging that gap. They're still seven laps behind the class leading Zytec of Olivier Lombard. A lot of these guys now just thinking about how do I get to the checkered flag? Just run hard enough to get to the end. Less than three quarters of an hour to go. And throughout the nighttime hours, you just do whatever you have to <laughs> to keep yourself awake and amused. <laughs> With 40 minutes left in the 2011, 24 hours of Le Mans, they got the trophies up on the podium already. Very organized, they know the routine and so too to Peugeot. The seven is in, the uh, Mark Genet car coming to a stop for the final time. Dr. Wolfgang Ulrich, boss of Audi Sport on the left and Ralph Jutner on the right. They're, ha they're having some serious discussions about those last stops and how much fuel that the number nine Pagano Peugeot needs and how things are really going to shake out after all the last stops have been made to that run to the checkered flag. Well, once you get inside that fuel window, which for the Audis was around the 38 minute mark, but the fact that they went a little bit further, that extra lap, the 12 lap mark, but he's running at a hotter pace on this stint. So I think they'd probably be back at 11. So once you get inside that mark, you can make that pit stop at any time, even though you don't, you know, need a full fuel load and run the other one dry. So strategy involved there, but I think they have enough margin to play either way. They could pit yeah. him early, they could wait and almost, you know, run him dry and then top him up. I'd wait, I'd wait to run almost dry because then the amount of time you spend in the pits is going to be shorter. This is the second place car of Simon Pagano. So once those final stops occur, we will see it on a team huddle here, a team discussion. No mistakes. We've got our final <laughs> stop coming up and then it's a flat out race to the end. And remember, we've seen what the sister Peugeots will do. Where will they put the seven? Where will they put the eight on track? Will it be just run a little bit of disturbance, a little bit of interruption and interference with the lead with the number two Audi? The Peugeot guys are watching the world feed. They saw the Audi guys hugging, so they got a group <laughs> <Yeah>. hug too. <laughs> <laughs> That's good sportsmanship there. It's going to be interesting to see because you can play dirty or you can play, yeah. hey, you know what, we both gave it our best and here's how it shakes out. There's so much on the line for this race. Well, the Peugeot has expendable cars. That's the difference, isn't it? I mean, they can, they can play strategy. Um, I don't think they would because there's a lot of respect between these two teams. But this is, like you just said, a very, very big race to win. They were in the Audi hospitality, I think it was 2008, when they had their victory and yeah. uh, everyone was celebrating. And suddenly a couple of the Peugeot mechanics walked in and there was immediate round of applause from everyone inside the Audi hospitality and that has now become a ritual where you know whoever wins the race entertains the losing crew to come on over have a beer trade some shirts and uh, pretty cool stuff I mean it's a fierce rivalry on the track they'll try anything in the book to try and win this thing but when it's all over there's a year till the next one Best and unf team, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> when we were at Peugeot the other day, they said, we love the tradition, we love the sportsmanship, we love the Sunday night celebration, trading the shirts. The only problem, we always seem to be wearing the Audi shirts because <laughs> yeah. this is our fifth year now and we've only won once. Here we go, the number two is in. Final stop. Oh, and Lotterer gets a little bit sideways there. Coming to the stop to observe the pit lane speed limit. Final time, you saw the pump-up routine of the Audi crew. They know this is the final one today. It's only four laps on this run, but the reason being that inside that fuel window. It'd be interesting if they go for tires or if they leave the tires on. Greg's there. Lotter is in, and they are going for tires. Kettler brings them to a stop, and they bring the tires out, obviously looking to have everything in order for this last short sprint to the finish. Best rubber on the car as possible. Here we go. This is crucial. Make sure this locks in. No problems. No issues. No. Oh, a little bit of a hang up on the left rear. Not significant. A second or two, maybe. Just caught in the bodywork. Nothing major. All right, here we go. They got the left front done. And now, whoa, one to go. The right rear. He, oh, and it's a little slow coming off. Another couple of seconds lost. However, it is on. Car 
is down. Kettler says go. A little slow on the restart. The Audi is gone. Yeah. Let's get right down to Justin Bell. Listen to the crowd. And while you were changing tyres, my car is already up your derriere as you leave pit lane. The Peugeot's just, just swapped the drinks bottle, made sure the guy was refreshed, and put fuel in it. You know, that's... But let me show you what it's all about. Look at this, guys. Come out here with me. Here it is. Up there, the hardware is already out on the podium, and the clock there says 35 minutes and 39 seconds to go. That is what everyone is competing for. Scott and I have got the small one at home. I know that. But that's what it is. What a great competition. You should have seen the atmosphere in the Peugeot as they headed off to try and track down the Audi. Great stuff. I tell you what it's also all yeah. about. Did you see Dr. Yeah. Wolfgang Ulrich was brought to tears? He was rubbing his hands together, clapping, saying, come on. We are within 35 minutes of a victory against all adversity when two of their cars were destroyed. But this is a race now with just 35 minutes left. It is a fair, square, one-on-one -on -one fight. Audi versus Peugeot. Yeah. Lotterer versus Pagano. Peugeot responded there to Audi coming down pit lane. They immediately brought Simon in, topped him up, didn't take tyres. That saved them. There's a little bobble on the Audi pit stop. This is a lot closer than we anticipated. And you could hear the crowd. All the crowd went crazy when that Peugeot left the pit first. Just a few seconds separate first and second. And this is going to be a run to the checkered flag. These guys are going to have to go for it. The nice thing is it looks like the rain has passed now. Rob Bell in the JMW Ferrari gives space to the class leading car. Here comes Simon Pagano though. And watch this, Dr. Wolfgang Ulrich, no one higher than him in Audi Sport. He's the boss and was pleased with that stop. Greg. Yeah, just to let you know, remember, uh, they had two issues on those tire changes, two times. It hung up just a little bit. That was probably four seconds, and it, it was this close. As the Audi hit pit out under the Rolex green, the, the Peugeot came right by the Audi pit. That's why the crowd was going crazy. It was that close at the end of the pit stop exchange. But the Audi is on new tires. It is on new tyres. That may give them a little bit more grip in this final stint here, but Simon Passion is going to wring the neck of that Peugeot for all it's worth. It could come down to who gets the brakes in traffic because this is a lot, lot closer. I mean, suddenly taking tyres, that's about 20 seconds, and then the hang up a little bit. So their lead that I anticipated has been halved right here. And this is money time, and this is why the drivers do what they do and, and why you put your best... Uh, your best pilot in there. I mean, you absolutely have to drive as hard as you can trying to get as much out of that car because this is it. I mean, this is Le Mans. This is going for that the victory of the 24, and it's time to get it done. If you got anything left, you are going to put it on the table. Oh, and by the way, you're a Frenchman in a French car <laughs> at the French Classic. <laughs> Simon Paginot, who calls America home, Indianapolis, Indiana. He's a split man because this is where he was born and raised, but he calls America home now, and he dearly loves the American culture, the racing culture, living in America. But this could be a magical moment in that young man's career. Can he bridge that gap to Andre Lotterer? What does this first lap out tell us? Lotterer has come across with a 4.37 and a 4.20. Look at that. That margin is 6.4 seconds. We'll continue to monitor that, and so will Olivier Canal and Dr. Wolfgang Ulrich. Half an hour to go here at Le Mans. Don't go anywhere.
24 hours of Le Mans, some magical historical shots. It's like a juicer, isn't it? It squeezes every emotion you have in your body out of you. Right now, Simon Pagano is trying to squeeze everything out of his Peugeot 908. However, it is going against him on this flying lap while we're away. Andre Lotterer has put the best part of four seconds on the Frenchman. Yeah, 328.1 versus a 331.3, and that's got to be the tyres coming into effect there. Fresh rubber gives you a little bit more grip. Simon's on well-worn rubber, but that was their only play, I think, they had to do there. They had to roll the dice a little bit and try and narrow that gap that they did by coming out relatively close to the leader. The three sectors around this track, it gives you various time splits. The Audi crew, we had shots in that last commercial break, watching those individual sector splits, and they were fist pumping. They were high-fiving. They were elbowing each other, saying he's getting that advantage. He's starting to stretch it. Our man is in a stronger and stronger position. They were fastest in sector one and sector three, almost identical in sector two. Yeah, and that's down the straightaways. That's basically from Tet Rouge all the way to Malsana. It includes the two chicanes, but mainly the straightaways. That's where the arrow of the Peugeot has an effect but we're oh quick spin there in the background see the motion here see the emotion on Dr. Ulrich but through that final sector which includes that Porsche curves Lauderer had a second and a half on the Peugeot and that's where that downforce is really coming into play and those tires right here too. yeah remember how Simon Pagano was a part of that dynamic finish at the 12 hours of Sebring driving for his much beloved Highcroft racing team and that was against the Orica Matmut 908. This is against the Audi R18 and Andre Lotterer. 25 minutes to go. And now it looks fast, by gosh, you know. <laughs> he now is going. Right back up. It's uh, time to uh, get it done. He's doing a fantastic job. Running at pace. Well, Stretching can, out a little bit more breathing room between he and the Peugeot. You can tell, though, he's driving right to the limit. I mean, he's really pushing hard. That car we saw spin in the background, I've got a feeling it may have been the number 70 Porsche for Labra competition of Pascal Gibbon. I think we've got a replay. Yeah, it is. Right in front of Simon Pagano. As he goes through Arnage. Gets away unscathed, however. All right, what's the gap, boys? It's grown out to 11.1 wow. seconds. 11 seconds in two laps. It's gone from six to 11 seconds. Power, strength to Audi's corner. A big question mark from here on out. Hopefully there won't be any more rain. None of that annoyance. Audi has, a, has a, the pace, most certainly, on the Peugeot. Once he gets that bit of time stretched out, he can just kind of pace the Peugeot. Yeah, that Lottery allows you Pagano. That allows you to breathe in traffic. I mean, you don't want to have someone five seconds behind you because that can suddenly go and suddenly you look in your mirrors and the rival is right there. When you get it to 10, 12, we've seen delta between a clear lap and a traffic lap up to 12 seconds in this race. So that's about the margin he is right now. So he can afford to be a little bit more patient. There we go. The two bosses of Audi Sport and Peugeot Sport, Dr. Wolfgang Ulrich and Olivier Canel and the emotions either side of this battle. High emotions, we should say. And these two young men driving these cars, car two and car number nine, they have both won championships in other parts of the world, in other categories in the motorsport world. Neither has ever won the 24 hours of Le Mans. And remember, when we had that rain a little bit earlier in this race, Simon Pagina was dynamic. He got the hammer down. He's really cutting into the lead of the Audi. So that may be his one chance here. If we get some drizzle, his car appeared to be hooked up, but his tires are well worn. Will he have the grip needed? Nicola Lapierre gives the uh, other Peugeot, Simon Pagina, some room. The Orica Matt Mood driver moves aside to make an easy path for Pagina. Time running out, 23 and a half to go. We're gonna sneak away for our final commercial break. When we come back, we will take you all the way to the checkered flag here at Le Mans. Can this man here, Simon Pagano, the reigning ALMS champ, do anything about Andre Lotterer and his Audi? We'll find out. Less than 20 minutes remaining. 
And these guys know that they're in a position of strength. These guys being Audi Sport with their one and only R18. We've got all hands on deck here. Lee Diffie, Calvin Fish, Dorsey Schrader, Scott Pruitt. We welcome back Brian Till. How about this, mate, for the final 19 and a half minutes? Oh, it's incredible. I've been watching the last couple of hours, and, you know, we've talked all day long for the past 23 hours and, uh, what, 40 minutes about the downforce differences between these two cars. And, yes, the Peugeot has the straight line speed, but at this time of the race, with a dirty racetrack, a little bit of drizzle falling, that downforce is a benefit, not only when you're up by yourself. We just watched Lauder through traffic in the Porsche Curve still gain two seconds a lap on Pagina. I have a question for you. You've been off four hours. You only watched <laughs> this for the last two. What no, you I took a nap. <laughs> you know, you'd think at, the end of, think at the end of the fourth stint that a driver would be pretty tired and weary, but, you know, there's this thing called adrenaline. And 14, 18 minutes to go. Man, these guys are Adrenaline, lift the focus, car. and victory. Yeah. You, that's these, that's, that's they a huge motivator right carry there. this car on its back across if you had to. Last time across the line, it was 14 seconds, the margin. It's down to 12.7. We'll continue to monitor that for you over the next 18 and a half minutes, and in particular across the three various sectors to let you know how close Simon Pagano is getting. What does Andre Lotterer do? You know, there's not too many long-term members of this Audi Sport family who have not enjoyed victory here at Le Mans. That man there, Dindo Capello, has enjoyed three. However, the three guys who occupy this car, they're new to the Audi family, and they are yet to post Le Mans 24-hour victories. Today could be their day. Andre Lauder, all he has to do is pace. He just has to pace the Peugeot right now, Pagano. 12 seconds is a huge gap, almost 13 seconds, and he just needs to get to the checkered flag right now. And communication. I mean, just they need to be talking to him, telling him everything that he's doing, where his gaps are, where his splits are. They got those segment times just like we do the sector times. You know, just keep this thing going for a little bit longer. You have to wonder who they're on the phone to. Yeah. Sometimes they'll actually have a plane circulating to look for weather and stuff. They use the radar, of course, but it's going to be close. I mean, he can't afford to breathe much. Traffic has had a huge factor here this weekend. We talk about the new regulations. These P1s do not have the acceleration that they once had. That has made it tremendously difficult for these drivers to be cautious, yet maintain lap time around this race. Circuit. What I'm talking about is pacing Pagano, not get la letting up, but just pacing him. Yeah. He's yeah, going to have a good understanding of where that gap is to the second place. Gavin, you're getting the call. I think they want some advice here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, guys, if you take a step back and have a, have a uh, think about the big events in motorsport this year, if we talk about sp sports cars first up, Rolex 24 at Daytona, the old fella down the end of the commentary booth here got another victory, but the story there again, Joey Hand, first victory with Graham Rahal. Terrific story there. Daytona 500, Trevor Bain. Wasn't that a surprise? Indy 500. It looked like it was going to be J.R. Hildebrand, and then Danny Weldon got his second victory. Just coming in to do that one event. Sebring was interesting with Team Orica Matmut doing it, and Highcroft almost winning. There's been so many intriguing stories, and if you were to lay a bet down at the beginning of this weekend, coming into this weekend, Nobody would have backed car number two. It's, of course, the famed car number three with McNish, Capello, and Mr. Lamont, Tom Christensen, all the defending winners. These are the guys that nobody paid much attention to, and it's turning their way here at LaSalle. I think the biggest surprise, though, is you break a 90 on the goal. <laughs> I'm pumped. I'm pumped. That's why, that is why you run a three-car team or a multi-car team, because you never know what's going to happen. And, and the two cars that you would have thought would be the ones that would be leading right now, of course, we're eliminated quickly, or at least the first, with McNish in the first hour. You don't want to let up, as we see here in traffic, but at the same time, Look you at can't that. Oh. give up too much. RML car just wanders a little bit wide coming off the Porsche curves there. You're going to be on your toes. This is really nail-biting time for everyone, the drivers, the crews. Just watching, Dindo Capello has a smile on his face. He's not feeling the pressure right now. He'd love to see Audi pull it off. Is this Dindo's last run at Le Mans in one of these prototypes? You know, you mentioned Trevor Bain. You mentioned these other young drivers, the three young drivers in this car. And I think that communication is important over these last 15 minutes. Stay in his head. Don't let him think about anything but the job at hand. You give him the segment times, you give him the speeds, you give him the gaps, and you keep him focused. Don't leave him alone with himself. Lee talked about it. J.R. Hildebrand, 
you know, was yeah. he talked through that final lap. We heard the radio com communication bring it home. He needed some information, Scott. He needed to know what the gap was and what he could afford to do. We talked about that over and over and over after the Indy 500, and that's it. A young driver, a rookie driver, he needs as much help from the team big picture, the experience to get that sucker to the checkered flag. This is, I'm sure, absolutely what's going on right now. Push hard, pace that Peugeot, don't take any unnecessary risks in traffic. Oh, and just I'm sorry, so <laughs> <laughs> They go three wide at 190 miles an hour. And we said earlier that these, this trio of drivers in this car, Trellier, Fessler and Lotterer are anything but rookies. They're far from rookies. They're championship winning drivers in various categories. However, their experience at Le Mans is not like their Audi counterparts or like those at Peugeot, particularly for this man steering the wheel, feeling the weight, all that pressure of the four rings. It's only his third visit to Le Mans. First year in a customer car, last year part of the Audi factory program, and this year, do they rise to the top? We'll know in 13 and a half minutes. How did Andre get this opportunity? Well, he ran with Carlos a couple of years ago. Jill Hausner is in charge of the technical department at Audi, was running that squad that year. He super impressed him. He wanted him back on the regular factory team. And then Benoit Trullier is a really big buddy of Lotterer and he was brought in, drafted in as well. And it's all about the chemistry of the group. They have a lot of belief in these young drivers and the chemistry between those three guys driving the car this weekend has been tremendous. And traffic certainly not playing into the hands of Pagano right now. You saw him got jammed up between three cars. That'll cost him a couple seconds. You don't just fall into one of these rides is what you're saying, Gavin. I mean, these guys are very deserving and they're looked at quite hard before they even have any type of an opportunity even to test. Scotty, you nailed it there. You said it's going to cost him a couple of seconds. 2.2 seconds in segment two. Pagano just lost to our leader. You just saw a quick shot there of the legend Reinhold Yost. There's Ralph Jutner. There's only been two occasions when Audi has won in this amazing uh, decade, a little bit more than a decade since they've been running here at Le Mans, where it's a team not run by Reinhold Yost that won. There was one victory to Audi Team Go, one victory to champion Audi, of course, that American victory with Dave Mirage's group. The rest belonged to Reinhold Yost and Audi Sport. And Brad Kettler obviously is a big part of that champion win here, and he's going to be a play a big part here today, really leading this team through his experience and guidance. He said last year these guys were wide-eyed and green. It was really a learning experience. Well, they came up second this year. They're looking to go one better. In a sea of Germans, there are only two Americans involved, Dominic Zeitler and Brad Kettler. And that's a huge compliment to those guys. It really is. They are really buried in the heart of Audi. I mean, Brad spends so much time throughout the course of the year involved with his sports car project, also the R8 race car project as well. And uh, they truly believe in him. This will be a tremendous, tremendous day for him if they can pull it off. And of these three drivers, it was Marcel Fessler who's really been invisible. He hasn't done anything dramatic. He did his job, went out and ran the pace. We saw Trillier with some fantastic moves, some daring moves in traffic. Water carrying the weight, as you said, Lee on his shoulders to the checkered flag. Fessler almost invisible, but doing his job, a very valuable part of this team. We talked within the break and said, uh, Who's the most valuable player and to a man in this room who all said they all are? We look at the, the split now, 16 and a half seconds, just over 16 and a half seconds between the Audi and the Peugeot. It continues to grow. Yeah, I think some of that was traffic there. There you see tears in the eye of Olivier, in the eyes of Olivier Canel. And uh, he realizes that there's been so much effort put into this brand new race car. It's more of an evolution with this 908 than revolution that we see with the R18. But nonetheless, they have done tremendous work. Their car has been on the track since last August. They have done 11 35-hour tests. They have really put their heart and soul into this project. And right now, with 10 minutes to go on the board, they look like they're going to come up a little bit short. These guys, the top two, are going to soak up much of the uh, TV attention in this final 10 minutes. So let's give an important shout-out and acknowledgement to American teams and drivers in the other classes because we're going to have American teams and drivers and cars on the podium in the other three classes. That is phenomenal. Scott Tucker's Level 5 uh, team with Christoph Bushu at the wheel is third in the P2 class. It's the only American team in prototypes. In GTE Pro, 
It's looking like an American victory with 10 minutes to go. Antonio Garcia for Corvette Racing leads the way. Joey Hand is also going to be on the podium in his BMW. And in GTE Am, Andrea, David Robertson and Dave Murray continue to hold on to their third spot at the team's debut performance at Circuit de la Sarre. So many wonderful storylines here in 2011. And sports car racing alive and well. You look through GTE Pro and you look at the different marks. We've talked about that was Chevrolet, Ferrari, BMW make up the podium there. Three different chassis manufacturers in the top three in the LMP2 category. We've got diversity, we've got competition, and as I said, sports car racing alive and well. The IMSA performance, Matt Mootkar, the 76 of Raymond Narak, who knows how to win here at Le Mans. He's been a class winner in GT before, stays wide, gives Andre Lotter a room through Indianapolis. Yeah, clear road ahead right now. He's really into a nice rhythm, really fast lap times, 3.27.3, just two seconds off the fastest lap of the race that was set by Andre. Back on lap 2.29, we're now on lap 3.51. Can't help think about the GTE Pro class. I know we're paying a lot of attention to prototype and for overall victory, but we heard from Corvette Racing Program leader Doug Feehan. Remember, it's Corvette's 100th birthday. He said, I could not have written this script any better for this car to be in a position to go to victory lane, to be on the top step of the podium at Le Mans. We couldn't ask for it to be any better. What a great story for Corvette, for the whole team. After that tragic crash with Magnuson, his team car back out in front. And you soak up, you soak that up too, mate. You were part of the Corvette history. You were part of that very first winning trio in 2001 for Corvette Racing. So I know that you'll enjoy it. In less than eight minutes' time, the Bowtie Boys can take that checkered flag still out in front in GT Pro. Tell you what, Simon Pagner was driving the wheels off this thing, hustling through the four chicanes there. Oh, he gets a little bit wide there. So a sprinkle on the lens of that car Maybe, camera. Yeah, there is. Right I here. think there's some dampness on that racetrack right now. You saw Simon turn into that chicane there and got a little bit wide. Had to correct his line for the next one. Stuff you got to really watch for on an eight-mile track, eight and a half miles. It can be getting wet in one area. Look on the windscreen here. Most of that's just dirt, though, I think. Water are down the Molson at three and a half minutes per lap and looking at the clock it should be another three laps he'll get to the line after two laps with still a little time on the clock <laughs> perhaps <laughs> three more <laughs> laps yeah, <to> <laughs> off. Exactly. there's no cruise he can't lap slow up enough yeah. 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 normally when it's well in hand you'll see a form finish and some cruising to the yeah. line that will not be not happening today, today. And you see the stress on the men. There's Mr. Lamont, Tom Christensen. But you see the stress on the faces of Olivier Canal and Dr. Wolfgang Ulrich. The reason why, they're the gentlemen who have to face the board yeah. of Peugeot and of Audi and explain why they're spending tens of millions of dollars to go sports car racing. The filter down effect, the relevance to road car and production car technology and development and production. It's all born here on the racetrack. They're here to prove a point about diesel technology, about the strength of carbon fiber, about various technologies led lights for instance that have gone from the audi race car to the audi road car it's all about what they do here on the racetrack and it's that they can say that their technology is better that is best and 24 hours what a better way to prove it right here right now the amount of time and effort and energy that goes into these teams before they get here the amount of cycle time on every piece and part on that car uprights and engine Headlights. I mean, every piece and part on those cars that we're looking at them right now. I mean, it's an am am amazing achievement that these guys are doing. And in a few minutes, when they let those fans over the fences, you're going to see the purchasers, the buyers, the fans <laughs> of the mark, and a whole lot of them. We talked to Ulrich has spoken recently about the fact that they have decided not to enter Formula One. The question has been asked once again. He said, no, we remain in sports cars with its relevance to road cars. A little more the cars do on a full run, as we saw last year, without all of the caution, about 325 miles more than a Formula One car does in a complete season. So it's a true test of endurance, and that speed includes pit stops, and uh, 20 miles an hour faster, almost half the fuel use. So this diesel technology, they came out with that TDI petrol powered engine, that was revolutionary. And then they came here with diesel and won first time out. Can you hold your breath for five minutes? And every 
year, every game. year it seems like more technology. And Calvin, you pointed it out when we asked Dr. Ulrich about the V6 engine and all the extra space that was left with inside the confines of that chassis. He smiled and said, so that perhaps we can add other systems in the future. Will <laughs> we see Audi yet again as we look forward to 2012? Will there be a diesel hybrid or perhaps some other type power plant in the back of the four rings? Yeah, I think it's broken suspension. Yeah, it's not a tire. It looks like that right rear has a lot of camber to it. And, and just remember, it's never over right. until it's over. Four I mean, and a half still minutes. Got four and a half minutes. And we always refer to the Indy 500 this year. Like right there, we've got a wounded car. You never know which way it's going to go. Shinji Nakano behind the wheel of the Oak Racing 49 stays wide. It's fourth in class in P2, and time on his side. He should get there. Hugh Deshonak coming to speak with his dear friends at Peugeot, Olivier Canel, with four minutes to go. You talk about the investment, Lee, and uh, when you drive into the Le Mans circuit and you see just the hospitality units alone, multi-story, they're like buildings that they erect for this one event. The investment is massive. There is no quit in Simon Pagano. You look at his lap times, they have stayed consistent. He is pressing on. Just over three minutes and 40 seconds left to go here after almost a 24-hour battle. It should just be one more lap for Lauder as it comes to the line the next time. Pagano will not quit until he crosses the line. Then it's mayhem <laughs> from that point yes, forward. And it is mayhem. What, a, what an incredible day. A 24-hour period. We've seen tragedy. We've seen excitement. I mean, fill of emotions on, on both ends of the spectrum, but now coming down to these final laps. Not to discount Pagano's teammates, but his commitment to this program. Remember, he started here three times before for a non-finish. He, his home is in Indianapolis. He has been away from his home ever since Sebring, committed to this program. They did fitness training in Toulouse. They did group bonding, team building in Chamonix, whether that would have been uh, mountain climbing. They did rock climbing. They did a bunch of stuff. And for Olivier Canel, they have worked so hard and they've been so close. It's 17 seconds away. And we've only got two and three quarter minutes to go. And there's gonna be a flood of emotions based on what we've gone through over the last 24 hours. And it's gonna be this lap plus one more looking yep. at the clock. It's be Lauder, I believe. Is this down and towards Indianapolis? Yeah, it comes past the Pro Speed GT car. It's been a good run today for Mark Goosens and Marco Holzer and Jart van Lager. It got away from them at the end though, but they were one of the strongest Porsche cars for the majority of this race in GT Pro. <laughs> See the drama that is endurance racing. You saw it on Olivia Cannell's face. They have tried so hard to target this one event. And yes, the ILMC Manufacturers Championship is certainly important to Peugeot, but it really is about Le Mans, and he cannot believe in his heart of hearts that it has slipped away yet again. And I'm a firm believer in if a car looks right, it's quick. And I tell you what, I've not believed, even though they won it last year, I have not believed in the Audi design. It just didn't look right. And you hate to criticize the best in the business. But this car is the business. I mean, you go around this, the technology is amazing. And it's been fast. It's the first time Audi have really had the fastest car here since 2006, since Peugeot have been in the game. They have always showed up at Le Mans with the fastest machinery. Audi have won it with strategy and reliability for the last few years. Second to last time, Lotterick comes across the line with a minute remaining. This is it, 8.4 miles to go, and Andre Lotter, Marcel Fasler, Bernard Trillier will take home a victory that they will cherish and remember for the rest of their lives. What a story. As a driver, you just want to get, get back. I mean, you're running hard. You want to be smart and you're feeling everything inside that car right now. The team will be giving him the gap. 15 and a half seconds back there. He can afford to wait in traffic. Yes. He will be cautious on this lap. You would have to assume he's not going to be taking any risk whatsoever. But it really looks like he's, the corner speeds are still really high. I mean, he's really working the car right now. You don't want to fall off too much and lose your rhythm, and then you start skating off, making mistakes. Tell you what, Ralph Jutner there talking to Dr. Ulrich has been stoic throughout the course of this event. They had the accidents. Everyone kept calm. 
and they went about and executed with the one car they had left in this race. The overall leader comes up on the GTE Pro leader. That's Antonio Garcia for Corvette Racing. There is another class leading car ahead, another Corvette for Labra Competition. So three of the four class leaders all here on track together. The Rolex clock comes to zero. And Andre Lotterer is on the way home. And Calvin, you mentioned the crashes there. Think about the, the ebb and flow of emotion within that Audi camp when they did not know about the health and well-being of two of their star drivers, Alan McNish and Mike Rockefeller, in two of the most spectacular crashes you will see in sports car racing. And fortunately, fortunately, both are okay. We've heard from Alan. We know that Rocky spent the night in hospital just for precautionary measures, but he is okay as well. And think about how you have to win this race. It has to be flawless. There has not been one problem with either of these front-running cars. And Andre Lotterer, who started the day holding a Japanese flag. He lives in Tokyo. He spends the majority of the year down there racing in Formula Nippon and Super GT. He held the flag with Benoit Trellier, Loic Duval and Shinji Nakano to say, Japan, we are thinking of you. Just because it has been three months since that horrific tsunami and earthquake down there we have not forgotten we are still raising awareness into indianapolis for the final time last year it was three r15 buses side by side at the line this year one lone audi remains on track and it remains in the lead audi flags flying right now oh boy can you imagine that hospitality area tonight? Check your flag. <laughs> get it home baby everybody's holding their breath and this young man, he's not even 30 yet, has just carried an enormous load, an enormous weight for the last, what, the best part of the last three and a half hours or so. Got a big lift there. He was yeah. wanting to see where that prototype was going. <laughs> Don't you turn in. Don't you dare. Dr. Wolfgang Ulrich has the eyes on. He knows he is just seconds away from celebrating once again. Here comes Andre Lotterer into the final sequence. And this ultra lightweight technology has been ultra spectacular at Circuit de la Sarthe this year. Their motto is to always be one step ahead of the opposition. And Audi has been just that today. Get ready to see the Audi Sport team explode as Lotterer comes to the line for the second year in a row fresh winners for the four rings Audi has done it again with their new R18 Simon Paginot for Peugeot some 13 seconds in arrears that was a gutsy gutsy performance from the 26 year old Frenchman but in the end nothing could stop Audi Olivier Canel to come so close after such effort and on the 100th birthday of Corvette Chevrolet goes to victory lane to the top of the podium. Doug Feehan's boys are back. There's Doug. Well done to he and Danny Binks uh, and the drivers. Congratulations. The whole crew. Boys. What a team effort there. Tenth anniversary of Corvette Racing's first win at Le Mans. They do it again. And we've got Americans on three of the four podiums. Fantastic achievement. And Andre Lotter not looking overcome by emotion in the cockpit, but he will when he meets this group. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Everyone's there. Dindo's in there. TK's there. Celebration Audi. Greg's what a there. day. Greg's there as well. Take it away, mate. This crew, obviously, they are just beside themselves at this point. An amazing achievement when you consider what has happened. Right now, the security people are just letting everybody in there celebrate. There are plenty of tears to be found, along with all the smiles, along with all the high fives. The celebrations are just um, just uh, one of the most emotional things I have ever seen. Uh, Marcel Fassler right there uh, just uh, can't believe what has happened here. I don't think anybody could have really expected this when you know what they endured earlier in the race and this lone R18 in its debut run with this remarkable technology, the remarkable engine that it's using, uh, the remarkable lightweight technology is just spectacular and what they have been able to achieve, remarkable. So let's, let's get down to Jamie and uh, Jamie, great celebration in the Corvette pits as well. It is a fantastic celebration.
question in the Corvette pit. Doug Behan, when you guys came to GT2, you said it was going to be your biggest challenge. Two years later, you're victorious at Le Mans. What does this mean to the team? Well, let me tell you what. First of all, happy anniversary to Louis Chevrolet and the Chevrolet brand. This is one heck of a way to celebrate the 100th and our 10th anniversary of our first victory here. This is as hard as we've ever worked. This is the greatest challenge that we've ever faced. These guys today never, ever gave up. Emblematic of what we've done over the years. I'm very, very proud of them. Get out there and wave that American flag. Congratulations. Thanks. That's cool, everybody lining up here. Photo op. Those gates are going to come down in a minute, and then it's all over. Boys. <laughs> <laughs> this Greg? is an incredible time of the race right now. What they're saying there, they were given instructions after the checkered flag, one full lap. Typically, we see them pull off at the end of pit lane, and they couldn't afford to do that, realizing that everyone was going to be gunning for that start-finish line. So in safety, we're going to see that full lap there. Let's get down to Greg. Right here, we've got Dr. Ulrich, he, uh, if I could talk to him. Amazing achievement, Dr. Ulrich. Over the year, you've uh, you've had relatively easy wins. You've had difficult wins. You've had spectacular wins. This one is incredulous. Uh, talk about the swing of emotions you've endured. Yeah, I mean, uh, after the two big accidents, we've been really down because we've been so disappointed because the performance was good from the very beginning. And it looked like it shouldn't be. But then we concentrated, all of us, and tried to give it all into one car. And it worked out well. Well, and you put everything into it, and obviously after the incidents, you didn't let anything slow these these three drivers down. Every one of them put in some unbelievable stints. Everybody, each of the drivers was really perfect. No errors. It's just teamwork. Ultralight technology and the Audi diesel engine, superb. Yeah, that's what we proved, that our technology is really difficult to beat in Le Mans. Go celebrate if ever before you have earned this one. Unbelievable achievement they have done here. One Audi versus three works Peugeots and Audi prevail. On Chevrolet's 100th birthday, Corvette drives to the top of the podium. We've got so many good stories to tell you and a few tears there inside the helmet of Andre Lotterer. Well done, what a drive. It's what's called a victory run. <laughs> Marcel Fessler on the left, Benoit Trellier on the right. And how about that? They'd be just running on air. High on emotion as they're waiting on their teammate to come. Even Dr. Ulrich's going to get in on this jogging action. And Ralph Jutner, they all want to be underneath the podium. They want to feel that champagne. They want to share in the joy with their drivers. Just amazing stuff. The car they call Red Sonja did it. As we go to the results, and look at that margin, Brian. 13 seconds at the end of 24 hours. Well, you were saying the motto for Audi is one step ahead. After 24 hours, 13 <laughs> seconds, I would call that just about one step. The eight, then the seven, and then the sister Peugeot for Team Orica Matmu getting a top five. So the top five positions filled by diesel-powered cars. Tom Kimber-Smith, Cal, he's done it again. He has his second-class win here at Le Mans. What a day for that team. I mean, they really came out of nowhere. Got the Nissan Power. They come 1-2, and Bushu Tucker Barbosa, great result for level five. They weren't sure they'd be competitive here, but, boy, did they execute come race day. And how about GTE Pro? Scott, you got the first victory for Corvette Racing. You shared in that. Corvette, go back to the top. It's hard to believe that's 10 years ago, but what an incredible... Uh, and GTE Am, it's the second class win for Canal and Gardell, the first for Patrick Bornhauser. And look at that, Dave Murray, Dave Robertson and Andrea Robertson. First time for the Robertsons at Le Mans, and they will get to experience the podium. Amazing. The celebrations continue at Circuit de la Sarthe. Naturally, you think about Germany, German technology because of the Audi victory, the multinationality driver combination. However, there's an American involved. It's Brad Kettler. And a few moments ago, Greg Kremer caught up with him.
Brad Kettler, an amazing achievement here when you think about what happened here in the early going with the other two cars. And these were the three uh, drivers that may be in the program were the less unsung of, of the others. They delivered some unbelievable performances here, as did the team. They, they sure did. I mean, I mean, I worked with them last year, and uh, we had a great result then. They were, they were really new at it. They were really new at it then, but I, I wanted to come back with the three of them. I believed in them, and I wanted to come back with the three of them, and I wanted to do it, and it was just incredible to do it. I mean, the early accidents were so traumatic because, because of, uh, you know, the emotions you go through when you see something like that, they were so bad, but Audi builds an incredibly strong car, and obviously everything worked out okay there. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm exhausted from it. Unbelievable. Just the emotional swings from, you know, from what you had to deal with, the high, the low, the very low, and then back here again. It's unbelievable. Right. Well, right near the end, we actually had a slow puncture, and this was something that really changed our, changed our strategies. I was happy to help Lena. Alan McNish has just stuck in. Look at this hug here. Very, very, very special. Alan, uh, we were just talking to Brad about the emotional swings here. Obviously, you were part of that in a very negative way. Uh, great to see you okay, first of all. But how about this team coming back and bringing home a win? One lone car against the juggernaut. Well, I think that's the thing about it is it's coming back against the odds, and that's something that Audi have proved time and time again. It's what you need here. You need the strength. You need the stability. You need the, the people who've been through it in Bradsky. Well, he's masterminded a couple, that's for sure, and pulled a few out of the bag. And uh, this one was a real team effort to see everybody pulling together when the two cars were out. And uh, for little Lena to get her first Le Mans victory is superb. Just superb, and best news of all, you're okay. That's great. Uh, well, great to see you here. This victory certainly lifted my spirits. Yeah, a little adrenaline there, my friend. Well done, Alan. Congratulations. Brad, awesome. Alan acknowledging little Lena there. That's Lena Gard, the female engineer on the two car. And I said Red Sonia is the name of the car. That's an acknowledgement of Lena's younger sister. So it's a real family affair at Le Mans. Final segment coming up, podium coming up. Stay with us. Speed's coverage of the 24 Hours of Le Mans is brought to you by Audi Motorsports and the new R18 with Audi Ultra Lightweight Technology. Audi, truth in engineering. What a performance from the four rings. Are we witnessing a changing of the guard? The establishment, the established drivers have not won since 2008. Last year, it was three new winners with Rockefeller, Bernard and Dumas. This year, Fessler, Trellier, and the man who brought it home for the final three and a half hours, Andre Lotterer. And what a rush of emotion. I think we've all felt it today. The highs to low, the lows to high. Uh, I mean, I was sick, literally sick there for a while. And now to see Ali rally, rally back and be right up on top, it's just incredible. Absolutely incredible. Jean-Claude Plassard, the main man with the Automobile Club de l'Ouest there. Just getting ready for the podium presentations, this magical moment. Hey, the crowd are a little bit slow getting out there. Normally yeah. <laughs> there's a sea of people, and there's a sea of emotion. They'll get there, believe me, that crowd will. I mean, think about what Olivia Canel, what Dr. Wolfgang and Ulrich go through every year. You talked about it going in front of the board, and I don't think it's a stretch to say last year Dr. Ulrich literally put his job on the line saying, we will get this done, and if not, I will leave. It is that type of emotion, that type of dedication, that type of drive that moves these men, this team, these teams forward. Worse than that, the first shots of Rocky's crash were just so mm. horrifying. Yeah, I mean, Scott and said it was it. sickening to watch those massive impacts with both of the other Audis. And uh, for Rockefeller at night, we really couldn't see what had happened. Scary, scary moments. Rocky's not back at the track yet, but the good news is he is okay. There's Andre Lauder again. Congratulated. Congratulations from Dr. Ulrich, but uh, you see the emotion <laughs> yeah. when he realizes it's finally over. It's just a huge weight comes and off the, the shoulders. The piece that we don't see here is all the testing that went It'll into work. this car. This oh. was a clean sheet of paper for Audi to come here and, and be dominant for the first time in many, many years. And to stand close to it and to see what a work of engineering art it is. 
it was just an honor to be able to get close to it. And and like you said, Scott, it started from an absolute clean sheet of paper. And this is new for this year to bring the car and put it right there on display. It says it all, doesn't it? Look at it. With all of the various models that Audi has brought, the R8, the R10, the R15, the R15 Plus, Every iteration of car won its very first race. This car did not do that. It did not win at Spa. However, it's made up for it here today. Before we go to the podium presentations, we may not see the GTE Pro guys. I want to make mention because we saw the graphic before. We cannot forget American Tommy Milner, his first ever Le Mans class victory at 25 years of age another american on that gte podium in joey hand he did not get to do the triple in terms of daytona sebring le mans but he gets to stand on the podium at le mans terrific achievement for olivia beretta in that corvette it's his sixth class win antonio garcia it's his third and second with corvette some housekeeping there but some and congratulations to corvette it's hard for me to believe it was 10 years ago i went to victory lane there 10 years ago Wow, the time just flies. These are just terrific scenes. And here comes the crowd now. Look at, at the that. crowds. Third place for Peugeot. Nick Manassi and Frank Montagny and Stefan Sarazen. They put up a good fight. It's a, a, another trip to the podium. It's not the step they would like to be on. Paul Peugeot's in the top five, but unfortunately for them, they don't climb to the big step. And when you're at this level, it's a disappointment. Look at the disappointment oh, yeah. on Sebastian Bourdais' face. He wears it right there. He knows they were so close. 13 seconds shy of his first Le Mans victory. Now you got to wait a whole year to come back and try and do it again. Bordo Lamy, Bordé Lamy, and Simon Pagenaud. For Pagenaud and Lotter are those two guys who brought it home. That is a massive effort from those guys. Their boss, Olivier Canel. Here comes the magical moment. The winners, the new winners, the fresh faces on the Le Mans podium, the fresh faces for Audi, led by their boss, Dr. Wolfgang Ulrich. Let's listen and soak it up. Audi's 10th victory in the 24 hours of Le Mans in a 13-year span. Extraordinary success. Proving their technology is the best once again. See just the empty look on Simon Pagino's yeah. face. What more can I do? Yeah. What more can I do? Well, I think they can look back and they really did nothing wrong. I mean, ultimately, the R18 just had a little bit more lap time in it, Scott, and uh, that was the deciding factor. I mean, they were quickest in two of the segments around the racetrack. 
and they had the pace when they needed it. It was an incredible event. When you look at what transpired from the start of the race where the tragedy for Audi, and then to rally back and do what they did and get to the top of the podium was absolutely fantastic, and a whole new clean sheet of paper for that race car. I, you know, my hat's off to them. They did just an absolute fantastic job, as well as Corvette to get back to victory lane for their 100th. I think the word that Brad Kettler used in his interview with Greg Primo was appropriate. It was traumatic mm. what occurred with Alan McNish and Mike Rockefeller. It just tore the hearts out of the entire Audi squad, all three teams. They rallied, as Dr. Wolfgang Ulrich said, and came back one versus four, really. One versus three works Peugeot's, one to support Peugeot. It was one versus four, and they prevailed. Olivier Canel. He's, you know, there would be a point in time in their lives when you would ask them to stand on the podium at Le Mans, how special would that be? And they would say, oh, you know, just to be able to stand there would be fantastic. And you see the lack of expression on their face now, the emotion, the tears in his eyes, so close yet again, but still not the top step. Well, he has to answer the big question. I mean, yeah. yes, it was a tremendous performance, one they should certainly be proud of, but tomorrow he's going to be asked, why didn't we win this event with the investment that was made? Well, I'll tell you, boys, that for me, this race was truly an enjoyable experience. Uh, went from highs to lows, no doubt about it. Last night was very scary. This, on the other hand, is wonderful. You look at the car, I love how they put that there. And you get a really chance to look at it. I mean, the car looks beat up, tore up, oil down the side, dirty. Could never look any sweeter. the emotion on Hugh Deschonac's face at Sebring when they took the victory and we talked about it is about emotion yeah it's about the speed it's about the technology but the emotion of the sport you see it right there amongst the 12 or amongst the nine drivers who stand there on that podium the respective team bosses it was a titanic battle we expected it from the pace that we saw in the test we had numerous cars within a few tenths there we had six cars just over <laughs> half a second separating them then they I lift the big it. trophy up but i tell you what they were off sequence a lot of this race because otherwise that would have been nose to tail racing throughout the course of this 24-hour race i said at the beginning of the show yesterday this we were about to witness something extraordinary we did yeah, absolutely we did without question and more than we w would have ever expected. First closed cockpit victory for Audi. It was 1999 with the R8C they brought their one and only closed cockpit car before this R18. They decided to make a massive switch, a massive directional change, going with a V6 power plant. They put so much into this, and to win the big one first time out is a colossal achievement. It's been a marathon for us too, so glad you could be with us across the 25 hours on speed and on speed.com. You enjoyed it, boys? Oh, that was awesome. Let's do it again. <laughs> not, uh, same not just time, same time, right? <laughs> let's, I, let's I am so absolutely impressed that nobody was hurt. And, and dear friends of ours mm -hmm. that were able to walk away some, from horrific accidents. Thoughts for Rocky. He's not here to celebrate the Audi win, but we're with you, mate. We're so glad you're okay. Look forward to seeing you back at the track. For Jamie Howe, for Andrew Marriott, Greg Creamer, and Justin Bell, who did the hard yards on pit road. It is a really tough slog doing that up and down the hill on pit road. We thank them very much. For Brian Till, Calvin Fish, Dorsey Schrader, and Lamont winner Scott Pruitt, I'm Lee Diffie. As I said, we're so pleased you could be with us. This was a really memorable 24 hours of Le Mans. It's time for us to say farewell. It's time for us to say hi to Chris Devota in the Speed Center. We'll see you soon. Thanks for watching Sports Cars on Speed. What a Le Mans.